we yet? Excellent. Good morning and welcome everyone to our 11th annual neonatology conference uh, held here in Kansas City. Um, as I said, this is our 11th year doing this and it's come a long way. <clears throat> Every year we've done this, we've had outstanding speakers, and this is no exception. Um, we've got some great people, to, to, as you've seen from uh, the invites, who are going to talk to us today, and I hope you're going to enjoy this. Um, COVID has created a number of challenges, and we've repeatedly kind of worked through and changed our format and how we do this. Historically, when we first started this, it was live in a hotel conference room. Um, uh, COVID stopped that in its tracks, and we've come back somewhat differently now. Now, last year was our first year trying this in a virtual format. This year, we're doing a similar format with a semi-live studio audience, so um, maybe there's a little bit more interaction um, so that some of the people who live here locally can come and, and, and at least be present uh, for the talks. Uh, our speakers, however, are still virtual, coming from their homes and we're looking forward to hearing from them. Um, through this process of creating a new conference style, um, I, I, I want to just pause for a second and thank those who have really worked hard to make this happen. Uh, this is not easy. Um, just by way of history, um, I'm, and I should probably introduce myself, I'm Dr. Stapley, I'm Chris Stapley, I'm a neonatologist with Sunflower Neonatology. Um, I've been working here for over 15 years, uh, part of the Sunflower Neonatology group. Uh, this is a group that was founded some 17 years ago with a single neonatologist, Kathleen Weatherstone, uh, who came from acad an, an academic background and started this group. Um, that is actually a purely clinical group. Uh, there are currently nine neonatologists in our group and some 30 some odd nurse practitioners who cover NICUs in four different hospitals. And we are not academic. And what that means is we don't have time set aside for academic activities. And those that have participated in bringing this conference uh, to where it is today, do this in our extra time. Um, we have a very busy clinical load, but we still do it. Um, I also want to thank the hospital system, um, HCA, specifically uh, Overland Park Regional Medical Center, where our big NICU is, has supported us through this and have they've provided uh, personnel, funds, um, uh, patients um, to help us put this together where really, and, and you know, we all know how hospitals are, there's not much of a financial benefit for them to do this. Um, but they have supported this and I wanna thank the leadership from um, Overland Park Regional Medical Center that helped us put this together. Um, those of you that were able to come to yesterday's pre-conference, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, it was a great conference and a really unique opportunity. Um, one of my partners, Dr. Rob Holcomb, uh, was the moderator for that conference and he helped put that together. Um, I am very proud to have Rob as a partner. Um, he, after a career in the military, um, uh, supervising medical transports in the military, came to us and has put together a very extensive maternal neonatal transport team. And you know, for those not as familiar with Kansas City, it's like many Midwest cities. It's a good sized city with a lot of resources, but there are a lot of surrounding communities um, who don't have the level of maternal fetal medicine support that, that they would want. And quite frankly, there just aren't a lot of maternal fetal medicine doctors and through Rob's effort of bringing about transport and telemedicine, um, being able to bring these services to these communities and being letting, allowing mothers to stay uh, close to their homes to get care has been a groundbreaking um, effort. Um, 
And, uh, you know, we still do a lot, and sometimes those moms need to be moved. But through his efforts and through the efforts of HCA, we've really developed an, an extensive transport network uh, where we can bring the care to these underserved areas. Um, so, as we get started, I do want to go through a few, you know, you always hear this in conferences, got housekeeping things to do. Um, specifically, to start out, as I'm thanking everybody, uh, I need to thank our sponsors. Uh, uh, financially, obviously, you all know we can't do this for free. Now, when we put this conference together, we specifically did, we're encouraging nurses to come and, you know, it's expensive to have conferences and to get CEUs, and we've tried to keep our costs down. And to do that, we've relied on sponsors. Abbott Nutrition, uh, Mead Johnson Nutritionals, Prolactive Bioscience, International Biomed, MedTrans, and Philips have all ponied up and provided uh, sponsorship money so we could keep the cost of this conference down. Uh, um, now, some of the best parts of any of these conferences is the impact or the, the input we get from the the attendees, uh, and you have an opportunity to submit your questions. There is a chat feature. For those of you who have logged in, I'm sure you've seen it. There's a chat feature that you can um, click on. When you do that, you have to actually click on and put your name in there so we know who's submitting the question. Um, and you can submit questions, and those questions will be brought to me, and so I can ask the speakers directly. Um, also, uh, if you want CEUs or CMEs, which is sort of the point, um, you have to log in. Uh, I know there are some areas where uh, you know multiple people have registered and they're sitting together watching it, and one person logs in and everyone kind of around them watches. Unfortunately, if you want to get credit for this, you've got to log in yourself. Now, you can log in yourself and not watch. You just have to log in um, so that we can get you that credit. After the talks are over, you will get an email. And in that email, there will be a survey that you fill out. Uh, and once that's filled out, you will be given a, a certificate of, of credit. Um, so, uh, you will see on the slides, you'll have multiple opportunities. Um, there's a QR code you can scan and there it is. Um, scan that and follow the link to, to log in. Um, if you're having problems with the QR code, you can email Amy Repka. Uh, there's her email address, amyrepka at hcamidwest.com. Uh, and she will help you through the process of making sure that you get your, your educational credits. Um, so, moving on. I don't think I've missed anything else from our housekeeping. We can move on and we can get the conference started. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Martha Solovisner. Now, she came to us from Ecuador, where she did her initial training, um, and then moved on and did her residency and fellowship training at the University of Florida, uh, where she stayed as, as faculty. Later, she moved on to uh, Boston Children's in 2007, um, where she is currently an attending neonatologist and a director of newborn medicine clinical research um, and also an associate professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Um, I personally saw her speak um, at, a, at another conference uh, talking about platelet transfusions, and this has become somewhat of a hot topic um, that a lot of us have questions about what's the right level, what, when and when do we not transfuse. So I'm excited to hear from Dr. Dr. Sola Visner. Um, where and she is going to talk to us about platelet transfusions in the NICU, less is more. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this virtual symposium for the opportunity to be here today talking about platelet transfusions in the NICU. 
these are my disclosures. Uh, none of these two uh, relationships are relevant for the purposes of this presentation. And these are the objectives for today's talk. We as neonatologists already know that neonatal thrombocytopenia and bleeding are common in NICU patients. 18 to 35% above of all infants who are admitted to the NICU experience at least one episode of thrombocytopenia at some point during their hospital stay. And the incidence is inversely proportional to the gestational age and the birth weight so that it is most uh, prevalent among infants who are born with a weight at less than 1,000 grams at birth. Uh, up to 70% of these extremely low birth weight babies will experience an episode of thrombocytopenia. In addition to a high incidence of thrombocytopenia, preterm babies are also the hospital population that has the highest incidence of bleeding. 20 to 25% of babies with a birth weight less than 1500 grams experience intracranial bleeding, as we know most commonly intraventricular hemorrhages. And it is most likely because of this combination of a high incidence of thrombocytopenia and a high incidence of bleeding that preterm neonates frequently receive platelet transfusions. In this study recently published, we looked at platelet transfusions in six birth hospitals in different regions of the United States and found that 34% of all babies less than 27 weeks gestational age received one or more platelet transfusions. This percentage decreased as the babies advanced in gestational age and they became less and less frequent in uh, near-term or full-term babies. And not only are these babies transfused frequently, but they also receive platelet transfusions at fairly high platelet counts compared to uh, older children and adults. In the same study, we looked at the median pre-transfusion platelet count and as you can see here, the majority of babies at all uh, gestational age and postnatal ages got platelet transfusions for platelet counts greater than 50,000. So when we as neonatologists decide to give a baby with a platelet count of X, a platelet transfusion, we do that because we believe that the lower the platelet count is, the higher the risk of bleeding. And because the we believe that by increasing the platelet count, we will reduce this bleeding risk. So what is the evidence about the correlation between the platelet count and the risk of bleeding? The first study that looked at this was a single institution observational prospective study conducted by Simon Stanworth in the United Kingdom. And he looked at the lowest platelet counts in babies who never had any bleeding whatsoever, the lowest platelet count before an episode of minor bleeding, so that the heel stick that bled for a little longer or of any puncture that bled longer than it should or a little blood tinge secretions in the endotracheal tube, and then the lowest platelet counts before episodes of major uh, clinically significant bleeding. And as you can see here, there really seemed to be very little correlation between the actual platelet count and the risk of bleeding. And in fact, the median platelet count was a little bit higher in the babies that had major bleeding compared to the babies that had minor or had no bleeding. We did a similar study, but focusing exclusively on very low birth weight infants in the first week of life and looking only at intraventricular hemorrhage as our outcome. And what we found here was that babies who had a platelet count less than 150,000 at any point during the first week of life had a 2.3 fold higher incidence of IVH. But within this thrombocytopenic group, the risk was the same at almost every platelet count. So the risk was the same if your platelet count was 10 to 30,000, or if it was 40 to 50,000, or if it was 70 to 80 or 90 to 100, suggesting that you know increasing the platelet count from here to here might not make a big difference in terms of the bleeding risk. Interestingly, a similar observation has been made in older children and in adults who have chemotherapy-induced thrombocytopenia. And in this study, Cassandra Josephson et al. 
correlated the morning platelet count in adults in the solid line and in children in the broken line with the percentage of days that had grade two or higher bleeding, so clinically significant bleeding. And what they found was that children in general had higher incidences of bleeding than adults, as you can see here, and that the bleeding risk increased when the platelet count dropped below 100,000. But then, once again, there was very little correlation between the bleeding incidence and the actual platelet count, very similar to the observations in neonates. And that was true until the platelet count fell below 10,000, at which time the bleeding risk did seem to increase. So obviously, you know, we give platelet transfusions because regardless of this poor relationship, we believe that platelet transfusions will decrease the incidence or severity of bleeding in preterm neonates. And the best clinical evidence until 2019 uh, came from a single randomized trial that was published in 1993. This trial enrolled 152 very low birth weight neonates in the first week of life, and babies were randomized to receive a platelet transfusion whenever the platelet count fell below 150,000. So any thrombocytopenia was avoided, or only if the platelet count fell below 50,000 or if there was clinical bleeding. And interestingly, these investigators in 152 babies found no difference whatsoever in the frequency or in the severity of intraventricular hemorrhage between the two groups. And indeed, the treated group, the one that received more aggressive platelet transfusions, had a slightly higher incidence of IVH, although this was not significant. So this single prior randomized trial concluded that transfusing very low birth weight infants with platelet counts between 50 and 150,000 in the first week of life does not reduce the incidence or the severity of IVH. But what about other outcomes? You know, do platelet transfusions decrease neonatal morbidity or mortality in general? Well, over the last two decades, a number of studies, some from our group, some from others, showed that neonates who received platelet transfusions had a relative risk of death up to 10 times higher than that of non-transfused neonates. And at least one study used statistical methods, statistical sensitivity analysis, to indicate that the number of platelet transfusions predicted the mortality rate in thrombocytopenic neonates, and that at least some of this mortality increase was actually attributable to the platelet transfusions themselves. Also, in neonates with necrotizing enterocolitis, increased number of platelet transfusions were associated with a higher incidence of short guard and cholestasis, and also with higher mortality in two separate studies. But in observational studies, retrospective studies, you know, even though platelet transfusions correlated with higher morbidity and mortality, we could not discern whether platelet transfusions are just a marker of severity of illness and the sickest babies are the most likely to get platelet transfused, or whether platelet transfusions actually contributed to the morbidity and mortality. And this was the state of the science until 2019, where this landmark paper by Anna Curley and Simon Stanworth was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this was the largest randomized trial of platelet transfusion thresholds ever published in, in neonates. They enrolled babies with gestational age less than 34 weeks, platelet counts less than 50,000, and who had a head ultrasound performed within the six hours prior to randomization that did not show major IVH. If a major IVH was diagnosed or found in this ultrasound, then the babies were excluded from the study for the following 72 hours, after which they could be enrolled if they still were thrombocytopenic. And, you know, traditional, as in traditional trials, they excluded babies with major congenital malformation, as I said, who had had a major bleeding within the previous 72 hours, who had fetal intracranial hemorrhage or immune thrombocytopenia, or didn't get vitamin K or were moribund uh, at the time of the approach. 
So these babies were randomized to receive a platelet transfusion whenever the platelet count dropped below 50,000, and that was the high threshold, or only if the platelet count dropped below 25,000, and that was the low threshold. And the primary outcome was the combined incidence of death or major bleeding within the 28 days following the randomization. This is a table showing the main characteristics of the babies who were enrolled. In total, there were 660 preterm neonates that entered the study. So you can see here, they were fairly preterm babies with a median gestational age of about 26 to 27 weeks, uh, a birth weight about 890, 860. And the median postnatal age at the time of randomization was seven days and eight days in the two groups, uh, in the two different groups. In regard of the outcomes, surprisingly, what the investigators found was that the babies that were randomized to the high threshold, less than 50,000, 90% of whom received at least one platelet transfusion, had a lower survival without major bleeding, so had a higher mortality than the babies that were only transfused if the platelet count fell below 25,000. And only 53% of these babies received one or more platelet transfusion. Uh, here, do you have the actual statistics? In the high threshold group, 26% of babies experienced death or major bleeding in the 28 days following randomization versus only 19% in the low threshold group. And this was statistically significant, as, as you can see here. Among the secondary outcomes that they explored, they also found the higher incidence of death or BPD of 69%, again, in the high threshold group, in the babies that were transfused more liberally, below 50,000, compared to only 61 in the low threshold group, with an odds ratio of one point. Five, six, so also statistically significant. So needless to say, the results of the PLANET2 trial, which I just showed you, you know, induced significant concerns about the use of platelet transfusions uh, in, in neonates. The, because the PLANET2 for the first time provided us with the highest level of evidence to show that there was higher bleeding and higher mortality in preterm neonates randomized to receiving liberal platelet transfusions. A result consistent, as I showed you, with multiple prior observational studies, but now providing a much higher level of scientific evidence. Of course, every study has limitations, and PLANET2 was not an exception. First of all, the patients in PLANET2 study had to have a head ultrasound done within six hours before randomization, and they excluded every baby who had a major IVH for at least 72 hours. So therefore, by design, this study did not assess which threshold is better in the setting of an existing major IVH. And then in addition to that, 39% of all patients had received one or more platelet transfusions prior to randomization. And it is unknown from the manuscript why or who these babies were. Were these high-risk neonates in the first week of life that received these platelet transfusions prior to randomization? Was, were those the sickest infants? And this, of course, raised the question of whether the restrictive thresholds are only beneficial for the most stable and lowest risk babies. So to mitigate these concerns, the investigators uh, had two approaches. First of all, of course, they did subgroup analysis. And in this subgroup analysis, the babies that had the lowest gestational age, less than 28 weeks, exhibited the same difference, meaning that those randomized to the higher group had more uh, bleeding and mortality than those randomized to the lower transfusion threshold. And they also looked at the babies that were enrolled in the highest risk period, less than 72 hours, in the first 72 hours. And although the numbers in this group are much smaller, as you can see, there was again a larger than in the other subgroups difference between the two groups, once again, favoring the more restrictive 
threshold, the lower platelet transfusion threshold. So when they looked at the highest risk babies, the most premature, the, the earliest postnatal ages, you know, the directionality of the findings was the same, uh, as well as the magnitude of the difference, suggesting that, you know, even in those high-risk groups, using a restrictive threshold uh, would be more beneficial. So in addition to that, they uh, published a few months after the publication of the original PLANET-2 trial, an interesting uh, study in which they looked at all the factors that we know influence the incidence of bleeding in neonates. In particular, of course, gestational age, postnatal age, uh, IUGR, sepsis, neck, et cetera, all the risk factors for death and, and bleeding in, in babies. And then they incorporated all these factors into a single multivariate logistic regression model that they developed to predict the baseline risk of major bleeding and or mortality in any given neonate based on a model that incorporated all these factors. So after developing the model, they took all neonates, they had 653 of the 660 that were included in this, that were and ranked them based on their predicted baseline risk. And then they categorized all the babies into four risk quartiles. Those who had a very low risk of, of bleeding, a low risk, moderate risk, and a very high risk of bleeding. And as you can see here, the model predicted baseline risk of major bleeding and or death on the x-axis correlated quite well with the observed incidence of major bleeding and or death in the low, in the very low risk group, low risk group, the moderate and the high risk group. So the model performed relatively well in identifying the babies that had lower versus higher risk of bleeding and mortality. So after doing this, they took every one of these independent groups, uh, everyone with about 163 to 164 neonates, uh, and then compared the actual incidence of bleeding or death in those who were randomized to the high threshold group, the 50,000, and those are the dark bars, versus those that were randomized to the lower threshold, and those are the light bars. So as you can see here, in every one of these groups, the light bars, meaning the babies randomized for the lower threshold, 25,000 who received less platelet transfusions, had lower incidences of bleeding and death compared to those who were randomized to the high threshold. So suggesting that using the lower thresholds is beneficial for most, if not all, babies in the NICU. Uh, independent of their baseline risk of bleeding and mortality, and that they all benefit just as much from this low prophylactic transfusion threshold. Uh, in addition to this landmark study, in May of the same year of 2019, another clearly transfusion trial was uh, published. This was a much smaller and a very different uh, trial. It was an open label randomized control trial in a single NICU in India that was looking at a very different question. They also enrolled infants less than 34 weeks that had a PDA detected in the first two weeks of life and also had a platelet count less than 100,000. So this study was designed to test the hypothesis that transfusion, platelet transfusion in thrombocytopenic neonates would help uh, close the doctor's arteriosus based on preclinical data showing an association between platelet uh, thrombocytopenia and PDAs. So these babies were randomized to receive platelet transfusions whenever the platelet count was less than 100,000 or less than 20,000. So a much bigger difference between the two thresholds. And the primary outcome was time to closure of the PDA. And these babies were only followed for five days. As you can see here, these were much bigger babies, 29 and 30 weeks. They were about 1,000 grams to 1,100 grams of birth weight. And there were only 22 babies in each one of the two groups. And there was no difference whatsoever between the two groups in terms of the primary outcomes, which was the echocardiographic closure 
of the hemodynamically significant uh, PDA. However, what they did found was that there was a much higher rate of new onset IVH of any grade within the five days of follow-up in the study in the liberal transfusion group. And that this actually correlated every CC of platelets that was transfused correlated with a higher degree of risk of developing any new onset intraventricular hemorrhage in the liberal transfusion, transfusion group. So putting this small study together with a much larger study of, of Curly et al., uh, I think it is becoming increasingly clear that platelet transfusions can have harmful effects in neonates, and we need to be judicious when thinking about ordering this, this product. But what is unknown is what are the mechanisms underlying the harmful effects of platelet transfusions in neonates? Why, why does this happen? And this has not been observed in hemonc populations, for example, where many clinical trials have been performed. So a number of hypotheses have been suggested. One of them is that perhaps things are related to the volume and rate of the platelet transfusions. Could it be that there is a rapid volume infusion in vulnerable periods of development that contributes to the bleeds? Or perhaps that there is something, you know, potentially damaging in the platelets and that we're giving too high of a dose? It's important to note that the neonates in Planet 2 receive 15 cc's per kilo which is a typical standard of care dose for platelet transfusions, and that they were typically given rapidly in 30 to 60 minutes. But this is strikingly different from what happens in older children and adults who, uh, when they get a normal platelet transfusion, they receive usually three to five milliliters per kilo. So just because of practice differences over time, Neonates are typically transfused with much higher volume, much higher doses of platelets than older children in adults in clinical practice. So is it possible that by giving this big, large volume over a short period of time, it could be contributing to the bleed? You know, we don't know this. This hypothesis has not been tested. But in this interesting, small, randomized trial, uh, of platelet transfusions, uh, Dr. Dunaway and collaborators compared transfusions given over 30 minutes versus over two hours and asked whether there is an effect on post-transfusion platelet counts. Uh, this year, the characteristics of the study population, they were babies with uh, just postmenstrual ages of about 32 weeks, about 1,800 grams, variable etiologies of thrombocytopenia, but importantly, the 30-minute post-transfusion change in platelet count was the same in babies who were transfused over 30 minutes versus in babies that were transfused over two hours. So showing that it is possible to give a platelet transfusion, uh, at least in this small cohort of about 43 babies, uh, over two hours and see the same recovery of, of platelet counts uh, at 30 minutes after the, the transfusion. The second hypothesis has been that some of the damaging effects or potentially harmful effects of platelet transfusions in preterm neonates could be related to the fact that all platelet transfusions come from adult donors. And these platelets are transfused into the very different physiological environment of a preterm neonate. And we have known now for uh, over a decade that platelets from neonates are very different from platelets from adults. If we look at them structurally or ultrastructurally under an electron microscope, they look exactly the same. They're very similar. These are adult platelets. These are neonatal platelets. However, if we look at the density of the receptors or we examine their signaling, intracellular signaling pathways, that's when they are very different. And they are particularly different in the responsiveness to most platelet activation agonists, including thrombin, ADP, epinephrine, and collagen, the things that normally activate, activate platelets. So a number of studies, and I'm just showing one of them from 2018, 
uh, demonstrated these developmental differences in the reactivity of platelets in response to these agonists. In this particular excellent study, they took platelets from preterm neonates, and those are the white bars, from full-term neonates, and those are the red bars, and from adults, and those are the blue bars, and stimulated them with different traditional agonists that are listed here, and then measured the degree of platelet activation using two standard measures of activation, the binding of fibrinogen, fibrinogen binding, as well as p-selecting exposure on the platelet surface, both by flow cytometry. And as you can see here, pretty much in response to every single agonist, the platelets from preterm and term neonates activated significantly less than the platelets from adults. So showing that the, the platelets uh, from fetuses and neonates have a, a deficiency in their ability to activate in response to these agonists. This is not only activation, this also was observed in aggregation studies. Uh, in this study from uh, my laboratory many years ago, we looked at the aggregation from platelets derived from core blood, term core blood, and from adults in response to different agonists. And we again found the same thing, that platelets from neonates aggregated less than platelets from adults. So normally you would imagine that if neonatal platelets aggregate less and activate less, that would predispose babies to bleeding because the platelets are hypofunctional. However, already in 1989, Maureen Andrews reported that bleeding times, which is a measure of primary hemostasis, a main function of platelets, are actually shorter in healthy full-term neonates than in healthy adults. And after this, at least six subsequent studies used an in vitro measure of the bleeding time called the closure time. This is a very objective laboratory in vitro test of platelet function uh, that looks at how long it takes whole blood exposed to collagen and epinephrine or collagen and ADP to form a tiny little clot that occludes an, an, an aperture. So mimicking an in vivo bleeding time, but in vitro. And what all this study showed was that neonatal blood, whole blood, had significantly shorter closure times compared to adult blood. So showing that it had actually more robust and faster hemostasis. So how do we explain this? The reason for this paradoxical finding is that the hyperreactive platelets of neonates are perfectly balanced by a number of factors in the blood of babies that actually promote faster clotting and completely counteract this uh, platelet hypofunctionality, including the high hematocrit, the high MCV, high von Willebrand factor levels, and a predominance of ultra-large von Willebrand factor polymers in the blood of babies that resembles the serum of patients with thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So what this means is that the hyperreactivity of platelets is not a deficiency or an immaturity, but it's just uh, an integral part of a very different primary hemostatic balance in, in, in babies that is unique to this developmental stage. And the net result of these competing factors are actually shorter bleeding times and shorter closure times. So faster hemostasis in babies compared to, to adults, at least in healthy babies. So of course, in the context of transfusion medicine, the first question raised by this observation was, well, what happens if we put adult comparatively hyperreactive platelets into this en environment. And so we did a series of in vitro miniature transfusion studies in our laboratory. And indeed, we found that if we took core blood that we had made thrombocytopenic and we added now uh, adult peripheral blood platelets, so mimicking a transfusion, we actually shortened even further the closure time in response to collagen and, and, and epi compared to reconstituting the blood with normal core blood platelets. So suggesting that at least in vitro, 
the presence of adult platelets could actually lead to a prothrombotic phenotype, although this has never been demonstrated in, in vivo. So this study provided the very first uh, proof of concept that there could be a developmental mismatch that could have physiological consequences when we put adult platelets into a neonatal uh, environment. But perhaps the most important thing that I wanna communicate to you in, in this talk is that over the last decade, we have seen an explosion of research demonstrating that platelet functions are way more than a sack of glue and have extremely important non-hemostatic functions. So in addition to their well-known functions in hemostasis and thrombosis, they are actually involved in angiogenesis, in the maintenance and regulation of the vascular tone, in wound healing. They have a huge role in tumor biology and cancer biology, and they particularly participate in host defense and in inflammatory processes. And this immune and inflammatory effects are particularly important. So for example, in this study that looked at the transcriptome of the platelets, so all the mRNAs that are carried by the platelets, the most enriched biological processes in those mRNAs were actually related to immune functions, much more so than hemostatic functions. And the same thing is true when we have looked more recently at the platelet proteome. So the most enriched biological processes in the, in the platelet RNA and proteins are actually related to immune functions. And this has led to the you know, growing belief that perhaps platelets are cells that sit at the intersection of hemostasis and immunity and should be viewed as immune cells in their own right. In addition to that, uh, I told you a little earlier, platelets, uh, when they are activated, they release multiple cytokines and chemokines that interact with immune cells, with endothelial cells, with other factors, and also express P-selectin on their surface. This P-selectin makes the platelet able to interact with PSGL, the receptor for P-selectin, which is expressed in neutrophils, in uh, and monocytes and endothelial cells, and then triggers you know, and, um, a number of downstream functions like monocyte migration, activation, lead formation, et cetera. So these are the multiple mechanisms through which activated platelets participate in the immune and inflammatory response. I told you a little bit ago that platelets from neonates don't activate as well and that in response to agonists, and that is true. So therefore they have less selecting exposure on their surface, on their membrane surface, uh, compared to adult platelets. And they also degranulate less and probably release less cytokines and chemokines. And therefore, they are less able to interact with neutrophils, monocytes, endothelial cells, and other, and other immune cells. And this has led to the hypothesis that perhaps adult platelets are more pro-inflammatory than neonatal platelets and could contribute to neonatal inflammation. And this hypothesis is currently actively being tested in our laboratory and, and in other and by other groups also. So in conclusion, it is clear now from observational and randomized trials that adult platelets transfusing to neonates have the potential of causing harm. And this can happen through very various potential mechanisms could be due to the rapid volume expansion, could be due to a high volume of some perhaps damaging cytokines or, or uh, biological products released during the platelet storage. Uh, they can potentially induce a prothrombotic phenotype or they could induce or augment inflammatory responses or deregulate the delicate neonatal uh, immune balance. So the other thing that we need to think about is that platelet counts don't correlate as well with bleeding. So are there better ways to identify the babies that are at risk of bleeding than based on the platelet count? Can we identify better who would benefit from a platelet transfusion uh, versus who would not? And there are at least two lines of thinking in this regard. 
One has been the development of mathematical models that incorporate a lot of clinical and laboratory characteristics to predict the risk of bleeding in the next few days. So similar to the early sepsis calculator or the mortality calculator that we use uh, clinically, you know, could we develop something like that? And the group of Suzanne Fustologonic in the Netherlands is working on uh, a dynamic prediction model of bleeding risk in thrombocytopenic preterm neonates that uses this approach. Another possibility is instead of focusing on just measuring the platelet count, why not use test of primary hemostasis or test of that that test the whole blood and not just one element? Uh, once I heard somebody say, when we care about the kidney, we don't ask how many nephrons there are. We look at a test of the kidney function, regardless of how many nephrons. So perhaps slowly we should move uh, to thinking not about platelet counts, but looking at the function, the hemostatic function of this baby's blood with all the factors that contribute to it. And there are several laboratory tests that could be used to that. One is the measurement of closure times, which I showed you earlier. And another one is the thromboelastogram or, or TEC, in which you can induce clotting in a, in a cup and then record the formation of the clot, the, the time that it, it takes to start forming, how fast it forms, how strong it is, et cetera, et cetera. And this evaluates all the coagulation factors too. I'm not gonna go into detail in any of these tests, but just as proof of principle, in 2019, we published a study that was led by Emoki Deshman at Karolinska Hospital, uh, where she looked at 76 babies with a gestational age of 26 uh, weeks uh, and that had a birth weight of about 777 who were thrombocytopenic. And she followed on a daily basis their bleeding score using a validated tool to quantify bleeding as well as the platelet count and also a, a, a closure time. So an in vitro primary test of hemostasis, the closure, the closure time. And what she found was that these were the degrees of bleeding. So this is no bleeding or minor bleeding. This is moderate bleeding. And grade three and four is clinically significant, major and, and, severe, and severe bleeding. And as you can see here, there was no correlation between the platelet count at the time of this measurement and the degree of bleeding. No bleeding all the way to severe bleeding. However, there was a significant correlation in between the closure time, the in vitro test of hemostasis, and the severity of bleeding. So in this small uh, cohort, at least providing proof of principle that yes, a test of primary hemostasis uh, might be a better mechanism to uh, look at bleeding risk in babies than the platelet count alone. But this is all still in the research uh, frame. So to summarize, uh, putting it all together, I think the most important take home points of this talk are number one, that platelet transfusions can have harmful effects on neonates. And I am not saying do not transfuse because they can be life-saving in cases of uh, acute bleeding or surgical bleeding or of severe thrombocytopenia. But I do think that the available data should discourage us from using high transfusion thresholds in non-bleeding neonates. Uh, the other important thing to remember is that platelets are not only hemostatic cells, but are also key regulators of immunity and inflammation. And therefore, when we transfuse platelets, I think we should think about it as transfusing immune modulatory or potentially pro-inflammatory cells. You know, we need to understand a lot more, but it is very clear that they are not just hemostatic cells. And we need to pay attention to all the other things that platelets can do, good or bad. Uh, and finally, that platelet counts correlate very poorly with bleeding risk. 
I can assure you that if you give a platelet transfusion, you're going to increase the platelet count in the majority of platelets. But that doesn't mean that we're going to decrease the bleeding risk. And some of the data suggests that we might increase the bleeding risk, especially when uh, patients are transfused liberally. And perhaps in the future, uh, we might have an opportunity to use tests of whole blood hemostasis to identify at-risk uh, patients. So what do we do in the meantime while all this research is, is happening and hopefully we're uh, finding some more answers. I think it is absolutely essential for NICUs to implement more restrictive, if you don't have them already, platelet transfusion guidelines within at least, uh, within the, the realms tested by randomized trials uh, to reduce unnecessary, expensive, and potentially harmful platelet transfusions. After the publication of the PLANET2 trial, we changed the guidelines in our own NICU and uh, in a quality improvement project and with a lot of education and reassurance, we actually decreased the number of platelet transfusions in our NICU to one third of what it was before the implementation of these more restrictive guidelines. So this is possible and, uh, and it can be achieved. And I think the the evidence suggests that we should be judicious in our administration of platelet transfusions. And with that, I want to thank you wholeheartedly for your attention, and I will be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Dr. Solovisner, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the feedback from those watching online and, and that are here present has been absolutely positive. Everyone has loved uh, what you presented. Me personally, um, I think back to my time in training, you know, years and years and years ago, and our, our threshold for transfusing platelets, and I, I feel like we were um, doing things that we had no idea really what we were doing. Um, I've got a bunch of questions here that have been submitted, and I'd like to go through them with you. Um, you know, first, you went back and you mentioned um, the um, the environment within a neonate uh, receiving transfusions is very different from that as an adult. You've mentioned uh, higher crit, higher von Wildebrandt factor levels. Um, has there been any thought of prior to giving a platelet transfusion, is, there, is it more beneficial to alter those other things first, uh, increasing the crit, uh, perhaps giving FFP? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you very much for the invitation. It's such a joy to, to join you. I wish it was in person maybe someday, but uh, I appreciate it. Um, you know, that is not that much data in terms of how FFP helps bleeding. There have been some trials given FFP to extremely low birth weight babies, uh, and they have shown that they do not improve or decrease the risk of bleeding. Uh, so we don't encourage just empirically giving FFP uh, prophylactically unless there is you know, bleeding or clearly a factor deficiency or a coagulopathy. Um, and in terms of the CRIT, uh, it, the only study I'm aware of that has looked at the relationship between CRIT was a study in very low birth weight babies, where they actually showed that the bleeding risk increased at a, at a CRIT less than 28. But we have not adjusted for this confounder or, or looked very carefully at the effect of, of the hematocrit on, on clinical bleeding in the, in the NICU. I think it's a good question. It's just difficult to clinically assess this this independent variables but it's a great question yeah sorry about that we are okay i work in a hospital too <laughs> yeah see so we're we're in a hospital and uh i wish you... i i am too no problem uh well we all know what's happening in the er today um so um, a lot of questions about transfusion time. Um, I've got a question that said in their unit, they typically transfuse platelets over an hour. Uh, their concern is that platelets will lice after an hour. Um, is this accurate or can we transfuse over two hours? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Every, every time I give this talk, this is a question uh, because it just contradicts what we all think. So in our blood bank and all the blood banks where I've inquired, the platelets are released and they have to be administered within four hours. The product is supposed to be okay within, within four hours. Uh, so I'm not advocating to go over four hours, but at least that one small evidence that we have that compared 30 minutes versus two hours in, in neonates showed a, a similar um, recovery and a similar increment post-transfusion. So suggesting that you're not losing a lot of platelets that are attaching to the tubing or what could be the concerns. The platelets won't get lysed. They are at room temperature, they'll be fine. You know, I think more of the concern is whether they will get attached to the tubing over the uh, slower infusion. Uh, in, in our hospital, we don't universally uh, recommend using over two hours, most are over one, but I think it might be a consideration in the smallest, most premature babies that are at high risk of hemodynamic changes and, uh, and, and at risk of IVH related to that. Um, I cannot tell you that there is extensive evidence, but I showed you what we have in neonatology that suggests that at least it is, it is safe. Uh, and, and whether it benefits or not, whether it would change the, uh, whether it would change the, the incidence, the higher incidence of bleeding, we, we don't know that. Well, well, certainly I can see, you know, I know a lot of units, the practice is to run them in over 30 minutes. Um, I know. Um, I think there's a lot of room to go from that. Um, is there any discussion about, you know, we mentioned the, the higher likelihood of, uh, of adult platelets activating. Um, is there a discussion, I heard them in studies looking at uh, immune modulators to decrease activation of, of adult platelets? So uh, I do think that the, we are really at the early stages of understanding what the cells are doing on the babies from the immune standpoint. All, most of the studies that have looked at developmental differences in, in platelets have focused on hemostatic functions, you know, like the, the, the mini transfusion that I presented. And the whole concept that they are Immuno, immune cells, uh, which I, I truly believe they are, there is a lot of evidence for that, in that there might be equally important differences in the immune modulatory functions of the platelets uh, is fairly new. So what happens when we put this immunologically different cells into the environment of the baby? And it's a very active area of study in, in our laboratory. I can tell you we just finished, uh, unpublished, but we just finished a proteomic study comparing the protein content of neonatal and adult cells. And while the adult cells are enriched in proteins that are involved in immune functions, the neonatal cells are not. So at a minimum, they're enriched in, in proteins that are involved in metabolic functions. So, so there clearly is some evidence that the adult cells are more immunocompetent, immunofunctional. Than the, than the neonatal cells are. Uh, and there are, there is at least our laboratory, which is actively studying that and other laboratories in the US uh, about the immune consequences of uh, administering platelets into a baby. And so far the emerging data is that they can induce migration of immune cells into tissues inappropriately, and that they can also induce under certain circumstances more production of inflammatory cytokines and more production of neutrophil extracellular traps, so neutrophil activation. So, you know, most of this is unpublished, uh, but it will be published in the next couple of years. Uh, but this is literally where, where, this, where the science is heading right now, you know, trying to understand exactly what we are doing from the inflammatory standpoint to these babies when we give them a platelet transfusion, independent of hemostasis. Looking forward to that research coming out. Um, Thank you. Have there been any studies looking at babies being treated for HIE and body cooling and platelet levels? Yeah, no, not really. There have been a lot of studies correlating platelet counts to mostly minor bleeding. Uh, prolonged PT, PTT has been more correlated with major bleeding, platelet counts with minor bleeding, but there haven't been any randomized trials or, or anything like that that has directly compared 
one level to the other. In our NICU, we now go down to 25% because we have more evidence of harm than, than we have evidence of benefit. But this has been 25,000 as our threshold. That's what I meant, sorry. 25,000 as our threshold. This is, this is fairly, fairly recent. In the absence of evidence, we are extrapolating what we have from the preterm population. But, uh, you know, it's another question, very important question. There is just so little data in full-term babies uh, and platelet transfusions. Which, of course, leads to the next question that, that, that I was given. A direct, we want an answer here, straightforward, no, walk, no asking around it. Uh, so your threshold for transfusing in ELBWs, um, 25,000, 50,000, what are you using? 25,000. Uh, I think that's what the evidence suggests. I'm going to tell you two caveats to that. At the beginning of our guidelines, we were recommending still 50,000 in babies less than uh, 27 weeks and then the first week of life and then moving on to 27,000. I work at Boston Children's. We, uh, we don't have a, an, an inborn population. We only have babies from the outside. Most of our babies are older, so most of our change was in the um, neck babies, septic babies that are a little bit older, and they were critically ill. I mean, oscillator, pressors, everything else. As long as they were not bleeding, we dropped to 25,000, you know, and and it worked well. We did not see an increase in bleeding. Uh, we had recently changing our guidelines to apply the 25,000 uh, threshold, even to the smallest babies. But we do realize that this is, this is an area where where there is the highest level of concern in, in, in neonatologists. They are the, the extremely premature babies in the first seven days of life. Uh, so we have a grant proposal that we hope will get funded for a randomized control trial, similar to Planet 2, but focusing on this extremely preterm babies, less than 27 weeks in the first week of life to provide more, more evidence to feel comfortable. But the current data suggests that even in those babies that are at high risk, uh, of bleeding and mortality from the mathematical modeling, which are the smallest babies and, and the earliest postnatal ages, benefit from the lower threshold. Uh, and some laboratory data that we have also suggest that they might be the babies that have the most harm from the playlist. So yes, 25,000, unless you are actively bleeding or have had a very recent bleeding. Usually in our unit, in the last 48 to 72 hours, then we keep them higher. Uh, but other than that, 25,000. Um, uh, this is an interesting question that we got. Um, is there an effort to, to retrieve platelets from cord blood? It's a great question. Physiologically, it would make sense. It would be really, there is no effort that I'm aware of to do that uh, clinically. The platelets are only stored for five to seven days, they are stored at room temperature. So it's it, it would, we would have to redefine blood banking to to be collecting from full term babies playlets. So it would be a, a difficult undertaking. Uh, there is a, a lot of research going on in generating playlets in vitro from embryonic stem cells or from core blood myocardiocytes to have in vitro generated playlets mm. that probably would mimic more a neonatal playlet but not to do core blood platelet uh, transfusions that, that I'm aware of. Um, so there's, and I think you might have answered this already, there's a question about um, in, should we, I guess, raising our, I'm trying to understand this, raising the threshold for transfusions um, in dire situations. So. Yeah, should we looking at, I guess the, I think maybe they're asking, should we only be transfusing if the baby's really sick, regardless of the threshold, unless it really starts to get low? Um, you know, no, we used to take level of illness into consideration in our transfusion uh, decisions. I would say that the current data supports that using a level of 25,000 is better and safer than using a level of 50,000, regardless of the underlying level of illness. We 
have applied 25,000 to the sickest babies, to our neck and Asarka, very, very sick babies. Uh, and, and we have done it that way. I would not recommend transitioning to only transfusive bleeding and never transfuse because we don't have safety data mm -hmm. that has ever looked at lower thresholds or that has looked at. So I, I do think that we should practice with the evidence that we have to date and the evidence has proven that 25,000 for the great majority of babies, unless they're actively bleeding or, or, or have had a recent major bleed, which were excluded in Planet 2, um, that 25,000 is, is safer than, than 50,000. But we, we haven't tested 10,000 or only if bleeding and no prophylactic platelet transfusions. In adults, that led to more intracranial hemorrhages, that approach of only transfusing if bleeding. Hmm. So I would not advocate for that. So if there is active bleeding going on, what's your threshold? You know, if the baby is pouring blood, we don't have a threshold. We, you know, we, we just transfuse. If the baby is, is, comes back from surgery or, you know, we recently had a baby with a gastric tear who was exsanguinating, uh, then we don't have a threshold. We just apply a massive transfusion protocol and give platelets, products, and red cells alternating. Uh, if we have a baby who had a recently, like the same baby, very recently went to the OR, has been repaired, but has a fresh clot, then we keep them above 50,000 for uh, 48 or 72 hours. Planet 2 excluded those babies for 72 hours. So, so I think it depends on defining active bleeding. What we don't do however, is to have a little blood tinge secretions and call that active bleeding and, and, and go up. Right. That we try to discourage. What about uh, thresholds uh, if you're going to do a procedure like an LP? That's a great question. We do use 50,000 for procedures, pre-surgically and procedures, yes. You know, I don't know if it's necessary for LP, but that's what we do. We do 50,000 for, for all of our procedures Great. Uh, and for surgery. Um, I have a couple questions here about testing for um, whole blood hemostasis and, and um, you know, closing time um, or bleeding time. Is there anything that's commercially available or is it all experimental right now? No, the, the, the test that we did the study on, the closure time uh, ADP, the CT ADP, with the platelet function analyzer is commercially available. The problem is that it requires 800 microliters of blood. It's a fair amount of blood uh, in addition to your, to your CBC. And that data that we have right now is only from one cohort, and we have never tested it further. So the test itself is commercially available, but it requires a lot of a lot of blood and I don't think we are at a stage where we should use that to make uh, clinical transfusion decisions yet. But um, you know just to put an analogy when when we are looking at babies with acute kidney injury you know never a nephrologist has asked how many nephrons does the baby have you know they just ask what is the kidney function so we we can measure the platelet count but it probably is not as relevant as what is the hemostatic ability of the baby you know, if you take it all together. Uh, so I think over time, we should explore that and find better markers of bleeding risk than the platelet count, but that's not, it's, it's commercially available, but not ready for prime time use. Okay, time. well, I was ready to walk into the CEO's office and demand that the lab buy one. <laughs> we only have 76 babies in one cohort. It's <laughs> compelling, but I, I, would, I would stop that. Don't, don't, don't go to your CEO. Well, the CEO and the CFO are relieved. Good. Um, let's see. So I, um, as I was jotting my notes down, the things that we can do in our units right away to improve outcomes that won't require a lot of change, uh, won't require a lot of expenses, um, obviously lowering our platelet threshold is, is the clear cut. Um, Prolonging our platelet infusion time going from 30 minutes to an hour or even two hours is better. I think uh, certainly an hour. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll stay tuned to, to see if there are any, you know,
therapeutics to decrease platelet activation in adult platelets, and we'll stay tuned to see if our labs can get any, any better. Um, I've got multiple um, requests to see if they can get a copy of your transfusion protocol. Um, I will say that, um, just as, and this is in general for the rest of the conference as well, um, the slides in these presentations will be available online in about two weeks. So if, for those, you know, you're watching live that, oh, I want to go back and watch that again, or you want to show other people, um, obviously if you watch it later, it won't be, you can't get your CMEs or CEUs from it. Um, but it will be up and posted so you can get, you can watch this uh, later. Um, is there, um, is your particular transfusion protocol published or is that just within your unit? It is only within our unit and is a, a Boston Children's uh, kind, kind of thing. We are right now, as we speak, in the process of modifying it to make it even more restrictive. Uh, so I would hesitate to share what is this moment because it's going to change in, in the next few weeks. Uh, but people can reach out to me and I'll be happy to share the finalized. It truly should be 25,000 for most babies and less actively bleeding or going for a procedure. Uh, and that's what that's what we're heading towards. But uh, but I'm very happy to have anybody reach out to me and, and we'll share as soon as we've modified it. Okay, so I keep thinking we're just about done with you and I'm gonna let you go and then get more questions coming in. Um, this is in regards to um, you know, thresholds for transfusion with uh, um, antiplatelet antibodies present. Oh yeah, so it depends. It depends on the on the uh, on the antibody. Uh, Planet two, first of all, excluded uh, babies with aluminum thrombocytopenia, so they were they were excluded. The overall literature recommends 30,000 as the threshold for babies with neonatal autoimmune thrombocytopenia. We recommend 25 or 30,000 for those full-term babies, uh, and uh, especially you know early early on. Uh, if you have ITP, if the mom has ITP and the baby has those kind of antibodies, they tend to be refractory to platelet transfusions. So in those cases, we reserve it for if the baby is bleeding or if the baby, um, or if the count is less than 20,000, especially if the baby is full term. So we are, we are similarly restrictive, um, but those babies have been excluded from the published literature. And most of the literature in that field uses 30,000 for fetal aluminum thrombocytopenia and 20,000 for ITP, maternal ITP. Okay, last question, I promise. No problem. <laughs> and this is just in regards to volume of transfusions. Do you see a benefit of 10 per kilo versus 15 per kilo? We switched to 10 per kilo from our traditional 15 cc's per kilo. And I do think that's a potential good change uh, most neonatologists are not aware of the fact that we transfuse a lot more than older children or adults ever get. A normal platelet transfusion in older children and adults is about three to five cc's per kilo. And we give our babies 15, and that's what they got in Planet 2, 15 cc's per kilo. So whatever there is, the platelets also release a lot of factors into the supernatum during storage. So whatever it is that is there that is potentially negative and deleterious and, and affecting the baby, we are giving babies three times the dose that, that an older child or an adult gets. So the most vulnerables are getting um, uh, a three times larger dose than what an older child or an adult would get. Um, and there is no good rationale for why. Babies don't need more, you know, and, and, and it might be that we're overwhelming the system with giving a lot of pro-inflammatory mediators. So we have switched to 10, and I think there is a movement in Europe to study 5 versus 15 per kilo and see whether this, this volume actually contributed to the, to the bad findings of Planet 2. But until we have that, we strongly recommend 10 per kilo for our transfusions. Dr. Solovisner, I can't thank you enough. This has been an 
absolute pleasure to have you speak at this conference. And I know from the response from the audience and people online, they've really appreciated your talk. It has given a lot, it, it's meaty. It's given us a lot to think about <clears throat> and it will, I can guarantee change uh, how we deal with platelets in our own unit here. So again, I, I, I thank you very, very much for, for being part of this conference. I appreciate the invitation, always a joy. Thank you so much and yeah. you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. All right, um, we're gonna, actually, boy, we hit right on time. Uh, so we're gonna go on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sarah Taylor, who's going to be um, speaking to us about evidence-based evidence opportunities in preterm infant enteral nutrition. Uh, we always like to have you know, good talks about, about nutrition. And Dr. Taylor comes to us from Yale University School of Medicine. Um, she directs the, the Yale Neonatal Nourish Team, which investigates how fetal and neonatal metabolic nutrition ensures impact uh, infant growth and development. She's involved in the NICHD and the American Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, she's got a particular interest in human milk and lactation. Um, she has served in the International Society for Research in Human Milk and Lactation. Um, uh, and I think in particular, this was cool in 2015 while in the faculty of uh, the Medical University of South Carolina, she actually started the Mother's Milk Bank of South Carolina. So we're excited to have her with us, um, again, to talk about evidence-based opportunities in preterm infant enteral nutrition. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to talk to you about evidence-based opportunities in preterm infant nutrition. These are my disclosures. So uh, when we think about what's important in nutrition, uh, I think we really have to focus on the outcomes. Um, today, I'll kind of divide some of the nutrients into macronutrients, which are your, is your energy, so your calories, uh, your fat, and your carbohydrates, and your protein, and then micronutrients, which are the vitamins and the minerals and such. Uh, but really, when we think about what does the preterm infant need, um, we're concentrating on those outcomes and some of the outcomes that are important to us in preterm infant uh, health are growth. Uh, we definitely like to grow babies. And we'll talk a little bit about how we uh, now have seen that growth relates to neurodevelopment, which makes uh, neurodevelop or makes growth more important for its role in neurodevelopment. Bone health, uh, preemies are definitely at risk for poor bone mineralization. And then uh, an area that we don't talk about as much as maybe our adult colleagues is the role of nutrition in either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory states. And so this comes up in the adult literature regarding obesity. Um, our preterm babies are fairly inflamed. You know, a lot of the diseases we deal with are, are, um, are you know, are, have quite a bit of inflammation involved, be it necrotizing enterocolitis, or um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So really, are we optimizing the use of our nutrition for its anti-inflammatory uh, ability? And then uh, our preemies are, are still growing, they're still developing, and specifically looking at the two organs where our babies can have quite a bit of immaturity, which is the gut and the lungs. We're going to focus on enteral nutrition. Uh, I know the topic was uh, just nutrition in general, but it was too overwhelming for a 50-minute talk. So really going to, to focus on enteral with the idea that we're just using parental nutrition, if possible, just using it as a bridge uh, to full enteral nutrition. Uh, I can't give a talk on nutrition without talking about maternal milk. So we're just going to start there. And um, the, the fact that the milk... Uh, is, is just um, full of anti-inflammatory components and, and also components, growth factors and cytokines and, and so, you know, specific hormones that, that are then going to relate to organ development. It's very similar to amniotic fluids of a lot of the great components that a fetus would be exposed to, uh, then the infant receiving maternal milk will also be exposed to. And the evidence shows, even though we don't have 
great randomized controlled trials because we're not going to randomize babies to receive mother's milk or to not receive mother's milk. Uh, with the evidence that we have available, it does appear that intake of maternal milk is related to decreased necrotizing enterocolitis, severe retinopathy of prematurity, and potentially related to decreased late onset sepsis and bronchopulmonary dysplasia. I am going to talk about maternal milk in this talk, and I think there is some mention of breastfeeding and such, but I do want to recognize that um, we, we, we know that there are parents in our neonatal intensive care units who do not identify as, as female and therefore may be uh, more comfortable with the description of parent milk or description of breastfeeding as chest feeding. So definitely respect that for this talk and because the research has been done in maternal milk and breastfeeding, those are the terms I'm going to use. So maternal milk for neurodevelopment, really when you think about what's important to families, it's the brain development and, and really what is this baby going to be able to do in school and in communication and movement and such. And so we're fortunate there, there are a fair number of studies in very preterm babies or in preterm babies looking at neurodevelopment as an outcome and they really are from across the globe. Here they are, uh, and I think there are even more that, that I could include in this, but that these do give you the basis, I think, of, of what I'm describing. Um, and there are different populations. You see sometimes it was extremely low birth weight, other times very, um, and even one was just looking at low birth weight infants. Uh, they, there's differences in human milk dose. There's heterogeneity there, so we need to kind of look at that and, and see that there are different exposures. And there were different ages at evaluation, uh, which is also important. So we've definitely learned that your neurodevelopmental testing at 30 months doesn't necessarily uh, uh, give um, predict what the infants are, what the child is going to be able to do in school or in high school or you know on from that. So there is something to be said for, for the later evaluations of ability. But consistently, we see improved uh, neurodevelopmental or IQ scores with the intake of maternal milk. And um, I draw your attention to the Horwood study there in the middle from 2001. This was done out of Brown, uh, looking at the duration, how long the infant, the very low birth weight infant was exposed to, to breast milk, and that found that breastfeeding for greater than or equal to eight months, there was a higher adjusted mean verbal IQ of six points compared to those with no breast milk. So bringing up that idea of a longer duration of exposure may relate to better brain development. Now, I can't talk about this topic without realizing that the, the, the women who are making milk and, and perhaps have the, the social support in order to give them time for pumping and, and the self-efficacy in uh, milk production, uh, that that is a population that is often higher um, or older moms, higher educated and such, which may also relate to better brain development for the infant. So uh, we can't differentiate in these studies that I just showed you whether this relationship is just um, due to the exposure to the milk or may also be related to uh, the types of women who historically have been able to sustain maternal milk because of higher resources. Um, also don't know what this may mean, the actual breastfeeding and that maternal child relationship, the bonding, close contact, how that might relate to brain development. So it may not be the components of the milk. Um, and then the negative factors, of course, uh, the, of poverty and lack of stimulation that can occur when families have low resources. So, Still have much to learn, but but it looks like right now from what we have that the intake of maternal milk really does relate to, to uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. So uh, our primary types of feeding for very preterm babies or preterm babies is formula or, or human milk. Um, and here's a, a visual of, of the differences there. So human milk is full of uh, cells and these milk fat globules and uh, my cells and, and just very, um, varied in its composition. It uh, looks very alive if you look there on the right, whereas formula is more homogenous. And there are FDA guidelines here in the U.S. for infant formula uh, looking at um, the, they, they're based on the energy content of the, the, the formula. 
and uh, a total of 29 components are regulated. And uh, just good to know that compared to human milk formula, it's higher in sodium, calcium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, phosphorus, and most amino acids, and is lower in cholesterol. Whereas human milk is full of all these actual biologic components. Um, I don't, I'm sure I didn't even list them all here, but there's enzymes, there's growth factors, cytokines, uh, different other types of um, proteins and fats that can be either nutritional or related um, to more to, to being bioactives. And we talk about that a lot in human milk, the, 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 not just the nutrition, but that bioactives, those components that are either work locally in the gut or are absorbed in, um, in total, intact. Uh, so then they can play more of a biological role in the human body. So if uh, maternal milk is related to neurodevelopment, and we're going to talk about some uh, other potential uh, benefits of maternal milk, then uh, we really do in the NICU need to concentrate on obtaining that milk. Uh, and there is some nice evidence. You see the, the references there below on how to uh, either uh, how to both initiate and sustain uh, this milk supply. And so some studies have looked at this as sustaining to greater than 40 weeks, um, recommend expressing milk by six hours after birth, performing kangaroo care and expressing milk at least five times per day. Now to initiate milk, uh, you really need to be expressing six to eight times per day, but, but some mothers are able to sustain um, once the milk has come in uh, by expressing um, only five times per day. Others do need more. And then other uh, researchers have looked at this as how to have an adequate supply at hospital discharge, double pumping, so pumping both breasts at the same time, um, having a milk volume of 500 milliliters per day by day 10 is predictive of sustaining till hospital discharge. Uh, having um, or the, the, the women describing uh, a higher score or, or better breast pump comfort and then a supportive NICU environment, supported by having adequate staff to support lactation, the education of the nurses, and then in general, the culture, the nursing support of breastfeeding. All of these are associated with sustaining maternal milk supply. I want to concentrate for a second on kangaroo care. So, you know, it, it seems like sometimes we think of kangaroo care as this nice thing to do, and it's bonding, and we'll do it if we have time or if um, the baby is, is adequately stable and, and those things are important, but I think we really need to realize that kangaroo care is an evidence-based method to support milk supply. Um, this first study here was a, a study where they looked at, it was a cohort study, so they looked at the exposure um, to, to mother's milk um, actually, excuse me, it's more of a case control study. So they looked at who was still breastfeeding at one month, two months, three months, four months, and so on. And they looked back to see how much skin to skin time um, the infant had been exposed to in the hospital. And you see there that fairly regularly, the very preterm babies who were breastfeeding were exposed to a higher number of minutes per day of skin to skin care or kangaroo mother's care. Uh, and so uh, again, uh, potentially this relates to mothers being more available because they have better resources, but still is something um, that we need to take seriously and, and look at how we can implement this in our unit. There's also been a randomized controlled trial. These were older babies, 32 to 36 weeks. Uh, the intervention group had unlimited kangaroo care um, compared to their standard of care and the unlimited kangaroo care those um, mother infant dyads uh, had a longer duration of breastfeeding, uh, reaching five uh, versus two months on average, and also a longer duration of exclusive breastfeeding. So really need to recognize the power of skin to skin and kangaroo mother care. I'm going to shift gears now um, and talk about where uh, maternal milk falls short. Uh, to the nutrition of, of very preterm babies. So milk is made for supporting the full-term healthy infant. And, and so therefore, uh, there are some times that there just is not adequate nutrition in uh, the milk for a uh, preterm infant, especially a very preterm infant. Uh, and so just giving you an idea of what the, how the very preterm infant daily needs relate 
to the human milk um, that's given. So if you're giving 150 ml per kilo per day, or also looking at it, there, there's some work in Europe to say, um, can we feed our very preterm babies more like 200, 300 milliliters per kilo per day and give them the adequate nutrition uh, to have uh, good bone health and, and good growth? Um, so you see there in the, the, the second column that the, the energy, protein, calcium, and phosphorus needs of very preterm babies. The human milk at 150 ml per kilo per, per day may fall short in energy. It, it may not. There's a lot of variation between women and, and the energy. Um, it likely falls short in protein, may not, but, but likely does. Um, and then does fall short in calcium and phosphorus. And even when you go up to the 200 to 300 milliliters per kilo per day, um, you, you will get adequate energy, but you're not necessarily going to have adequate protein, calcium, or phosphorus. And other nutrients where there's a mismatch where the infants, um, the preterm infant may be getting less than they, than they, they need um, when they're being fed uh, maternal milk, sodium, iron, zinc, and vitamins, including vitamin D. Are, are ones that have been studied. The other thing to just keep in mind um, is that uh, we ask, uh, or, or we we um, have studied and seen that making at least 500 milliliters relates to sustaining milk supply. So we really encourage moms, of course, to be making these higher volumes. Um, often women are making a liter a day, but these infants are taking maybe um, 100 to 200 milliliters per kilo per day, depending on how small they are. Uh, and so there's this mismatch where the, the 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 mother's body is making the nutrition for a day. That the, the, there's often we see that um, you know even though women make different amount of calories and different amount of um, of uh, other nutrients, uh, that the infant kind of self regulates the full term infant, I should say, self regulates what they need. You know, they're at the breast, and they can kind of regulate mom's milk supply. And so that's this very dyadic um, give and take to ensure that the infant gets the nutrition they need. Our preterm infants aren't doing that if, when they're being gavage fed. They're not at the breast. Um, we're limiting their intake, and so even what the mom is making, what her body's making for an infant for 24 hours, our, our infants may only be getting a quarter of that. Um, so, so I think that's a good concept to keep in mind. Um, and then also, unfortunately, the uh, nutrition that's lost in the way that we get milk from mom to the infant. So, you know, uh, sometimes there's pumping right there at the bedside and immediately given to the infant, which is fantastic. But often this was pumped at home, it was frozen, it's then thawed, it goes from the container in which mother pumped into, into a storage container and then into a syringe or maybe even another container to be in the refrigerator to then go into a syringe to be fed. Then it goes through the tube to the infant. Um, every time the, the milk goes to a different piece of plastic, fat's going to be lost. Fat just sticks to the sides of the plastic. If you work in the NICU, you've seen it. Um, and so we're losing a fair amount of nutrition in our, our storage and feed preparation as well. I will mention formula some. Um, so even though talking a lot about maternal milk, um, there there are formula studies looking at preterm formula versus standard term formula. These were older, as you can imagine, um, especially looking at the, the smaller babies. But we do see that when preterm formula rather than standard term formula is fed to hospitalized preterm infants, that the infants have higher weight gain, head circumference gain, and actually had a higher uh, psychomotor development index, which is interesting. So, uh, because they, there was no effect on cerebral palsy, but but very much potential that there was that um, the the preterm infant formula related uh, to a better um, portion of, of brain development. No difference in necrotizing enterocolitis between preterm formula and standard formula to preterm babies. For uh, since we're not feeding formula um, often to our very preterm babies, at least for the first months. And we're going to talk a little bit about donor human milk in a moment. Um, we, we are working to get maternal milk and then supplementing with donor milk as, as needed often. Um, instead of these babies being exposed to, to formula as a way to increase the nutrition uh, that we, we often are feeding maternal milk or donor milk and then supported by a multi-component human milk fortifier. 
There's also have been studies. Um, you look at there, I guess the, the not the far right, but next to the far right, you can see the number of participants in these studies, as well as the number of randomized controlled trials, looking at the different outcomes. Um, and consistently babies fed the fortified milk compared to unfortified milk um, have a higher weight gain, length gain, head circumference gain, no difference in neurodevelopment. So human milk fortifier has not related to neurodevelopmental outcomes, either good or bad, and also no difference in necrotizing intracolitis. And this, in this um, meta-analysis, this Cochrane meta-analysis, uh, both um, fortifiers that are bovine and fortifiers that are human milk-based, donor milk-based. So, so the formula-based fortifiers and the donor milk-based fortifier studies are, are put together in, in, these, um, in this specific meta-analysis. Um, but there was no difference in exposure of um, human milk fortifier of developing necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, based on about 13 randomized controlled trials and over a thousand babies. And you see the relative risk there really does um, go, um, you know, cross, cross one um, really doesn't even have a, a trend towards uh, significance there or towards being uh, different, I should say. Okay, talking about pasteurized donor human milk, what, what do we know, what do studies show uh, that, that this, um, how does this relate to outcomes? and our preterm infants. So when you feed formula instead of pasteurized donor milk, you get increased risk of neck. So about an 87% increased risk of neck on average with formula feeding over pasteurized donor human milk to preterm infants. And you see that studies, those studies were, were about nine studies were done in about 1600 infants. Um, and, but then on the other side, uh, babies who are fed formula rather than the pasteurized donor human milk um, have better ha have better growth. Um, they have higher weight gain, higher length gain, and high, higher uh, head circumference gain. Um, there's no impact on neurodevelopment. There's been some really nice, um, nicely designed studies. Um, the O'Connor study was published in 2016, and then the Kalazi study, which was the NRN study, was published last year that showed no, no difference in neurodevelopment with um, donor milk compared to, to formula. So even though we see this for maternal milk, we don't see the same neurodevelopmental, um, um, out, a change in neurodevelopmental outcome with donor human milk. Really the only outcome that a benefit we see with donor human milk is the benefit of avoiding necrotizing enterocolitis. Uh, and so then getting into some of the macronutrients. So we've talked about the, the source, the 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 maternal milk, the, the preterm formula, or the donor milk. We've talked a little bit about fortifier. Um, and, and, um, and now we're also going to shift from talking about brain development more to focusing on growth as an outcome. And uh, this was a meta-analysis that I was uh, we, we performed through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics a few years ago. We looked at all the studies of the enteral protein intake um, unfortunately, when we with the um, kind of rules we had set for what studies that the, the uh, level of studies that we would include in this meta analysis, we ended up with only two. And you can see there they're from 1991 and 1994. They're not at all like we're feeding babies nowadays. So this was looking at um, protein in in maternal milk. Um, so so adding protein to maternal milk did relate to better growth overall. Um, the Batia study there wasn't significant, but then when you put it with the Hillman study, that yes, there is significantly uh, uh, higher growth uh, with weight gain, I should say, weight gain um, in grams per kilo per day with a higher intake of, of protein. And so um, looking at these studies and then some others that may not have been able to be included in this meta-analysis, 3.5 to 4.5 grams per kilo per day appears to be the uh, amount of enteral protein that is associated with the best weight gain in our very uh, preterm babies. Um, but, but so far have not seen, there are, are not studies showing that the amount of protein and that it relates to, um, to neurodevelopment, which is interesting. So we see growth relate to neurodevelopment. We see protein relate to growth, but we haven't seen protein 
relate to neurodevelopment. Uh, and so talking a little bit more about what does relate to neurodevelopment. So I mentioned this about the growth, um, poor growth uh, is associated with poor cognitive outcomes. Um, but uh, this is a kind of an overview that, that a few of us wrote together a few years ago. Um, just, just mentioning, and I mentioned this some with the maternal milk, that there may be other factors that relate uh, maternal milk intake relate to maternal milk intake and separately relate to neurodevelopment, it's possible here as well. So social determinants of health, prenatal factors, that intrauterine environment, um, nutrition. Uh, so, so that's what we're focused on is what's the nutritional intake. But it's not just nutrition, it's also the stress in the, in, in the NICU. And this gets into some of the inflammation and how it relates to infant outcomes. I think we've all had those infants that you're just pouring nutrition into them and they're not growing. And, um, I, you know, is there just a certain amount of inflammation in the gut or total body or such that, um, uh, you know, that the uh, nutrition that we're providing just cannot be metabolized? Uh, where it needs to be metabolized to optimize infant outcomes because of the stress, inflammation of the infant, um, as well as then the, how it relates to other morbidities. And we'll talk a little bit about BPD at the end of this talk. So um, again, relating that, that we know growth, uh, when we look at the studies, relates to poor cognitive outcomes, but it may not be in a direct effect. It may be that there's another factor that is affecting both growth and brain development. So these are some of the nutrients that have been related to brain development. Um, nice summary done by Sarah Ramel and, and Mandy Belfort, the reference is there at the bottom. Uh, looking at the macronutrients, so protein and glucose have related to brain development. Um, and, and I should say, so, uh, you know, I said that it, it, we haven't related specifically, let me go back for a second. So we've not been able to give intral nutrition um, in a randomized controlled trial and relate that to brain development. But in non-randomized controlled trials, when you just look at uh, neurodevelopment and you look back and see what the babies with the better scores, what they had been exposed to, you do see that uh, higher protein exposure then can relate and the, 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 to the babies that had the better, better neurodevelopment, just not in a randomized controlled trial that we've shown that. Um, specific fats, especially the long chain uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, glucose, glucose is important for the brain, um, as we know as neonatologists, micronutrients such as iron, zinc, copper, and iodine, and then um, some um, vitamins there that have specifically have studies that where they, there's an association with brain development. Talk a little more about the long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, the PUFAs. This has been this is an area of, of science that is really um, intriguing to me because you look at the studies in the lab, the studies in animals, the non-randomized control trials. So, so just looking at the, the exposure of infants to PUFAs, and they are important. They're important in, in uh, cell membranes, especially in the, the central nervous system. They're important in growth. They have this awesome anti-inflammatory effect, especially DHA, and important in brain and eye growth. And it just makes sense that we need to identify what is the dose of DHA and these long-chain fatty acids that relates to better neurodevelopmental outcome. And there's been some fantastic well-designed randomized controlled trials to do that. And in over 17 trials and over 2,000 infants, that we cannot find the dose of DHA that relates to better visual acuity, neurodevelopment, or physical growth. And it's really perplexing when it makes so much sense in the lab or in observational studies, but doesn't translate in these in these randomized controlled trials. Um, and so one thing uh, that that we've realized, and, and we're we now have a study going on to to um, funded by NIH to figure out. The, the, the answer to that question, why, why we have this disconnect um, in our review to prepare for that, really when you look at the trials of DHA alone, um, there's no benefit. And in fact, there's a potential increase in BPD. So, so part of this has been not realizing how critical it is when you're talking about these fatty acids, that there's a balance. And, and, and really it appears that the balance for DHA needs to be with ARA. 
Um, and so you're you're working towards a certain ratio of DHA and ARA um, rather than just DHA intake alone. And so this is the study that we're just starting. Um, really exciting. It is a randomized controlled trial where infants are uh, um, going to be um, randomized to receive uh, extra DHA or ARA um, or, or not. Um, but we're not looking at the clinical outcomes because that hasn't given great answers in the past. Um, and other people are looking at the clinical outcomes and finding interesting information. We want to look at the metabolism. We want to look at what is going on in these fatty acid met metabolic systems, both the anti-inflammatory ones and kind of growth promoting ones, as well as the pro-inflammatory ones, because PUFAs do have um, some pro-inflammatory cascades. Uh, and and look at um, then then uh, and, and look at what is turned on by exposures to this DHA ARA mixture. So don't have any results yet because we're just starting recruitment, but um, looking forward to to seeing what we find to hopefully answer that question of why there's a disconnect in the study of PUFAs. One reason, uh, another reason there could be a disconnect is when we look at the the components, those bioactives of milk, uh, we find that there's a lot of interaction. And so this idea that just giving one component of the milk will uh, achieve a benefit um, has fallen short uh, quite often. And so uh, these are just two examples of where people ha um, have, have looked and said, you know, it's not just one component, it's going to be this interaction of multi-components um, looking at lutein, choline, and DHA together, and others looking at the milk fat globule membrane and lactoferrin. Again, uh, these, these interactions to optimize brain development. So one area that, that really is interactive and really shows the power of milk, um, and I say milk um, instead of maternal milk because this milk fat globules are in cow's milk, bovine milk, as well as maternal milk. And this milk fat globule, just uh, that the um, membrane of it there, you see that external membrane of the globule is just full of awesome uh, phospholipids and, and polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acids. And um, it, it it's not just though that the lipid layers, it also has um, some um, human milk oligosaccharides and, and, um, and other nutrients as well. And, and historically, this was discarded in formula processing, the way that formula is made, that the human milk, the milk fat globule membrane was discarded. Um, and so again, recognizing its importance in uh, maternal milk, human milk, but also in, uh, in cow's milk, uh, there have been some formula studies. And again, the nice thing about formula studies is you have complete control of what babies are, are taking in. Um, and in these formula studies, uh, even though they're small, but there are some um, that they, they now have ha followed neurodevelopment out longer, um, that it does appear that having the milk fat globule membrane supplement added to the formula relates to better neurodevelopmental outcomes. So, so there, there's still these wonderful growing opportunities for us to optimize both our um, our use of, of maternal milk, our use of human milk fortifiers, and our, and our use of formula. Moving past the brain to uh, the bones. So um, rickets of prematurity, osteopenia, prematurity, metabolic bone disease, whatever you call it, um, our very preterm babies get it. And, you know, if you've been in this field as long as I have, you've seen fractures, you've seen chest x-rays when you're like, I can't see the bones. Um, and uh, because they're just they're so poorly mineralized. Uh, and so when we look at what causes uh, or what are the risk factors for metabolic bone disease, it is multifactorial. So, so it's not, it's often not just one, it's, it's a whole complex of babies. So, so often they were undernourished because they were, just didn't tolerate feeds or didn't tolerate fortification. They were on parental nutrition longer. And so they had a lower intake of phosphorus and or calcium or, and or vitamin D. There's actually a great randomized control trial from 2000. I think it was performed in Utah where they randomized babies to have physical movement 
versus not and showed better bone mineralization. So a lot of our babies, you know, they're meant to be swimming around up there in the, in the uterus and in the womb. And they, um, they're not, they're, they're, they're affected more by gravity. They're laying in one position so often, even though we flip them, they still um, aren't moving so three-dimensionally as they would um, if we were still in utero. And so that lack of movement, unfortunately, does affect bone mineralization. And then um, the medications we're often giving, especially for lung disease, steroids, um, so dexamethasone courses, and um, the diuretics, especially the loop diuretics, do relate to poor um, bone mineralization. So what should we be giving in nutrition to counteract that? Uh, well, speaking of enteral nutrition, the parental nutrition, it's really hard to give adequate phosphorus and, and often hard to give adequate calcium in the parental nutrition. But, um, you know, with the, the, the goal of this talk really being the enteral, the good news, um, you see the calcium goal there, it's 120 to 200 mg per kilo per day, which is how we usually think of calcium in the United States. Um, for, for our fortification, for our different types of formulas, um, it's our preterm formulas, babies are going to get adequate calcium. So unfortified human milk's low, interim formulas are low, but that the, the, the fortifier and this preterm formulas are giving our babies adequate calcium. Same goes for phosphorus, where the uh, unfortified milk's low and the term formulas are low, but the, um, the, uh, the fortified um, milks and, and the preemie formulas are giving our babies what they need. And, and this has been seen in some randomized controlled trials and other studies um, when they looked at the, the, this, the fortifiers, you know, forti this fortifier versus that fortifier or this formula versus that formula. Um, and you look at bait hospitalized babies uh, that just consistently the bone mineralization is better. Um, with preterm infant formula through at least term age or, or fortifiers, I should say. So as long as you're giving fortifiers or formulas um, and the baby's able to tolerate enteral nutrition, you're doing what you can to protect their bones. Um, there's not one product that's better that been proven to be better than the other. Um, and so I, that's, I think, good to know um, that, that uh, we're covered there if we're on that type of preterm infant nutrition in the hospital. Post-discharge is fascinating. So, you know, a lot of us do use these post-discharge transitional formulas for our very preterm babies when they go home. Um, so there's 22 calorie formulas if they're not receiving um, human milk. And, um, and looking, well, how long should they be on these to optimize their bone mineralization? We really don't have great studies. So actually, there's never been a study that showed that being on that 22 calorie milk uh, with a little higher calcium and phosphorus, as I showed before, um, you can see uh, here that, you know, that if you look at the bottom, those post-discharge formulas, those 22 calorie formulas versus the term. So definitely more calcium in those uh, 22 calorie formulas and more phosphorus in those 22 calorie formulas. Um, when you look at how long to, to stay on those post-discharge, unfortunately, there's no association between better bone mineralization and being on those formulas with higher calcium and phosphorus. And in fact, one study um, performed by Winston Koo uh, here in the U.S. found that the, um, the nutrient en enriched group, so the infants that were on the 22 calorie formula had lower bone mass at 12 months compared to the infants who had been on the term formula. I know it doesn't make sense, um, but uh, I think it's important to know we don't know how long uh, preterm babies need to be on extra calcium and phosphorus after uh, hospital discharge or term age. Getting into a little bit of, of um, vitamin D, and, and I'll probably talk about this a little bit more than I will other nutrients because this is where my research career started. Um, uh, and so just talking about what is the normal, what is the, 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 uh, the what are the values of the serum 25 hydroxy D? That's the biomarker. That's what we measure in infants um, to, to assess their vitamin D status. What is normal? Um, and so uh, when I started in this area back in the 90s, um, really all we had to define normal, everything had been defined on the study from 1971. And um, this was done in adults, and and um, they uh, so, or I should say, we we had some evidence for children up there at the top. So we knew that in in full term babies to avoid rickets, 
So to avoid truly visible rickets and babies, they needed to have um, a 25 hydroxy D level of at least five to 12 nanograms per ml. And so this is where we kind of said, well, if you're you're going to avoid rickets with five to 12 nanograms per ml, then let's say that that normal is greater than 20, because um, then we'll give a little bit of a buffer to know that these babies are going to avoid rickets with that uh, 25 hydroxy D level. And then in adults, they did this study in the 1970s and they took normal adult volunteers and uh, saying that whatever their vitamin D levels are, that was would define normal. They took patients with biliary cirrhosis who, who had difficulty then um, metabolizing um, vitamin D and, and, and absorbing vitamin D. And um, they, they said they'll be the low, they'll be the insufficient group. And then we'll look at lifeguards and, you know, there's so much sun exposure and vitamin D is uh, metabolized. The conversion begins in the skin if you're sun exposed and we'll call them high. And these uh, numbers uh, are in nanomoles per liter. So nanomoles per liter, what's used in the rest of the world. Um, so this is uh, the, the, those numbers about 2.5 grams. Um, it's 2.5 um, times the nanograms per ml that, that we use in the U.S. But the main take home here is this is how they define normal. It wasn't defined on a functional definition. Instead, it was find on defined on what was seen in the general population. So not looking at outcomes. So then in preterm infants, it's like, well, we're good at science and nutritional science. Let's look at outcomes. Uh, and so one study was done in the 1980s and uh, they did a three-day study in 117 infants. And they found that vitamin D supplementation of 1,200 to 2,000 international units per day was associated with better intestinal absorption of calcium. Um, and so it looks like from this study that our babies really needed to be on 1,200 to 2,000 international units per day. But then the same group with a different first author did a similar study in 1992 and found no association of vitamin D supplementation with intestinal calcium absorption. So they found the exact opposite, but they didn't measure vitamin D status, um, the 25 hydroxy D status, which is really frustrating that we didn't have that data. So here we were trying to define vitamin D needs based on function in our population, but getting very different answers. And unfortunately, this difference in answers has persisted. So these are the four randomized controlled trials that have looked at vitamin D dosing in preterm infants. You see the populations um, were extremely preterm um, to, uh, to very preterm to very low birth weight, but, but fairly similar are smaller babies. Um, the supplementations were either through a, a, a month or two months, or I think, yeah, the Backstrom one there in the blue was three months. So a so little bit of difference of duration. The dosing was a little different. Um, the fort at all had placebo on top of nutrition. So they, they calculated that their babies were receiving that were on the placebo, we were receiving about 200 international units per day from their nutrition. Then they gave supplements to get up to a thousand. The next study to compare 400 to, to 800 intake. And then you see there fairly similar doses in, in all four of these studies. What was really different was the 25 hydroxy D levels they achieved. So um, the Ford study, which is the most recent one from UAB, really showed significant differences you see there in the 25 hydroxy D levels. So the lower dose on was had a median of uh, 22, higher dose and medium, um, or the highest dose, the median of 85, which is you know, fairly high. Um, someone could describe toxic. I don't, but um, that's a different, uh, that'll be a different talk. Um, and then the Hansen study and the others, though, really not seeing that same difference between the different doses. And even if you look at the Ku study there at the bottom, the differences were 26, 32, and 31. So very similar. And really none of these um, had outcomes that differed in the group, except for the Ford study having this difference in um, groups in 25 hydroxy D. So very frustrating to do these great randomized control trials and, and still feel like we, we don't know the answer to how much vitamin D we should have our very preterm babies, babies receiving. Why is it so different? Is it because vitamin D is poorly absorbed? Probably not, it's fat soluble. As long as you've got your distal ileum, you're going to um, likely absorb vitamin D. 
Um, our babies have high fat stores, but you know, even when you're looking at like the inter it, the um the international units per kilo, looking at it, you know, weight based and, and looking at their fat stores, still not able to see anything that that's interesting, you know, any sort of interesting outcomes there. Potentially the, the differences in how the 25 hydroxy D is measured led to some of these inconsistencies. Maybe it's broken down by other enzymes, this vitamin D, this oral vitamin D supplement we give. Maybe there's variation in the vitamin D binding protein. We don't know. Um, so it's led to, to some uh, frustration with really not having great evidence of how much vitamin D to give our babies. Um, some work that I did when I was in South Carolina, we were, this was an observational study. Um, what we did find is that um, PTH was high and then came down to a normal level as vitamin D status, the 25 hydroxy D status improved or got higher. And then the femur bone mineral content did the same or did the opposite, sorry. The femur bone mineral content um, was um, lower and then had a steady increase until you hit a plateau of uh, 25 hydroxy D status. We're getting above a higher 25 hydroxy D status, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't um, didn't relate to better femur bone mineral content. And when you look at those and where those inflection points are, where PTH came down to a plateau and where femur bone mineral content came up to a plateau, and all of these were measurements at term age and very preterm infants, you see there those thresholds. So where those those inflection points were we're right around uh, 40 to 50 um, mi nanograms per milliliters of 25 hydroxy D. So, so I do, um, this, this study, we do need to, to validate this in, a, in another population. I'm not going to say that this has absolutely um, been proven, but, but I do think there's reason uh, to consider um, shooting for a level of 25 hydroxy D, D level of 40 to 50 nanograms per ml in our very preterm babies to optimize the um, calcium homeostasis uh, that is um, seen when you have a, um, a PTH that, that is low, and of course, then to optimize the, the bone mineral content. So what is the safe range? So guys, I can't tell you the evidence-based range, um, the best vitamin D dose, but, but based on um, information on safety, and what we do have for efficacy, recommending a dose of 400 to 1,000 international units per day. Uh, and then I, I think with that, just to be mindful uh, that we think you know, our fortifiers and our formulas have vitamin D in them, and we think, oh, that that's, um, should be enough. But actually, it's not when our babies are less than 1,500 grams. So looking at babies at 500 grams or at 1,000 grams, you can see there on parental nutrition, on the um, maternal milk with, with bovine fortified human milk fortifier or preterm formula. And, and I'll say that the, the um, human milk based human milk fortifier has even lower vitamin D than the bovine uh, fortifier, um, that the, they're still below the 400 international units. And it's only so, so they really need to be receiving um, either a multivitamin preparation or a um, just a vitamin D preparation um, to get them up to that 400 international units until they get to be, you know, around, um, really around two and a half kilos uh, to consistently be above the 400. So something to be mindful of giving some extra vitamin D. Um, and so just go back and have fun with the math, talk to your dietitians um, about with how you nourish babies, your, your choices in nutrition, when you should be giving some extra vitamin D. Um, gut health. So we've talked about the, the, the brain, the bones and, and growth, and then the gut. And, and really, uh, human milk is, is just very powerful in protecting the preterm infant gut. It uh, uh, protects from bacterial in, um, invasion it decre by decreasing intestinal permeability and just making the whole environment um, a negative environment um, for a harmful environment for bacteria. I'll put it that way. Uh, and it does so... Um, you know, or I should say, we really, what do we think about with the gut? Well, we want the gut to grow and mature well, but we, of course, want to avoid necrotizing enterocolitis. And don't look over on the far right. We're not going to get into probiotics. That, again, would be a whole nother talk. But um, looking at the, the the dysbiosis in preterm infants um, so in their gut, so why they have abnormal bacteria, 
uh, that that formula feeding does relate to that. And so when you're human milk fed or when you're formula fed, there's injury to the gut and there's um, proliferation of the the harmful bacteria um, that can then uh, lead to an inflammatory response and increased neck. Um, sepsis and death. But then over here on the left, the the human milk components and specifically pictured here are the human milk oligosaccharides, which are these carbohydrates in milk um, that aren't there for nutrition. They're there to feed the healthy bacteria, uh, such as the bifidobacterium, as well as they're absorbed and have a positive effect on leukocytes, white blood cells, decrease inflammation, and therefore decrease neck. Now the human milk fortifiers, um, there, you know, a lot of debate and and not sure what you all use, you know, whether you use the the human milk base, the donor milk base, or the formula or bovine based ones. But there is one well done um, triple blinded randomized control trial. Uh, there, they just finished another randomized control trial comparing the fortifiers in um, Europe, and those results have been um, presented as an abstract. And I will say that they uh, agree. Um, are very similar to these ones I'm about to show you now. Um, now, I'm not talking about those studies that have formula and the, the bovine fortifier compared to donor milk and the, the human milk fortifier that's based on human milk. I'm just talking about the studies that only the only difference is, is the fortifier. Uh, and so this was published by Debbie O'Connor in 2018. As I mentioned, it's triple blinded. Uh, these babies were were uh, less than 1250 grams, and you can see there the different kind of ways that they were nourished. The fortifier was added at 100 mLs per kilo per day. Their primary outcome uh, wasn't necrotizing enterocolitis. You need a lot of babies to have necrotizing enterocolitis as your primary outcome for a study, which is good. It's good that there's a low rate, but it makes it really tough to study. Um, but their primary outcome was feeding tolerance that they defined as the proportion of infants who had feeds um, held for over 12 hours or had a 50% reduction in their feed volume. And they had a strict protocol that the centers followed. And again, the center, centers were blinded to what the infant was receiving. Uh, they found no difference in feeding interruption um, in any way that the feeds were, were held, um, gastric residuals or abdominal distension. Um, they found no difference in, in death or sepsis or necrotizing enterocolitis, even though they, they didn't have enough babies to really study that well. They did see a difference in severe retinopathy or prematurity, which I find very, very interesting that the human milk fortifier um, relates to, to lower severe retinopathy or prematurity. And I think this needs to be explored. Uh, that is it possible that exposure to the bovine human milk fortifier uh, does um, cause more oxidative stress um, specifically to, to the eyes and increase the risk of retinopathy. Um, so look forward to, to more studies in that. Um, moving on though to, to BPD, which you know lung outcomes of course is another big uh, outcome for preterm babies. I had the opportunity to write this review with a great group from Ohio. And you see there, uh, we were able to look at the evidence and, and make some recommendations for calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, zinc, iron, and sodium, specifically for the infants with um, developing BPD to 40 weeks. And then also um, in those first six months after term age, some recommendations. Um, and really just uh, one thing that is, is important um, to consider, and we still need to learn more, and we all see this clinically, is babies grow differently in different stages of BPD. So that first stage, the acute stage, we see that their weight's all over the place and there's poor linear growth. These are the babies that just have no change in their linear growth over say three weeks. Then they get into this transitional phase where they're more feeder growers and we see improving weight and that the linear growth is starting to improve, but it's still slow. And then finally in this pro-growth phase, um, and this is often even, you know, the babies, once they've left us, um, finally, they're getting a better weight per length trend and consistent linear growth. And you see uh, these are recommendations for fluid and energy and protein um, to, to help um, to, to, to provide adequate nourishment to these BPD and infants with BPD. And I would especially highlight the protein definitely need to um, make sure, especially if you're limiting the enteral intake, that you are giving that four grams per kilo per day enteral protein 
um, especially in phase one and phase two to optimize your linear growth. So the takeaways from this talk, um, evidence-based enteral nutrition, uh, what can we do to optimize very preterm infant outcomes? Uh, maternal milk plays a role, appears to play a role in neurodevelopment and avoiding neck and avoiding severe ROP um, and potentially other diseases as well. Donor human milk is impactful in avoiding necrotizing enterocolitis, but does not relate to other outcomes. A um, multi-component fortifier has been shown to improve growth trajectories um, and as well as 3.5 to 4.5 grams per kilo per day of enteral protein intake. Um, there's no evidence of decreased feeding intolerance or improvement of other outcomes with the human, human milk-based um, HMF or, or uh, yes, with the human, human milk-based HMF compared to the bovine human milk, uh, the bovine HMF. Sorry, word word, um, word soup there, um, but I think you know what I mean, except for what I'd mentioned, um, and I'm very curious to further explore the less severe retinopathy of prematurity. Protein energy, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, zinc, iron, choline, and other minerals and vitamins are important for neurodevelopment. We just don't know exactly how much relates to, the, to that optimal neurodevelopment. So more research to be done there, but, but so far really, have shown in the lab and in some cohorts that, that they are important. Calcium, phosphorus, and vitamin D are important for meta, to avoid ben, metabolic bone disease. And then um, specifically for babies with bronchopulmonary dysplasia, I need to pay attention to what we're giving them. Protein, energy, calcium, and phosphorus, and vitamin D, especially when they're getting the diuretics and the steroids, zinc, iron, and sodium. Appreciate this opportunity to speak with you guys, and I look forward to taking questions. I do have to acknowledge my um, great research team here at Yale. Thanks so much. Dr. Taylor, it is great to have you with us. Well, thank you. Glad to be here. Um, talk was fantastic, um, something we all very much appreciate, um, especially when it comes to nutrition and feeding babies. Uh, we sort of believe in a lot of magic and uh, having a, the perfect magic potion uh, that if we just put this in and don't put that in, that everything is going to be great. Or if we do put this in, they're going to explode. Um, and so there's a lot of fear and anxiety around, around feeding. And it, it's reflected in a lot of the questions I've gotten from, from viewers. So um, one of the, you know, and, and again, in our, our NICU, we're very fortunate. We've got a registered dietitian who works full-time in our NICU, and she rides us pretty hard about our feeds and our parenteral nutrition to make sure we have everything in it that we need. But there's still, even with her there, a lot of anxiety. One of the questions talks is asking about, you know, again, fortifying, um, fortifying to 26 versus 27 calorie per ounce, um, we do that, and again, you're going to hear a lot of fear. Um, are we increasing their risk of necrotizing enterocolitis by having such a calorie-dense uh, fortification? Sure, that's a great question, and you're right. We do fear feeds. Um, for one, we absolutely hate necrotizing enterocolitis, and it's, uh, excuse the pun, a visceral reaction that many of us have uh, to that disease. So, so we, we want to do everything possible to avoid it. Uh, in increasing the calories, say, past the general fortification to 24 kilocalories per ounce, uh, so far, there haven't been studies showing harm. Some of the earlier studies that showed the potential for harm with osmolality have not borne out in more recent um, feeding types. But with that said, there's minimal studies. We really don't have great evidence when you go above the 24. So, uh, do um, that whole balance of avoiding necrotizing enterocolitis, but growing the baby so that you're up, you know, have the best neurodevelopment. I do tend to uh, to to do these things to grow babies, um, and so far have not personally uh, felt that those things we're doing going up to the 27 is increasing that the rate of necrotizing enterocolitis that we're seeing, say in in my center or when I talk to others. But with that said until we have well done trials, we can never say for sure. So I, I encourage people to, to, can, 
continue to uh, think twice about, about going up. And, and then the other thing I'll just mention is we do know feeding protocols, if anything has been, or I should say anything, if, if beyond prolonging gestation and giving maternal milk and, and some with donor milk, the other thing that's been shown to decrease neck is to feed per protocol. So you mentioned it, um, having a registered dietitian. They are a phenomenal resource in NICUs and um, having them keep us um, on, on a standard approach has also been shown to be beneficial, including going up above the 24 calorie per ounce. Um, I've got some questions about sodium chloride um, supplementation. It seems like it's something we do a lot. And I, it's, I've noticed since we have started using um, human milk-based human milk fortifiers versus bovine, um, we seem to s require more, especially sodium chloride supplements. Uh, uh, is this something that you follow closely? Should we, again, we're back to the fear again. We, we're worried. We, we're, we're all OCD neonatal people and we, we look at numbers and if a number doesn't fit right in, we freak out a little bit. Um, but we have seen a fall off on growth with sometimes the, the human milk-based human milk fortifier we give the sodium chloride, we seem to fix that. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I would think, especially when you have donor milk as the base for that, rather than mother's milk, that you really could have that low sodium. I think to start with is to know, and this is where a registered dietitian can help you, know how much sodium you're giving. Um, for one, uh, one of the, the main bovine fortifiers that we use when added to maternal or donor milk still is, is below the recommended amount of sodium. So you likely need to give one to two milli equivalents of sodium or, or could need to just to get into the recommended dose. So I think it's very important for everyone to look at what they're giving, just their basic approach to feeding. I would love to figure out um, what a normal sodium is for a growing uh, preemie, <laughs> especially growing preemie with BPD, you may also be on diuretics and, and worried about fluid overload and such. Um, urine sodium, I would that would love for that to be a fantastic marker. There are some studies, but most of them are retrospective and, and really aren't a definitive answer. So if anyone out there would uh, like to do more exploration of what is a normal sodium and what is a normal, how we can use urinary sodiums to help us uh, figure out if a baby um, has adequate body sodium, that's the work that, that, that needs to, to be done. Uh, to standardize that. So I wish I had a better answer. I will just say, you know, I definitely have had babies that I think it could be a sodium depletion. I give a little sodium if they grow. I say that was the answer. If they don't grow, then I start to look elsewhere. Very fair. Um, got a couple questions about vitamin D levels. Um, first is pertaining to moms. We seem to see a lot of moms coming in with very low vitamin D levels. Um, first is how often or should we be checking maternal vitamin D levels when they come in prenatally? If they're, they're coming in, we've got a very active MFM service, high risk OB, should we be asking them to check mom's vitamin D levels? Yes. So I trained at the Medical University of South Carolina where a lot of research was done in vitamin D in, during pregnancy and lactation. And, and based on work performed there in South Carolina, all women should be having their 25 hydroxy D level evaluated early on in pregnancy and supplemented with 2,000 to 4,000 international units per day. Again, based on the, there were randomized controlled trials done there in South Carolina. They may not have shown overall efficacy, but did show safety. Uh, and, and efficacy in, in, in making mom's vitamin D replete it just was difficult to, to show direct associations with improved pregnancy outcomes, even though with, with some um, kind of uh, statistical modeling could see some benefit. So I do think we need to be giving more vitamin D, but I would say probably the admission to um, that the uh, birth hospitalization is too late, that this should be done early during pregnancy. Uh, and absolutely, in a study I did in South Carolina, 80% of our very preterm babies were born vitamin D deficient because their mothers were vitamin D deficient. The good thing is, is with attention to vitamin D supplementation, 80% uh, of them were then replete at one month. So 20, only 20% remained deficient, but still that's more than you would want. 
and uh, then they all became replete over the hospitalization. But uh, you saw there that the, what the observational study that we performed showing that this did relate to, to bone mineralization. So I do think attention to maternal um, vitamin D would really help us to not have to give as much in the, in the NICU. Well, you just gave me a good topic. I'm next week. I'm in charge of doing the uh, education for our meeting with MFM, and uh, I'm going to pull an article on that. That's a you just yeah. did some work for me. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, again, on vitamin D levels, you know, we routinely check, you know, our bone labs, our, our calcium, phosphorus, and alkphos levels. Should we be adding a vitamin D level to that? So when I started my research in this area, I really wanted to find that vitamin D dose that just made every very preterm baby replete so we wouldn't have to check levels. Um, some places, the checking the levels, a small amount of blood. Other places, it's still 1 ml, which is a lot of blood from, from our babies, of course. Uh, and so far, you know, we don't yet have that definitive, this is the dose that will make everyone replete. So I would consider checking a level. I think checking around one month when an infant has um, hopefully reached that feeder grower, they're on steady nutrition stage, is a nice time to check to figure out if they are at still deficient at that point, and if so, to pay attention to, to their vitamin D. I Working in South Carolina, where we were big proponents of vitamin D, we really uh, had stopped checking alkaline phosphatases because uh, we did not see high alkaline phosphatases. And, and this is some in, in one paper uh, that I've uh, published on this, Coming to, to Yale, where there was less of an emphasis on vitamin D all of a sudden, I was seeing elevated alkaline phosphatases. I've not published that, um, but so we are paying more attention to vitamin D here, and we'll see if that, that helps with, with some of that elevation. Again, it, that's anecdotal. I'm not saying that's research, but um, I, do, I do think that there um, is a reason to ensure about a month um, in that feeder grower stage that the vitamin D is, is at an appropriate level. Um, there's a question about um, asking for a comment on specific dietary needs of cardiac patients, mm -hmm. just outside of increased calorie needs. Yeah, no, that, that is, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think we all know that, of course, making sure their mineral status is um, appropriate uh, for, for those minerals that are very important to cardiac function. Uh, they, they do, I mean, they, they need a lot of calories. Uh, and sometimes they're on quite a bit of diuretics, which can make the sodium question um, arise. Uh, and I would, um, I, I, I have not honestly seen uh, much research on their protein needs. So uh, I think one interesting question still exists as to whether they would benefit from added protein um, just as much as the added calories. But for the most part, they are just huge energy um, users and, and it really can take, you know, you can be easily looking at the, the 150 kilocalories per kilo per day um, in order uh, to, for the, you know, to match what they're burning. Okay, here's one that I have struggled with personally for a long time. I'm glad someone brought it up. Um, it's, we're all good with fortifying these kids when they're in the NICU and getting their diet. Again, we're very controlling here, so everything's tightly controlled. We send them home. Um, we send them home on sometimes, you know, fortified breast milk, and there's kind of eh, some funny ideas about that. Or do we send them home on two to three bottles a day of a preterm formula? Your thoughts on that? Is it efficacious? If so, for how long? Um, especially in the one I struggle with mostly actually is a late preterm who's maybe 34 or 35 weeks. Can they just do fine on, on mom's milk and not have any fortification at all? Yeah, and it is even more complicated when you worry, especially in that late preterm infant a population about potential overgrowth. So say we send them all home on these fortified feeds and, and you hear it, but the pediatrician say, yes, they're growing 45 grams per day and they've Go over caught up and you know what does that lead uh, what is what could that mean and then there are also infants and diabetic mothers so they have other risks for their metabolic health could we be setting them up for, for metabolic sequelae as adults and that's some work one of my colleagues uh, Dr. Catherine Buck 
is looking at that specifically in the late preterm infant population, is there a potential that we're overfeeding them with some of our supplementation? So the, my current answer to that question is based on the research that's available, you can really do anything you choose to do as long as you're monitoring growth. And so as I've tried to simplify this and tried and tried to simplify it based on certain feeding types, it's, it's not possible. And so the, I think the easiest way to simplify it is to concentrate on a growth pattern and then working with the family, working uh, with what resources you have available to figure out where, where that infant fits that growth pattern. I have some moms who uh, do not want to give full bottles of formula. They, they want to make sure their, their milk is given at every feeding. And so for them, we'll add the, the, the formula powder to, to mom's milk if that's needed. Other moms say, I don't want to add anything to my milk. I want to give uh, bottles of formula and when my milk is given, have it be not mixed. So um, a lot of times I'm talking to the families as well to see what works best for, for their lifestyle. Uh, the, the only research that showed benefit in, in growth and bone mineralization was a study from that was from Canada that was published, I think, in 2009, which was with the powdered human milk fortifier that we used to use in the NICUs using that post-discharge, but it's expensive. It's really expensive. Uh, WIC does have it, and you may be in a state where WIC is willing to give that um, post-discharge because it is on their formulary, um, but sometimes uh, state WIC says we just can't afford that. So we, we absolutely uh, need better products for the post-discharge and, and need more information as well. But the good thing is to say, as long as the baby's growing, you're, you, no one can say you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Okay, last question. I'm getting poked from my people over here. That they're saying we're going over time. But uh, last question. This is more about encouraging parents. Um, I guess confession time here. I um, have a daughter who likes to post things on TikTok, so I am on TikTok <laughs> to, I guess, creep on my daughter. Um, but I'm, I am uh, astounded by the, the, the flow of misinformation and hysteria about feeding, feeding babies, feeding, adult, feeding everybody. Um, and as a result, and I'm sure you've seen this, parents that, whose babies need to go home on some sort of extra, that you have a growth-restricted baby, um, and they're adamant that their baby only get mom's milk. Mm -hmm. um, best way to approach that. Yeah, I think it is to just be very upfront with mom's milk is important for, for brain development, but so is growth. And, and uh, I haven't met a mother who uh, doesn't think the brain development of her baby is important. So um, helping them to, to see that and, and, and sometimes in order to, to, to be a team player with the families, um, putting them on straight mother's milk in the hospital. And if they grow and are, are growing around, along an appropriate percentile line or are showing catch-up growth, then that's fantastic. But if they're not, um, you know, talking with the family and saying we need this supplement um, in order to achieve the growth velocity that relates to best brain development. Uh, the other thing I think is encouraging for families if you can, if you can really say this is going to be short term. And I do think for most babies, babies who aren't limited by longer heart disease especially, about 44 to 52 weeks of corrected age, uh, of gestational age, they will, um, they will feed to grow. They will take what they need to grow, and that's been shown in some studies. So um, I, to me, that helps family if they know that it's temporary. Um, but then we have to talk to the pediatricians to inform them um, about what they need to do because this puts it, that those feeding decisions in their hands and and they're not um, you know they're reading even less about it than we are. Excellent, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, again, a great talk full of a lot of very useful and very pertinent information. And I appreciate you taking the time to come and and address us here. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, take care. Thanks, everyone. Okay, real quick, a couple of things. I know we're, we're over time. We're going to go on a break here. Um, we were supposed to start back up at, at um, 11.30. Um, let's make that 11.35. Um, so we'll give a few extra minutes since we went over, uh, but I think it was worth going over to, to get those questions. So we'll see everyone back here for our next speaker at 11.35. Hello.
look high, I look low, I'm looking everywhere I go, looking for a home in the heart of the country. I'm gonna move, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna tell everyone I know, looking for a home in the heart of the country. Heart of the country where the holy people grow. Heart of the country, smell the grass in the meadow. I want a horse, I want a sheep, I want to give me a good night's sleep. Living in a home in the heart of the country. Lesson. 
You'd be hers if only she would call In the wee small hours of the morning That's the time you miss her There we go. We're back. <laughs> Thanks for letting us take a little extra time. Everyone had to grab a drink. Um, so those first two talks were fantastic. Um, everyone here has really appreciated it, and I don't expect we're going to be let down now. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Leif Nellen. Uh, he's the Division Chief of Neonatology at Nationwide Children's Hospital the Dean Jefferson Dowd Chair in Neonatology and a professor, professor of Pediatrics at The Ohio State University College of Medicine. He has a specific interest in respiratory diseases and pulmonary hypertension. Um, I have also uh, seen him speak at previous uh, conferences and really enjoyed what he's had to say. Um, he is here to talk to us. Um, about challenges for caring for challenges in caring for bronchopulmonary dysplasia in 2023, Dr. Nellen. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here today, even if it is virtually. Um, and I appreciate. I thank Rebecca for the opportunity to um, talk to y'all today about uh, BPD. I have nothing to disclose in terms of conflicts of interest, but I will give you another type of disclosure, and that's that the approach described in this talk is not evidence-based, mainly because there's no evidence available on which to base our approaches to ventilation in BPD. And this lack of evidence leads to provider variability in the ventilator approach to the child with BPD. Thus, our ventilator approach is an attempt to decrease this variability using a physiology-based approach to improve outcomes and patient safety while awaiting high quality data. Today's objectives are to identify how BPD is currently defined and diagnosed, recognize how management, particularly ventilation strategies, may impact outcomes, and discuss the use of late steroids and other medications in established BPD. BPD was first described in 1967 by Bill Northway. Bill Northway was a radiologist at Stanford. And BPD definitions have evolved over time from the first description by Bill Northway in 1967. And I will say that all the definitions from 1988 onward are based uh, only on oxygenation respi respiratory support. So there's no x-ray criteria or lab tests that you do. Um, it's all based on what you're providing the, the patient at um, various time points based on supplemental oxygen and respiratory support. So how do we diagnose BPD in 2023? A preterm baby born at less than 32 weeks who remains on supplemental oxygen and or respiratory support at 36 weeks postmenstrual age has BPD by definition. Once you've diagnosed BPD, you can also severity grade it. Um, using some different approaches. Um, we prefer the recent Neonatal Research Network criteria. It was published um, in 2019 with uh, Eric Jensen as the first author, where grade one is if the patient is only on supplemental oxygen, a low flow nasal cannula. Grade two is non-invasive respiratory support, CPAP, non-invasive um, positive pressure ventilation, or high flow nasal cannula. 
And then grade three, the most severe form, is if the patient's intubated and receiving invasive respiratory support. The problem, uh, as I've already alluded to, is that the definitions of BPD are based on treatment decisions. So if you treat a patient, the presence of the treatment equals a diagnosis of BPD for that particular patient. However, the problem for neonatology is that there are no accepted standards for when to initiate or discontinue supplemental oxygen or respiratory support in preterm infants. So we all do it our own way. And you know, we have interest, therefore we have intracenter variability. We also have intracenter variability where even in our own units, um, people may apply or remove a supplemental oxygen or respiratory support in different ways. And as you all know, essentially every neonatal lung disease is treated with oxygen and or positive pressure respiratory support. So even if the lung disease is not BPD, by definition it is BPD um, because the patient is on respiratory support or supplemental oxygen, provided they were born at less than 32 weeks um, gestational age. So for example, if you had a, if you had a 35 weeker um, who was on Rumer, um, but wasn't eating great. And so you thought that maybe adding some supplemental oxygen would help the patient eat better. And you decided to start 0.1 liter nasal cannula. And the next day the patient became 36 weeks. Um, even though you started the nasal cannula oxygen for not respiratory reasons, by definition, um, that patient has now BPD. So that's what I mean when I say that um, every neonatal lung disease is treated with oxygen and or positive pressure respiratory support. And therefore, if you treat a patient with oxygen respiratory support for whatever reason, um, if they're born less than 32 weeks, um, they have BPD. How big of a problem is BPD? Um, the incidence of BPD is probably around 45% in patients born at less than 32 weeks. So with about 4 million live births annually in the United States, um, about 2% of those are less than 32 weeks. It's about 80,000 live births. And if you have a 45% BPD rate, then there's about 36,000 new patients annually in the United States with BPD. Caveat to that, or, or something you shall know, is, is that the incidence increases with decreasing um, gestational age such that if you're born at 22 or 23 weeks, you have almost 100% incidence of BPD, and then it falls off as you increase your gestational age. We're neonatologists, we think about BPD and we diagnose it at, 35, at 36 weeks postmenstrual age in kids that are born less than 32 weeks. But BPD is a lifelong problem. This is data from um, Lex Doyle and his group in Australia, where they did a um, meta-analysis of studies looking at the forced expiratory volume at one second in adolescents and young adults. And they found whether it was a hospital study or a regional study that um, in adolescents or young adulthood, um, if a patient had the diagnosis of BPD, um, they, were, they had a lower FEV1. In other words, they had more likely to have obstructive lung disease than if you didn't have BPD diagnosed, if you were a preterm baby and didn't have BPD diagnosed. So the diagnosis of BPD um, result, uh, is associated with a lower FEV1, which in, a, in adolescence and young adulthood, which means that you have obstructive lung disease. Even adults with BPD can report symptoms. This is a study from the UK and Ireland where they looked at, um, where they asked adult subjects with BPD if in the last 12 months um, they had any symptoms. And what they found was that those, the patients with BPD, adult subjects with BPD were more likely than term control subjects as adults um, after adjusting for sex and current smoking to report the following. Being awoken by coughing at night, having wheeze or whistling, or being breathless when wheezing. So even patients with, B, even adults with BPD um, end up with symptoms. There's increasing amount of data that suggests that BPD in adults may be a novel COPD endotype. BP, bronchopulmonary dysplasia could be considered the earliest and longest lasting obstructive lung disease in humans. Survivors of BPD are often labeled with a diagnosis of asthma during their childhood. However, the pathophysiology of BPD and asthma are quite different. However, the similarities in pathology with COPD 
and the correlations with lung function impairment make BPD in adult age a possible new COPD-like endotype. And so not only are kids or infants who are born with BPD at higher risk for having COPD as adults, but it actually may be a form of COPD that they, uh, that they have. So how do we take care of patients with BPD? Well, it's important to understand that BPD is associated with adverse outcomes. And this is a complicated table from um, Eric Jensen's paper on the grading of BPD and his definition of BPD. And I just wanna point out that there are, that, uh, that there are differences in uh, outcomes between patients that don't have BPD and the various severity grades with grade three being the most severe forms. I'd like to call your attention to one of them, which is late death or moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment. If you're a preterm baby born at less than 32 weeks that doesn't have BPD, you have about a 33% chance of having late death or moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment. If you have grade one BPD, it goes up to 46%. If you have grade two BPD, it goes up to 60%. And if you have grade three BPD, nearly 80% of those um, patients will have late death or moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment. So why is BPD associated with neurodevelopmental impairment? There's a lot of hypotheses in the literature. Um, three popular ones are that BPD is a marker for overall illness. Things like neck, sepsis, IVH are all associated with BPD. BPD is associated with other poor prognostic indicators, things like growth failure, prolonged mechanical ventilation, or prolonged hospitalization. Another hypothesis is that BPD causes intrinsic changes in physiology that cause abnormal development, things like hypoxia, inflammation, hypercarbia, and acidosis. We would suggest an additional hypothesis, and that's the standard model for treating BPD in the NICU is developmentally inappropriate and contributes to neurodevelopmental sequelae. Often uh, current NICU treatment of patients with BPD follows an acute care model, but BPD is a chronic illness. An acute care model emphasizes rapid weaning and frequent changes in care. And the fundamentals of acute care, things like frequent lab draws, um, frequent interventions, minimal stimulation, rapid responses to changing physiology, administration of neuroactive drugs, et cetera, may be potentially harmful to long-term neurodevelopment when applied over long periods of time. So when you think about BPD care, you really need to think about um, the principles of care, which are that it's a chronic disease. Um, just shown here are some of the phases of BPD. Um, we've divided it into four phases, which phase one is the unstable phase and it lasts one to six months. Phase two is a sort of transitional phase. It lasts three to 12 months. Phase three is a pro-growth phase where the patient begins to get better, about three to 15 months. And then phase four is convalescence where the patient's getting ready to go home. And that lasts from one to six months. The real point of this is that these phases are in, not in days, not in weeks, but in months. So this is really a chronic disease. And then you wanna implement best practices based on available evidence. And again, there is no direct evidence for BPD. There's not RCTs looking at this drug versus that drug in, in kids with BPD. Um, there's not RCTs of this ventilator approach versus that ventilator approach. So you really have to look down at some, um, you have to try to find the, the, the evidence that's available, uh, even though it's not gold standard evidence, and then, you, and then implement best practices based on some of those things. But the cornerstone of, BPD, of a BPD service or BPD care is collaboration. And it's a long-term disease that requires long-term care and it's a huge, stress, a huge stressor on the families. In the Comprehensive Center for Bronchopulmonary Dysplasia at Nationwide Children's Hospital, our team includes neonatology, pulmonology, and cardiology. We have pediatricians involved, particularly in the outpatient setting. We have advanced practice nurses involved. We have BPD-specific nurses. We have care coordinators specific to BPD, BPD dietitians, BPD social workers. We have psychologists. Interestingly, we have, a psycholo we have two psychologists psychologist for the family and a psychologist for the patient. We have parent advisors and we have almost every kind of therapy you could think of. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, music therapy, 
educational therapy, we even have massage therapy. Um, so any, any kind of therapy you can think of um, is really important for these patients. And if you, if you were to visit our unit, you would find that uh, many of these patients um, during the daytime are not in bed or not in their crib, but are often out on the floor on a mat getting some of these therapies, getting some of these interactions going. The culture of chronic care is very different from the culture of acute care. Changes don't happen quickly. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, and so the emphasis is really on continuity and redundancy. When you make a plan of care, you shouldn't change that unless the patient changes. So in other words, just because you're on call that night, you shouldn't change things unless something changes with the patient and the same on the weekends. And when teams switch, um, you shouldn't change the plan of care um, unless the patient changes. So really the plan of care should only change if the patient deviates from the expected course of their underlying illness. Redundancy really has to do with sharing of the plan and you have to share with everybody. Even though it seems redundant, um, it's really important for making sure that this plan is carried forward. So regular interprofessional meetings are really, really important. Um, in meetings that include all of those people I had on the former slide um, is really important so that everybody knows what the, what the plan of care is and where the patient's going. And then it's really important to have updates from the whole team, from the individual members of the whole team, and then for the whole team, synthesize those updates so that everybody knows where we're going, where, where you're going with that patient. There are some fundamental goals to the care of chronic care of patients with BPD. You want to decrease mortality. You want to prevent complications. You want to decrease the length of stay. Really important is you want to improve neurodevelopmental outcomes. You want to improve the parental experience and the parental competence. You want to create a culture of chronic care and you want to improve continuity. And all of those things will then um, result in better outcomes, better neurodevelopmental outcomes for these patients a shorter length of stay um, and um, through much better communication um, among the team and among the parents. We have sort of five basics of chronic BPD care that we use in the Comprehensive Center for BPD here at Nationwide Children's. Um, first and foremost, we avoid infections. So we try to get rid of central lines as fast as we can. We avoid core pulmonality. So we do things like keep the set targets higher. Um, we watch, we do uh, screening echocardiography uh, to know when pH is starting or pulmonary hypertension is starting. We provide su superb nutrition um, and that's really important. Um, again, it's when patients with BPD start gaining length that they really start getting better. And so um, we have a nutritionist on rounds almost every day um, and we follow closely a patient's um, growth curves, both their length and their weight, and particularly their length. We have a chronic phase ventilation approach for respiratory care. Uh, for, we have a chronic phase uh, ventilation approach um, that we'll talk about in depth here in a minute. And then we try to provide extraordinary developmental care. So we try to avoid noxious stimuli. We try to provide very positive stimuli. That's why we do all those therapies. Um, and, we, and we try to make the patient as happy as can be every day. So let's talk now about our chronic phase ventilation um, and the fundamentals of respiratory support for BPD patients. It's really important to provide, start by providing supplemental oxygen to target higher SpO2s. And so it's a little arbitrary, um, but most less than 32 weekers have a SAT goal of, in our NICU of 90 to 95. You know, they're in other NICUs it might be 88 to 94, whatever it is. Um, but once they hit 36 weeks and have the diagnosis of BPD, we change that to have the SAT goal to be um, greater than 94%. Um, it's really important to assess the respiratory status. We really, we really rely on the physical examination that assessment of respiratory status much more than we do tests. Um, so we wanna look at the work of breathing and we want to see if that remains high despite supplemental oxygen. And then you want to assess the air entry and exhalation. If there's very poor air entry um, and or prolonged exhalation um, that lead to air hunger, um, you may need to escalate support. 
And the whole point of uh, respiratory support for these patients is to improve ventilation, to optimize ventilation perfusion, matching in the lung, um, so the patient can have the highest possible arterial saturations. And we tend to go from nasal cannula to um, non-invasive uh, CPAP to uh, intermittent positive pressure ventilation using the, an ET tube. Things to remember about chronic phase ventilation is that it's too late for, lung, for a lung protective strategy. Um, you need to optimize ventilation perfusion matching. That's really a key. Um, and to do that, you need to optimize ventilation to all parts of the lung in a very heterogeneous lung disease that's characterized by a maldistribution of ventilation. And so it's a heterogeneous, BPD is a heterogeneous chronic lung disease. There are different compartments in the lung, unlike in a lot of our acute lung diseases where the, most of the lung is um, um, diseased in one, in one fashion or another. In BPD, there's lots of different parts of the lung. Um, you have sort of parts of the lung that are pretty normal, that have a normal compliance and resistance. You have other parts that have um, a very high resistance, and you have some parts that have a high compliance and a low resistance. If you ventilate using our acute um, lung prevention, lung injury prevention strategies, you'll use a low tidal volume and a short inspiratory time. And if you do that, the only part of the lung that you're going to ventilate effectively is going to be this high compliance, low resistance part of the lung. And that'll lead to some adverse effects in BPD, obviously. You'll have a, uh, you won't have an optimal distribution of gas. Um, that'll result in an increase in dead space ventilation. You'll have a higher PCO2. You'll need a higher FiO2. You could have progressive atelectasis in these unventilated regions. Um, and you could have regional overdistension uh, in these regions that are being overventilated, perhaps. And so clearly, um, with this sort of acute approach to ventilation, if you used in BPD, if you used at 36 weeks or beyond in kids with BPD, you're only ventilating, ventilating a small part of the lung. And so you'll induce VQ mismatching because you won't ventilate uh, big parts of the lung. So how do we do ventilation perfusion matching in heterogeneous lung diseases? Well, we have to think about um, the parts of the lung. And so we just talked about the low resistance parts of the lung um, and they are relatively easily ventilated. Um, using whatever settings you want. However, we have to get we have to get ventilation, we have to get gas into these poorly ventilated areas. And if we don't, if we try to ventilate with this acute phase kind of ventilation, this lung protective strategy with a low tidal volume and a short inspiratory time, we're going to ventilate this low airway part, this low resistance part of the uh, lung. And that part of the blood going by that, so the ventilation will be there, the perfusion will be there, and you'll have ventilation perfusion matching for this little part of the lung you'll get good oxygenation in that blood. However, in the lung that's poorly ventilated, you have no, in this case, no ventilation. You don't oxygenate the blood that's coming by, so you don't have good ventilation perfusion matching. You have blue blood coming back to the left side of the heart, and therefore you have um, venous admixture, and you have a lower um, arterial saturation. In the, well, the well-ventilated part of the lung, you'll have a lower resistance in the blood vessels, which is good. However, in the poorly ventilated part of the lung, you'll have alveolar hypoxia, um, which will lead to high resistance in these blood vessels, which will lead to a high pulmonary vascular resistance uh, and may contribute to pulmonary hypertension. So how do we optimize ventilation perfusion matching in BPD? The challenge is to ventilate all parts of the lung uh, with, that have a very heterogeneous physiology. To do that, you need a higher tidal volume or a higher peak inspiratory pressure. You need a longer inspiratory time to get air in. You can't forget about exhalation. You gotta get air out, otherwise you'll have hyperinflation. Um, we think a lot about the time constants and the time constants are simply the resistance times the compliance. And that's a measure of how long it takes to get air in and out of the lung. And so if we think about exhalation, if we think about a passive exhalation, this is an example of a flow volume curve. Um, the yellow line shows the, um, the total lung, um, and it shows that you have the air goes out relatively quickly to start with, and then there's this long tail that takes some time to go out. And to understand this, this flow volume curve better, uh, we can actually model it using two different um, areas of the lung, if you will, spaces in the lung. One that we call a fast space, or we've labeled A here, in which 
Um, there's good expiratory flow here, about 90 mLs per second, and you get the gas to leave that part of the lung very quickly. However, there's a part of the lung that's more diseased. We call it the slow space of the lung. It has a very low expiratory flow rate, uh, peak expiratory flow rate, only about 30 mLs a second. And it takes a long time, therefore, to get the gas out. But in this modeling scenario, you can see that um, the slow space of the lung, the diseased part of the lung, that's where most of the expiratory volume comes from, nearly 14 mLs in this case, um, versus only 6 mLs in the part of the lung that works better. And so, as you can imagine, the compliance and resistance in this blue, um, in, the, in, the, in the part of the lung labeled A, in that space, um, the compliance is uh, relatively low and the resistance is relatively low. So you have a very short time constant. It doesn't take much to get the gas out of that part of the lung. However, in this pink part of the lung, uh, this diseased part of the lung, this slow space in the lung, the compliance is higher and the resistance is very much higher. And therefore, the time constant is much longer, 0.52. Uh, so almost eight times longer than it is in the fast space of the lung. So when we think about ventilating these two spaces, along with these two different spaces, um, a fast space and a slow space, we really have to think about the slow space. That's the part of the lung that has most of the tidal volume, and it's gonna take the longest to get, in, to get ventilation to happen. And if we look, we, we did a series of pulmonary function tests in patients with severe BPD. Um, and we found that again, as I showed on the previous slide in the one example, um, that the fast space, the good part of the lung, um, had only about a third of the tidal volume, whereas the more diseased part of the lung, the slow space, had almost two thirds of the tidal volume. And again, the slow space time constant was about five times longer than the fast space time constant. So it's gonna take about five times longer to get air in or out of the, um, of the two thirds of the lung that's, that's more diseased, that has this higher resistance. And you can see that here. So here's the um, fast space of the lung counting in this, in this example for about seven mLs. And you can see that it takes about 0.6 seconds for this seven mLs to completely leave the lung. Whereas in the fast space of the lung, counting for about 13 mLs in this particular, in this particular example, it takes about two and a half seconds, a little bit more than two and a half seconds for all of the gas, all of those 13 mLs to leave the lung. So if you think about the highest rate that you could ventilate this patient with, that would allow for five time constants to completely empty the lung. Um, the highest rate that you could have if you um, considered an inspiratory time of 0.7 seconds for a breath, then it would be 2.55 seconds to get all five time constants for gas to get out. And so one breath we're gonna, is gonna take 3.25 seconds. So the highest, Ventilator, ventilator rate that would allow for five time constants is going to be a rate of 18 in this particular example. So again, you have to use longer inspiratory times and much longer expiratory times or slower rates to allow for emptying a lung in patients that have um, BPD. So we said that in lung diseases characterized by high airway resistance, you have to um, use a very slow rate or the lungs won't empty. However, you do have to maintain the minute ventilation or you'll develop respiratory failure. And so, as you can see here, if the rate's 20 and the tidal volume is 12, then the minute ventilation is gonna be 240 mLs per kilo. If, however, you have to slow the rate down, you have to increase the tidal volume to maintain that minute ventilation of 240 mLs per kilo. And so at a rate of 12, for example, to maintain a minute ventilation of 240 mLs per kilo, you'd have to increase the tidal volume from 12 to 20 mLs um, per kilo. So at the slow rate, a high tidal volume is necessary to maintain minute ventilation in these patients. And it's really important not to forget about exhalation. Um, here's an example from a recent paper, a recent review article we did looking at uh, chronic phase ventilation. And again, if it takes five time constants to empty the lung, if you start the next breath before then, so if you set a rate faster than the slow, the, the fastest rate possible based on five exhalation time constants, you'll start getting breath stacking. And in 
in RDS in in um, in newborn 30 uh, 28 weekers who have a, a surfactant deficiency, breath stacking might might uh, might manifest as a pneumothorax. In patients with severe BPD, it's more likely to manifest as severe hyperinflation. And so you can, here's an example of that. So here we have two x-rays taken within 24 hours. You can think about the event settings, but in this, on this side, the baby's lungs are more hyperinflated than they are on this side. But interestingly, on this side, the pressures are low, but the rate is fast. And so you don't have time to empty the lung. Whereas on this side, you've now, we've now turned up the pressures, turned up the tidal volume, um, but we've decreased the rate. And even though we have higher PIP uh, in, on, 20, on this particular X-ray, there's more time to exhale. And so you have less hyperinflation with a higher PIP, but a lower rate in this patient population. So constant phase ventilation um, will improve ventilation perfusion matching. And this is because you'll start ventilating these high resistance airways. So before you ventil we ventilated really well these low resistance airways, and we had nice ventilation perfusion matching in this part of the lung with very poor ventilation perfusion matching here. But if we switched from an acute phase ventilation, a lung protective strategy to a chronic phase ventilation with high tidal volumes, and long inspiratory times and long expiratory uh, exhalation times, slow rates in other words, then we'll start ventilating this poorly, this high resistance part of the lung. And when you do that, you start oxygenating the blood because you improve ventilation perfusion matching. And so not only do you improve oxygenation of this blood, but you also decrease the resistance in the air in the blood vessels that are perfusing the poorly that were perfusing the poorly ventilated parts of the lung by increasing ventilation perfusion matching in that uh, part of the lung. So here's just an example of what acute phase ventilation lung protective strategy, which you should use early on in the disease course in preterm infants um, versus this chronic phase ventilation, which you should use when the patient's diagnosed with um, severe BPD. And you can see the rates are slower, the tidal volumes are higher, the inspiratory times are higher or longer, um, the ID ratios are a little bit longer, um, and the PEEPs tend to be higher. Um, and you may actually need even a higher PEEP than nine in some cases, depending on the lung pathology. How do you wean patients who are getting this chronic phase ventilation? We do very cautious weaning. So you know, early on in disease, we all like to wean fast. We like to get the patient from the ventilator to CPAP as fast as we can in the first few days of life. And that's perfectly appropriate. However, once the patient has BPD, uh, you need to switch to that chronic phase ventilation mode. And part of that chronic phase ventilation mode is weaning very cautiously. And this cautious weaning allows for an adequate support that maintains lung volume and, and ventilation perfusion matching while allowing the patient to interact with their parents and caregivers. And so what we really like uh, in our BPD unit is that our patients who are, even if they're intubated, they're alert and awake and interactive with parents and caregivers. So we, by using a slow rate and a long uh, inspiratory time, we improve ventilation perfusion matching. And so if we're really improving ventilation matching, uh, ventilation perfusion matching in these patients, one of the first things you should see is a decrease in the need for their FiO2. So an ability to wean their FiO2. We do target a higher um, SAT target than we do in early on in um, preterm babies. Um, and again, like I said, we target greater than 94%. Um, but um, just remember that you need to target a little bit higher uh, SpO2 target simply to try to prevent um, uh, pulmonary hypertension. We don't wean many of the settings in um, chronic phase ventilation. We really concentrate on weaning the FiO2. And we consider extubation when the FiO2 need consistently is less than 40% and the patient's in a pro-growth phase. So we like to see the patient growing in length and in weight um, and in less than 40% oxygen, then we will consider extubation. And our practice, although there's, it's not necessarily better than any other practice, um, is to extubate from, um, uh, is to extubate to nasal CPAP in these patients. Part of our five points of care to, are to provide extraordinary developmental care 
and an important part of that is avoiding noxious stimuli. Um, perhaps one of the most frequent noxious stimuli that preterm babies in the NICU setting get is a blood gas, a routine blood gas. And so we recently looked at our routine blood gas data because we have tried over the years to not perform routine blood gases if we can help it. We've tried to instead concentrate on doing a really good physical exam and to look at the FIA2 the patient needs. So when we looked at patients admitted between January 2014 and May of 2020 who had grade two or three BPD, uh, we found that there were 485 patients who met all of the inclusion criteria and none of the exclusion criteria. And interestingly, 303 of these patients, 62% had did not have a blood gas drawn after, after being diagnosed with BPD at 36 weeks post-menstrual age. There was not major differences between those with at least one blood gas and those who never had a blood gas in terms of disease severity in this cohort. These patients were in the hospital for quite a, quite a while after 36 weeks PMA because of their severe BPD. Uh, the median length of stay after 36 weeks PMA was 125 days with an interquartile range of 90 to 188 days. And even the 38% who had at least one blood gas after 36 weeks, the median number of blood gases was only four with an interquartile range of one to 10. So even in those patients where we got routine blood gases, we didn't get very many of them. So the whole point of that is, is that um, by using the physical exam and by using um, by looking at the FIA2 and by looking at other things like how the patient is tolerating their therapies, how they're doing, how the parents feel they're doing in terms of being awake and alert. Um, you can really do a lot without having to do the noxious stimuli that uh, accompanies a um, routine blood gas. The pro-growth state is something that we try to get to for these patients and the pro-growth state um, means that they're started to grow in both weight and length. Um, and the outcomes of a pro-growth data that you have improved nutritional status, obviously, you have respiratory progression, so they start getting better from their disease. You have developmental progress. You have improved state regulation for these patients. They're, they sleep better. Um, they're awake and alert better. They transition from states better. Um, and you have much better linear growth. There are barriers to achieving this pro-growth state, some of, some of which we actually control, like respiratory support that we provide, uh, the uh, fluid nutrition, fluid and nutrient supply that we give, and the stress that we cause these patients. And these are all barriers to getting into this pro-growth state. And so that's one of the reasons that we really try to limit noxious stimuli in these parents, in these patients. And we try to have good parent involvement. We try to have a good environment and we try to uh, obviously provide interdisciplinary care. So how about um, some, so, so that's really talking about ventilator care in these patients. So how about some of the other things that we think about like pulmonary hypertension? So how do we diagnose pulmonary hypertension in BPD? Well, that can be difficult, right? The symptoms of pulmonary hypertension um, are cyanosis, pulmonary edema, poor weight gain and feeding. However, these can also be symptoms of BPD. So one of the things you need in terms of pulmonary hypertension diagnosis and BPD is a high index of suspicion. Cardiac catheterization is the gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary hypertension in these patients or in any patients. Um, however, uh, cardiac cath is challenging in patients with severe BPD. They're smaller than a lot of patients. Um, they're on ventilators often, and they're not all that stable often. So um, it's hard to get a good, it's hard to, to get cardiac catheterization. So echocardiography has become the primary method of diagnosis in the vast majority of NICUs around the country. And you do need to monitor echocardio echocardiograms routinely in patients with severe BPD to assess pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular function because the symptoms of pulmonary hypertension uh, and right ventricular dysfunction are the same as those, are, are overlap dramatically with those of uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia itself. The first line of therapy when a patient does have pulmonary hypertension is to optimize uh, ventilation perfusion matching. So again, going to higher tidal volumes, longer inspiratory times um, will improve ventilation perfusion matching and will improve ventilation and thereby improve ventilation perfusion matching.
So how do we deal with pulmonary hypertension and bron bronchopulmonary dysplasia? Uh, we do screening echocardiographies. Uh, we get our first echocardiogram when the diagnosis of BPD is made at 36 weeks. We look for things like septal flattening. We look for a tricuspid regurgitant and jet velocity if they have a, a, a jet. And we look for signs of core pulmonale. If we don't have pulmonary hypertension on that initial 36 weeks PMA um, echocardiogram, we repeat it every one to two months until there's, until there's a significant improvement in their BPD. If pulmonary hypertension or core pulmonality are present, we then optimize respiratory su support. We really do everything we can to avoid hypoxemia, and we start inhaled nitric oxide at 20 parts per million. Once they've stabilized on the inhaled nitric oxide, we'll then switch to sildenafil, and we start at half a milligram per kilo every eight hours and advance as needed. Um, and then we try to wean, once they're on a dose of sildenafil, it seems to have them in a good place, we'll then uh, wean off the inhaled nitric oxide. If we're, not, if we're unable to wean off the inhaled nitric oxide, then we'll continue to inhale nitric oxide and sildenafil, and we'll consider adding a, uh, another agent. Um, if we have to go to another agent, if we have to go to a third agent, we'll, we'll try to get a cardiac catheterization done to evaluate the pulmonary artery pressure. Uh, and the response to vasodilators to guide chronic therapy. And so in summary, in terms of pulmonary hypertension and bronchopulmonary dysplasia, it's a common comorbidity in BPD. Um, it does worsen outcomes. Uh, the mortality rate increases if you have pH, um, as do length of stay and many other mortalities, including tracheostomy um, and need for home ventilation. The diagnosis does currently rely on echocardiography. The first step in treatment is to improve ventilation perfusion matching. Um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia associated pulmonary hypertension is not necessarily self-limited, but in many BPD patients, they improve over time as the lung disease itself improves. However, it, it is pretty clear that we do need new diagnostic, diagnostic approaches and therapies for um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia associated pulmonary hypertension. What about, respi what about respiratory medications in these patients? Well, I will start by saying that the current reality is that we have no evidence, no at least no gold standard evidence um, for use of um, medications, respiratory medications in patients with BPD. So what this leads to is no standardization among providers. This is an example from a recent publication where they looked at inhaled corticosteroid exposure in hospitalized infants with BPD. And they looked at a number of hospitals and you can see that when they looked at inhaled corticosteroid exposure, it varied from about 70% in this hospital all the way down to 0% in this hospital and everything in between. And then not only did, did the uh, number of patients who got uh, treated with inhaled corticosteroids differ, but they kind of um, inhaled corticosteroid use differ, differed um, also. It looks like we're more likely to treat intubated patients. Um, this is from a study by Tamara Lewis in the BPD Collaborative, um, where they looked at um, different classes of drugs, and then they looked at whether a patient got them or didn't, or didn't get them or got them. So yes, is that the patient was treated with a diuretic, for example, and in this particular graphic, um, the red dots in these um, hexagons represent patients that are on non-invasive ventilation, while the light blue dots represent those patients who are on invasive mechanical ventilation or intubated, in other words. And you can see that in patients that got any of these various class of drugs, um, that they were much more likely to be intubated um, if they were to be treated. And if you didn't treat the patient, then there were many more patients um, we're on non-invasive um, ventilation. So we're more likely to treat patients who are intubated. Um, there is no gold standard evidence. This is the kind of evidence that we have. This is looking at prednisolone, um, and this is a fine study. It, it suggested that um, prednisolone use might be associated with a decrease in the pulmonary severity score um, without any changes in weight or length. Um, again, however, the numbers are small, and it's a single center. 
Um, and so this is the kind of evidence that we have to go on currently. Um, and that's why um, large randomized controlled trials that are multicenter are needed desperately in this population. So in summary, there's no high level evidence on which, on which to base our decisions related to respiratory medication use in BPD. As expected, this leads to a great deal of interprovider variability. And there's a desperate need for clinical studies to provide high level evidence for pharmacotherapy and BPD. So what do we do um, in the Comprehensive Center for BPD uh, in light of the lack of evidence? Well, considering a relatively low risk benefit ratio, um, we do use a lot of inhaled beta-2 agonists and inhaled corticosteroids. We try our best to avoid drugs associated with a bit higher risk benefit ratio, uh, things like diuretics, neurosedatives, and systemic steroids. And if we have to use any of those drugs, we try to use them for the shortest time possible. And so when it comes to um, steroid use uh, in the course, in the late course of kids with BPD, we, use, we, we utilize the steroid burst approach. Um, and what we do is we do prednisolone, um, either IV or PO. Um, most of our patients don't have IV, so the vast majority are treated PO. Um, and we give them three to five days entrally um, as a steroid burst. What are our outcomes using this approach? Well, I will say that um, alveolization progresses. So this is a CT scan. These are CT, three CT scans on one patient. They're done at six months of age, 14 months of age, and 23 months of age. You can see that at six months of age, the patient had horrible um, cystic lung disease. Um, there's very little evidence of uh, lung parenchyma there, of, alve of alve normal sort of normal alveoli or alveoli where gas exchange can occur. However, by 14 months, the CT scan is not normal by any stretch, but you can see that there's less cystic changes and there's more areas where gas exchange may occur. And that continues to progress. Although the CT scan is again, not normal by any stretch, um, there is a lot more lung tissue in areas where you can imagine gas exchange can occur. So alveolization progresses even um, with this chronic phase ventilatory respiratory support approach. This is data from the Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium, which is a consortium of about 50 children's hospitals uh, in the United States and Canada. Um, and um, we've looked at admissions for BPD. Um, and so this is our center. We have a lot, we, but we started a, a, a specific ward for BPD uh, back in 2005. So we've had a lot of patients admitted more than um, any other center in the CHNC. And yet our, meet, our length of stay, uh, even using the chronic phase ventilatory support and not extubating quickly, um, is a right, right above um, the median for all of the centers in the CHNC. And we look at mortality, um, our center uh, is lower uh, than the median. Um, and again, in, in fact, it's, in the, it's lower than the 25th percentile. So we have very good outcomes in terms of um, survival in these patients. When we look at our neurodevelopmental follow-up, um, we recently published our experience um, over five years in patients on our BPD ward. And you can see that 54% um, of our patients um, had no evidence of neurodevelopmental impairment um, at 24 months of age, um, despite the fact that these are patients with mostly grade three BPD. So in summary, um, in ventilating BPD, avoid under support. That's something that um, is really, really important. Uh, it takes a little bit um, of bravery to turn the tidal volumes or the PIPs up as high as they need to be, but it's really important to support these patients well. To improve VQ matching, ventilation perfusion matching in a long time constant chronic lung disease, it requires a longer inspiratory time, a longer expiratory time, that is to say a slow rate and it requires the tidal volumes necessary to maintain the minute ventilation. Using this chronic phase ventilatory support or ventilatory approach uh, facilitates slow weaning. It's really important to avoid overweaning. And we follow the physical exam and we get input from the interdisciplinary team and when we make decisions about weaning or, or going back from a wean. And using these, this approach, we found the structure and patient outcomes are good. Uh, in bronchopulmonary dysplasia in the chronic, in, in the comprehensive center for bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So I thank you very much and I'm happy to take any questions. 
Excellent. Dr. Nellen, thank you. That was an incredible talk. We very much appreciate having you with us. Thank you. Uh, it's a little hard to give a talk to a computer screen as you're being good, but I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, it, it, it is a hard thing to do. Um, I've got a lot of questions that have come in during your talk, and most of them focus around um, transitioning from the acute care mindset to a chronic care mindset. Um, I know and, and we have a very busy unit here. Um, we historically have managed a lot of kids with BPD, um, and when, we, when they get to 42, 44 weeks corrected age, there starts to get a little bit of a panic that, okay, we've got to fix something now or they're going to need a trach. Um, what, is your, what are your thoughts on managing that, those expectations, the time from when do we go into this chronic care mindset versus you know, acute care mindset? And when, do we, when should we worry about a baby needing a trach, if at all? Yeah, that's a really good question and one I get asked a lot by lots of different people. Um, you know, I think it, certainly by the time the patient has um, the diagnosis of grade three or, or BPD and is still on the ventilator at 36 weeks, we should start thinking about changing the, the mindset over from kind of acute care to, to chronic care. Um, obviously, there's nothing magic that happens at 36 weeks for patients still on the ventilator, so sometimes it has to be physiology driven and sometimes we'll do it earlier than that. But certainly by the time they get to 36 weeks, we, we really try to have them on this sort of chronic phase ventilation. And then um, trying to get them to a place where they can interact and, um, and, and develop um, and, and get good nutrition in and grow are things that we really look for to try to get them extubated. And, and we'll do extubation attempts and that sort of thing. But it's, it, is a different, it is a different pace, um, you know, early on, the 28 week or the 24 week or we're trying to get them off of mechanical ventilation and onto CPAP, which is completely appropriate as fast as we can. But when they get to this 36 weeks and, and they're on this sort of, they're in this sort of phase you talked about where they're stuck on the ventilator past 36 weeks, I think you really need to try to change your mindset to supporting the patient, letting them grow, letting them do the things they need to do to develop. And you'll be surprised that once you get them to a place where they're well supported, you can actually start they start doing things, they start growing, and they actually start weaning the FiO2, you can start weaning the patient off the ventilator. And a lot of these patients will come off and not need a tracheostomy. Um, and they'll come off somewhere between 36 and 42, 44, 40, 45 weeks, something like that. And when we trach patients, we usually, at our institution, um, our practice has been to trach them. Usually the median age is somewhere around 50 weeks, 49, 48, 49, 50 weeks, something like that. So we give them several tries to get them off the ventilator if we can. That's, yeah, again, for us, it's been a matter of some controversy. We have a, a developmentalist who works with us who sees all of our NICU babies. Um, her take on, on, you know, trached babies is very different from, say, a neonatologist and the developmental outcomes. Um, and in her mindset, much against running to do a trach at 44 weeks just because it's 44 weeks versus doing more developmental cares while they're in, in, in the NICU. Um, now, at Nationwide Children's, you have a separate BPD unit that's kind of apart from the NICU? Yeah, it's a separate 24-bed unit that's um, across, across the hall, across, across the little hall from the unit, and it's a separate nursing staff, a separate cost center, um, and staffed by um, a subset of the neonatologists who really like doing the BPD. Um, and nurses that are actually hired to work on that unit uh, solely. So it is, it is sort of a special, um, we have sort of, a, we have a very nice setup here for taking care of chronic BPD that most people don't have. Um, but I do think it's important from what, what we learned is that it's really hard um, mindset for the nurses and for the APPs and, and for, the, for the MDs and for the RTs. If you're taking care of a 24 weeker who's three days old and then you're turning around taking care of a BPD patient and your third patient is a kid with PPHN, it's just, it just really is hard to get that chronic care mode for the one patient who actually needs it. The other two need the acute care mode. And so to go back and forth, it can be a difficult thing for our patients. And so having, 
having a, a separate unit is really nice for that. Um, and if, if you don't have the ability to do that, which most people don't, I, I think even trying to cohort them or at least have the nurses assigned to them in such a way that they really can concentrate on the chronic care during the day that they have those patients, I think is a really an important thing to try to do. Well, that just answered a bunch of my questions. They, they were, <laughs> um, I mean, especially about nurses, because we all know that, I mean, where the work, the important work happens is at the bedside and it's the nurses doing it. So you have dedicated nurses to that chronic care. Yeah, we have a separate nursing staff for C, it's, it's uh, again, the C4, it's, the unit's called C4A and that, that's the unit that just has BPD patients. You have to be 36 weeks um, PMA to, to even be admitted to that unit. And you can't have been home before. So if you've been home and come back, then you end up either in the PICU or um, on the chronic med floor. But if you haven't been home, come from another NICU, then you end up in that NICU or the BPD NICU. Um, I've got a couple questions about steroids. Um, in particular, I know you mentioned this, um, you know, there's no standard. Um, and we, you know, there's a question about using chronic lung disease hydrocortisone, uh, dexamethasone for our bigger kids, prednisolone. Um, uh, I guess the hydrocortisone and dexamethasone you use before you get into this chronic phase, and if so, what sort of tapering do you use? So, so we do end up using a fair amount of hydrocortisone on our most severe patients because a lot of them have come on big doses of steroids, big doses of either dexamethasone or sometimes prednisolone. Um, for long periods of time, and they'll have some adrenal insufficiency. And so we end up using um, hydrocortisone in our BPD patients after 36 weeks, especially on those that have been on long-term um, enteral steroids or, or systemic steroid therapy. For our patients um, that come over, we, we, we do use dexamethasone occasionally for airway um, edema. So like if you have a patient who's been intubated for a few months, um, Often the first time we extubate them, we won't, we won't necessarily use dexamethasone for the extubation, but if they end up having strider and getting reintubated, on the next try, um, we'll often do some airway steroids, just a you know, two-day course of um, airway steroids for those patients. But for patients who um, need either longer-term steroids or who need that steroid burst, who get sick, um, get a virus or get sick and, and have a step back, we use, we use mostly uh, solely prednisolone, and so we'll do um, as we've learned from our pulmonologists, we'll, we'll give a, a five-day burst of um, prednisolone for any kind of exacerbation or setback. Um, and then on patients, if they come to us on um, Decadron, for example, long-term Decadron, um, we'll often try to we'll often switch those over to prednisolone, and then have a slow weaning um, course for that. Um, so those are kind of the ways that we use systemic steroids. We prefer to try to get patients off systemic steroids as soon as we can because systemic steroids are um, aren't good for growth, and so trying to get somebody in a pro-growth phase who's on chronic steroid therapy can be very difficult. And so we really try to wean off steroids if we can. We can't always do that, um, but in the patients that we can, we try to get them off steroids, systemic steroids, as fast as we can. So we, would you favor higher respiratory support, um, tolerating higher respiratory support uh, instead of going back to another co course of steroids? Once they're past, once they're 36 weeks or beyond, and they have that diagnosis of grade three BPD, we really tolerate. Again, like I said, we, we'll we'll find the place where they're happy, um, whatever PIP that might be. Uh, we use pressure control ventilation, but whatever kind of ventilation you use, uh, the tidal volume or the pressure, the PIP that they're happy at, and then we kind of leave that alone, and we really concentrate on nutrition and neurodevelopmental outcomes or neurodevelopmental treatments. Um, and and what we find is when we do that. Um, we're able to wean the FiO2, and we really don't wean much on the ventilator before we try extubation attempt if they're stable in less than 40% oxygen and in this pro-growth state. The one, the one exception is that we tend to use a CPAP of 8, so if they're on a PEEP of 10, we will wean the PEEP down and have them stable on the ventilator on a PEEP of 8 um, before we extubate them. But otherwise, we'll extubate from PIPs in the 40s or even sometimes in the 50s if, we, if they're doing really well every, with the FiO2. And, with their um, developmental stuff, which took us a long time to figure out, but um, it, it seems to have worked pretty well. Okay, so 
I swear this is not a question for me, for those in the audience who know me. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit OCD about my vent management and my CPAP management. And the, the question is, is, for chronic kids, what interface do you use for CPAP? <laughs> Whatever one works. <laughs> so, you know, as you probably know, and as, as people in the room probably know, it's really hard to do CPAP on 38 weekers and 39 weekers. Um, they're they're big and they move around and that kind of thing. So, whatever works, we we tend to start with with prongs and the hat and all that kind of stuff. And um, we'll use masks as we need to. Sometimes we'll alternate the prongs and the mask. Um, and occasionally we'll have to go to something, um, you know, kind of a face mask kind of thing we've used before. Occasionally on some patients, whatever whatever will work in these patients, we'll use. But for the most part. We have um, really good success in the most of our patients with either prongs or a mask using sort of the, the hat and the whole thing. So you don't use a ram cannula? <laughs> we don't. Uh, you know, it's just our, the way our practices evolve. But um, again, I, I think it may not be the, the, um, the interface that's important. It's, it's an interface that works for you right. and, and, and for your unit um, that stays in the nose and all that kind of thing. because. Um, a lot of these kids, at least in the beginning, when they're first extubated or, or what, right when they come to the unit with CPAP, they're real dependent on having CPAP in their nose. Um, and if, if, it, if it's not there, then they'll uh, desaturate and get worse and lose lung volume sometimes. And, and so whatever, whatever interface works for your unit, I think, is fine. Um, the key is to find one that works for y'all um, and that, that um, can, can be used in these babies that are starting to move around and sit up and... and, and um, not just lay there like the 24 weekers do when they're yep. on CPAP. Um, another question about the nursing care in your uh, your unit. What's the your I guess your patient ratio, nurse patient ratio in your unit? Yeah, it's it's highly variable. Um, there's an occasional patient that we actually have a, a one to one. Um, uh, but most of the patients are more like one to three or one to four, um, and then uh, you know depending if there's if there's a, might be one a couple of one to ones, there might be a couple of patients that might actually be one to four to one to five, which may not be optimal. But um, you know, we just sort of work it out so that we try to try to um, work as best we can. In these post-COVID times, it sometimes is not optimal, like I just said, and sometimes it's it's worse because we don't have staff. Um, which is a problem, I think, around the country for a lot of units. Um, but we try to have um, no more than one to three if we can help it. Um, but again, there's times when um, if there's a lot of really sick patients and a lot of one to ones or one to twos, then we'll have some one to fours or one to fives, which are not optimal by any stretch. Um, do you use NAVA in your units at all? Uh, we don't. Um, we, we just bought, we just changed our ventilator fleet so we can now do NAVA. Um, we're just starting to learn how to do it. So we're sort of doing a stepwise implementation and, and we haven't gotten to C4A yet, but we, we plan to at least have it available. When I talk to my colleagues around the country who have used NAVA, um, a lot of them feel it's not a, it's not a good long-term solution, um, but they also, a lot of them like it for non-invasive um, provision of positive pressure. So a lot of units use NAVA um, as a uh, step from being intubated to being on CPAP and, and use the NAVA um, as a form of giving non-invasive positive pressure. And then there are other units that use NAVA in the intubated patients as well. And a couple of centers I've talked to have used that for, for patients who have um, exacerbations or setbacks and they'll use it a little bit shorter term. But most of, most of people I've talked to around the country, which is by, by no stretch everybody, but the people I've talked to um, have used NAVA more, not so much as a long-term solution, but more in, in specific instances. And a lot of people like it for, like I said, for non-invasive positive pressure support. Um, a question about um, Bozentin. I think you might've mentioned this in your earlier. Do you guys require a cardiac cath before you're going to use Bozentin? Since we don't do cardiac cast, we can't really require it. <laughs> we, have, we have to get buy-in from our cardiologists. Um, so we, we, we like one, um, and usually we can talk to the cardiologists, the, the, the interventional cardiologists, into doing a cath um, if they need a third, uh, a third medication. So if they're on 
inhale nitric oxide and sedative fill and they still need something and we have to add bosentin, um, then the, they'll often do one. But they don't always do one. Um, and so sometimes we'll add the bosentin and continue to follow with the echocardiogram um, going forward. It's, it's our center. There's a couple of centers, Columbia and Colorado, and in particular that are that are very that do a lot of catheterizations for pulmonary hypertension. And our center is not one of them. And so we it's more of a kind of a discussion about uh, when to do it and how to do it. And um, if if we want them to put something into the heart or leave something after the cardiac catheterization, they're they're all for it. Um, but if it's if it's just to do hemodynamics, they really they really think about it a lot before they do it. And, and that's not to say we don't do any, um, but we don't do as many as I think I would like to see, just because I think it's a it's a big help in trying to figure out um, what's actually going on um, in the pulmonary circulation. Um, the use of CT. Um, I love those images. Do you use those clinically or just for research purposes? Um, we, um, so historically, um, we had a radiologist who was really, really interested in um, BPD. And um, so we used to do a lot of clinical um, CT scans. Um, he left, um, and um, the people that are, that are there are still great radiologists, but they're not quite as interested in BPD. And so now we do CT scans for kids that we um, we're, we're either aren't progressing the way they should, or we have real concerns that they might have some um, significant airway issues. Um, and so we use um, CTs in, the, in that patient population. So well, we don't restrict it to research use. We do use them clinically, but it's right now it's on the more restricted um, patient population. I think there's probably a place for either CT scanning and or MRI in the future. And there's a lot of good studies coming out of Cincinnati in that group um, looking at um, MRI in particular and helping us with understanding um, BPD and, and, and coming up with some um, treatment ideas or, or at least phenotypes that might benefit from various treatment approaches um, using MRI. So I think in the future, we're gonna use a lot more MRI in these patients or CT scanning. Um, again, and I've got a couple questions here, kind of covering the same thing, but mentioning managing expectations for both caregivers, um, that's whether it be, you know, physicians, practitioners, nursing staff, and parents, as you transition from more acute to chronic care. Um, you mentioned that you have two full-time psychologists. Um, are those for the parents or for the staff or both? They're actually for the so so they're actually for um, we have one that's actually for for the patients. So we have she's a childhood psychologist and an infant childhood psychologist, and she works with the with the patients. Um, and then we have one who works mostly with the families. I, I would say that both of them though work with the staff as well. Um, and um, you know it, 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 these are challenging patients, and um, the chronic care mode is good, but it but there'll be times when patients don't move or, or don't really progress, and then there'll be a lot of um, angst around um, expectations. So the staff will wonder if the parents really understand how bad the disease is, and the parents will wanna know why the staff is always telling them how bad the patient is. Um, and so there'll be these, these times where we actually um, really need that support um, outside um, for both staff and the parents. And, um, occasionally, we have to get sort of everybody in the same room and, and, and um, sort of work on expectations and that kind of thing. But I think in a chronic care culture, most of the patients and most of the staff um, and most of the parents can get on the same page. And, and, and the key is is that the staff is pretty good at saying, you know, this is going to be a long-term thing. And, and what we'll hope to see is a little bit of progress every week or, or not every day or not every shift. But, you know. And, and the parents get on board with that after a time. And in most patients, they move, there, there is some motion that you can see and some improvement um, over time. And so those patients tend to be less traumatic for everybody. It's, it's really the patients that don't, don't seem to move or who have been doing well and then all of a sudden get worse because they got RSV or something and, and had a really, really bad setback and that changes everybody's perception. So there can be times when, when things um, get really to the point where we really do need a lot of support for everybody. All right, well, we've kept you over. Um, I, I have, okay, one last question, just about CPAP. Um, 
and it's about keeping a baby on PEEP. Um, you know, we have protocols with our units. I know um, it, it, uh, at Columbia, they keep their kids on CPAP until they're after 32 or 34 weeks. Do you guys have a protocol for prevention of BPD in your unit um, for keeping baby, you know, premature babies on PEEP to a certain gestational age? We do. We try to we try to keep patients on um, some kind of positive pressure. We, we prefer CPAP um, until 34 weeks, and then um, we've we've found that when we do that, we have a we've lowered our incidence of BPD in patients that um, are born in our institution. Well, again, we're we're out of time, but um, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to to come in to provide us the talk. It was great. We all very much appreciated it. I appreciate your comments. Um, I personally would like to come out and tour your unit. Anytime. Um, uh, I'd love to see how you, you manage these. It's, it's an issue that we're all facing and, and a lot of questions as it evolves. So you may be hearing from me to come out and, and visit you. Well, that'd be great. And it, it is a great, uh, it, it is a big problem that everybody's thinking about nowadays. And I was, I'm really happy for the invitation to be here today. And thank you for your interest in all the questions. Thanks again. Okay. Okay, um, sorry we went over. Uh, we've got a half an hour break for lunch, um, and so we'll resume at uh, 1.15. Um, just, you know, again, a reminder, if you haven't signed in, you need to sign in so you can get credit for being present. Um, continue to keep submitting your questions. Um, appreciate that, and we'll see you all in half an hour. Sixty-five years old, the mother God rest her soul. She couldn't understand why the only man she had ever loved had been taken, leaving her to start with a heart so badly broken. Despite encouragement from me, no words were ever spoken. And when she passed away, I cried and cried.
A small cafe, mademoiselle. Our rendezvous, mademoiselle. The violins were warm and sweet, and so were you, mademoiselle. And as the night danced by. Thank you.
Favorite ice cream flavor, mint chocolate chip. It's bright green, it looks the way junk food should look. Plus, my kids don't really like it that much, so that means there's always more for me. My favorite superhero, Batman, because anybody can be Batman. I especially like the Michael Keaton Batman. I'm Batman. My favorite cartoon character, easily Homer Simpson. It's so funny, all the antics he gets into. Don't! My favorite holiday is Halloween. The spooky decorations, you get to dress up in awesome costumes, and people give you free candy. Plus, it's one of the few times a year I get to pretend I have hair. I went into pediatrics because, in the words of one of the first pediatric surgeons, we're saving lifetimes here at OPR. The other thing I like about pediatrics is it's incredibly humbling. Kids don't care about my credentials, how many papers I've published, how many textbooks I've written. They just want to get better and get back to enjoying life. And I find that resilience to be something that keeps me young at heart and makes me appreciate all that I have. Overland Park Regional Medical Center is a special place to take care of kids because there's such a strong sense of community. All the people I work alongside with are very happy in their jobs. The pediatric specialists are constantly communicating with each other and we work together as a cohesive team to provide the best care for the babies, the children, and their families. And I think that sense of community is palpable for families. They know exactly who their child's doctors are and they trust that they're all on the same page. It's not just patient-centered care. Here at OPR, we deliver family-centered care. My favorite ice cream uh, flavor is probably orange coconut sherbet because it's awesome. My favorite superhero growing up was probably Green Lantern. I just thought it was really cool that he had a ring and that could have all these powers. The movie was terrible though, so I went and uh, saw Black Panther. I'm a bigger Black Panther fan now. Wakanda. I love Spongebob. Um, Spongebob has the best work ethic of any cartoon character I've ever seen. Loves his work at the Krabby Patty. And the kids love him too, which is why I wear him around my neck. When the kid sees a Spongebob, they know, okay, this guy's okay. I love all the holidays, um, but probably my favorite is Christmas. You get to be with family and get off school and hang out in the snow, that kind of thing. I was always into neuroscience and then realized I really love working with children because they're a brain that's growing and developing. There's nothing more amazing or valuable in the world. Being a part of that is like the most fulfilling and exciting experience in my life. Olin Park Regional allows me to give one-on-one -on -one patient care and is an exciting place to be and that's something I found very fulfilling and I like to come to work every day.
My favorite superhero, even though it probably is cliche, is Superman. I like the fact that he can fly, I like the fact that he's fast. Uh, my favorite holiday, um, growing up as well as today, is Thanksgiving. It's filled of laughter and um, joking. You get to see people you haven't seen in over a year. Kids are different. Kids are not little adults, as people tend to think. Um, they have different concerns, they have different worries. Our pediatric ER staff um, are uniquely trained in pediatric care. From the moment that I became a part of Buffalo Park Regional Medical Center, um, I have noticed the excitement and the dedication um, that has been put into this emergency department. They've really wanted to make this an amazing experience for everyone involved. From the beginning you come in, we are aware of the pediatric patient, we are aware of their concerns and the anxieties that they may have, not only them but their parents. I think we will provide a service to the community that they haven't seen before. My favorite ice cream, I think, is chocolate fudge with chocolate chips. It's creamy, delicious, and yummy in my tummy. Batman, because he has very cool gadgets. I like the car, I love the airplane. My favorite cartoon character is Dennis the Menace, because he's always in trouble. I love Christmas because it's the season to be jolly and because of sharing with other people. I specialize in pediatrics because I am a kid at heart and I love dealing with kids. Very creative, very spontaneous, that's the way I am. At Overland Park, I feel at ease. It's like family to me and overall, the people I work with are very willing and able and eager to take care of kids. My favorite ice cream flavor is black walnut ice cream. I have liked black walnut since I was a little kid growing up in Kansas in the country and always thought that that was a wonderful flavor only to find out that I have never met anybody else who really likes that flavor. My favorite superhero, I'd have to say Daredevil. As a superhero, he has taken a deficit he can't see and has been able to overcome that and I think that that to me is an inspiring role for a superhero. I think Thanksgiving uh, is my favorite holiday and I really enjoy that because it's the one time that I think you are really focusing on family and bringing everybody together. What has been so exciting and so very rewarding has been uh, the commitment that I have seen uh, that the hospital and the administration have uh, to supporting our goals of trying to provide um, a timely and accessible care for all of our patients with uh, pediatric uh, subspecialty conditions. When I went to uh, medical school, I always knew that I enjoyed working with kids, and I did a residency in both adult and pediatric medicine. Uh, and as I got further along, I recognized that having the opportunity to work with kids, um, interacting with them on a daily basis, talking with them, helping them understand and learn about their, their medical conditions was something that I found very rewarding. Uh, my favorite ice cream flavor is probably chocolate custard with toffee crunch mixed in because it's delicious. <laughs> well, I liked Spider-Man when I was growing up, but I would say most recently I really love Harry Potter. I like Foghorn Leghorn. I say, I say a boy. <laughs> I knew the first 
moment that I was on a pediatric radiology rotation that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And the reason I specialized in peds is because children are not only suffering from whatever problem they have, but their whole family is suffering, including their parents. And it makes me feel really good that I can help a child and also at the same time comfort them and their parents. Overland Park Regional Medical Center is a special and unique place to take care of kids because everybody is very collegial. We all work together and we meet face to face and by doing that, putting multiple heads together, we're able to provide a better patient treatment plan to really help the patient and uncover things that may have not been taken care of in the past just because so many different people were working on the patient but in separate boxes. So I really enjoy that. I feel like we can really make a difference for the patient that way. My favorite superhero growing up was Batman. He was just an ordinary guy, but he had amazing toys. My favorite type of ice cream is chocolate, obviously because it's the best. My favorite holiday, like a lot of people, is Christmas. I just love the, the family atmosphere and spending time with my kids. What makes the unit here at Overland Park special, I think, is that it was designed with kids and families in mind. Uh, they did a fabulous job uh, creating an environment that kids can be comfortable in, their families can be comfortable in, and we all recognize that a hospitalization is very stressful and very intimidating to people and anything that we can do to make the environment more comfortable is a tremendous help to everyone. I can't say enough about the staff we have here on the pediatric floor and in the pediatric ICU. Uh, our staff has varied experiences throughout the hospital but they've all come to pediatrics uh, for a reason and I think that reason is they all feel it's a special calling and that caring for children and their families is something very special and has a ton of meaning for all of us. My favorite ice cream flavor is Rocky Road. It's chocolate, but it's got the stuff in it. It's got nuts, it's got marshmallows, it's got everything you want. My favorite superheroes were the Wonder Twins. They would bump fists and go, Wonder Twin Powers, activate. They always had these wild things that they changed into. My favorite cartoon character was Bugs Bunny. What's up, Doc? Super funny guy. My favorite holiday, hands down, is Halloween because you get all the candy and it's my birthday. I specialized in pediatrics, uh, first of all, because uh, in medical school, I thought I was gonna be a pediatrician. I just thought that all the things in a children's hospital were amazing and the kids were fun to be around. And then when I got into orthopedics, my first rotation was with a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. After that, I was just spoiled for everything else. And uh, as we like to say, only the most childish of us get to play with the kids. Overland Park Regional Medical Center is a special place for kids because everyone has a special expertise. All the physicians have a fellowship training specializing in children's care. The nurses enjoy taking care of kids. It's the only thing they do. And so it really keeps you on your A game. You gotta know exactly what you're doing and, and your colleagues know what they're doing and it makes uh, teamwork a breeze.
never mind the rain from the skies if I can find the sun in your eyes sometimes I love you sometimes I Sometimes I love you Sometimes I hate you But when I hate you It's cause I love you That's how I am So what Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a great lunch. Um, we're going to keep going. Uh, we are really privileged to have Dr. Misty Good um, come and speak to us today. 
She is the uh, section chief of neonatal perinatal medicine at uh, University of North Carolina School of Medicine. And in particular, her laboratory is focused on the study of necrotizing enterocolitis, which is what she's going to talk to us about today. Um, I know that's the scary monster in the closet of all neonatal people. Um, so we're excited to hear from Dr. Good. Hello, thank you very much for the opportunity to present our work today. My name is Misty Good and I'm the Division Chief of Neonatal Perinatal Medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. And I'm excited to talk to you today about um, necrotizing enterocolitis and heading towards an era of personalized medicine for neck. And uh, we're not quite there yet, but hopefully we'll be there soon. So more on that in a little bit. Um, this slide shows my disclosures. We've been really fortunate enough to have um, a significant amount of funding from our funding sources listed here. Um, we do have a patent pending for some of our um, work and that was um, it's pending in the US but granted in Europe. So I won't be talking a lot about that today, uh, but just to be aware. And for those of you that are interested in doing research or not quite doing research yet, um, our patients and families depend on us for hope. And that's why I do research and um, and really this devastating disease, necrotizing enterocolitis, is so important that we continue to do research so that we can have more NICU graduates like this adorable baby here. So the outline of the talk is as follows. I'll be going into a background and introduction of our research on necrotizing enterocolitis. I'll review the pathogenesis of the disease and discuss our previous and current uh, preclinical studies, and then discuss more of a novel personalized medicine approach that um, we hope in the next several years will, will help us all um, at the bedside. And just several of us know um, about necrotizing enterocolitis, but just a brief clinical overview. Um, it's the leading cause of death from gastrointestinal disease in premature infants. It affects 7% of all premature babies. The mortality rate can reach up to 30 to 50% in surgical cases. And of course, the etiology is not well understood. And so one of the things that my lab is looking at is why the disease happens, how we can prevent it, and dis biomarker discoveries of the disease. And of course, neck um, is costing the healthcare system up to a billion dollars per year. And for those of you that have never seen this disease, what happens is you have a premature baby that's um, feeding and growing, and then um, suddenly they can develop abdominal distension like the second baby in this picture. And there's some um, abdominal wall erythema here. And uh, what this looks like under a microscope after surgical resection is that if you look on the right side, these histology slides, this is um, human control intestine. So um, you see these nice healthy villi here. And then in the bottom picture, you see um, histology from an infant with neck and you see um, that uh, disruption of the intestinal architecture and then um, in significant inflammatory infiltrate. And clinically on x-ray, we can see um, here, we see pneumatosis intestinalis, and this is a baby that had um, uh, intestinal perforation. So there's pneumoperitoneum um, found here, certainly a surgical emergency. And so our lab, is, as I mentioned, is really focused on um, this pro-inflammatory response, how we can attenuate it. And um, other ex exciting work in the field have shown that in the um, 24 to 72 hours prior to a diagnosis of neck, there's a bacterial dysbiosis that occurs um, that we see this bloom of proteobacteria in the microbiome. And basically what happens, and we don't know if it's a cause or a consequence of the disease, but what happens is there's this exaggerated pro-inflammatory immune response. And our lab is really focused on what are the different pathways that regulate that immune response, because it's basically immune the immune system gone wild, at least in a premature infant. And then also the goals of our lab is really to develop either um, nutritional or epithelial specific or immunotherapeutic strategies that can prevent the disease. And so you can see a picture of a baby with um, neck here, what that intestine looks like when they're operated on. This is a baby that was too unstable to go to the operating room. And so um, we converted their uh, 
room into an operating room. And so you can see this necrotic intestine here next to the healthy pinker intestine. And we can model this in the laboratory with mice. So this is an unfortunate mouse who had an intestinal perforation prior to the end of the model, which I'll describe a little bit more, but you can see the free air here. Um, and this is a picture of mouse intestine where you can see some pneumatosis intestinalis, these little, little bubbles that um, we can also appreciate on x-ray of humans. And so my lab really focuses on um, a bedside to the bench approach and then um, back again. So one of the ways in which we do that is we have this mouse model that I'll discuss a little bit. And again, you can see those little bubbles here. Um, and from a human perspective, we also are um, biobanking from 10 different centers. So biobanking um, all the different uh, biological fluids from babies with or without necrotized anaphylitis prospectively so that we can determine biomarkers for this devastating disease. And then lastly, I'll show you, I'll talk about our organ on a chip approach. And so we use a gut on a chip and we are funded to test um, various different therapies um, on premature intestine on a chip. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, but first we'll start uh, with our mouse model. And so this is just a schematic of our mouse model. And so what we do is we take mice that are four days old. So postnatal day four, we either keep them with their mother and are breastfed on demand. Those are our dam fed controls or our negative controls. Um, otherwise we separate them from their mom and place them in a human incubator where we hand feed them every three hours for 15 hours a day. I have a team that um, gavages individually all the pups, a special formula that's basically an infant formula mixed with puppy formula to make it osmolar. And then we add the toll-like receptor for ligand, lipopolysaccharide, which um, other investigators have shown to be really important in necrotizing anaphylitis. And then because microbiome plays such a significant role in this disease, we also add enteric bacteria from a baby with neck totalis um, into this formula. And the animals get gavaged this formula. So here's a picture of one of the postdocs in my lab um, gavaging a neonatal mouse. And so you can see here, this is uh, what's called a neonatal pick line or peripherally inserted central catheter. We use that as our gavage catheter because it's very soft and flexible. And um, then we drip the feedings in that way. We also subject the animals to 10, or, um, 10 minutes of 5% a hypoxia in a hypoxia chamber, so 5% oxygen. And um, this helps uh, stress the gut a little bit more and is supposed to mimic the clinical situation where we have our babies that are having oxygen desaturations um, often and uh, can stress the gut. And so at the end of um, three days of this model, we can get intestines that look like the picture on the right where you see the, again, those little bubbles and you can see some necrotic intestine there compared to the pink healthy intestine there. And we um, uh, harvest the intestine for analysis and I'll show you um, some of our data here. And so investigators have shown, um, and when I was doing my postdoctoral work in Dr. David Hackham's lab, he and others have shown that the innate immune receptor toll-like receptor four is very important in neck pathogenesis. And so um, these, again, these are some clinical pictures here of an intestinal perforation. This is a picture of human neck interoperatively, and again, that disrupted intestinal villi on histology. And so his laboratory showed that there was upregulation of toll-like receptor 4 um, in patients with neck compared to patients without neck. And so just a schematic of the different risk factors of this disease. So again, we know that toll-like receptor 4 signaling is important in neck pathogenesis, but there are several other risk factors, including gut immaturity, um, the gestational age of the infant certainly plays an important role, antibiotic exposure, the mode of delivery, again, all those impact the microbiome. And then the lack of breast milk feedings also play a significant role and can impact the microbiome as well. So if you look to the schematic on the right, you have proliferation of this pathogenic bacteria or that dysbiosis that I mentioned previously in the setting of a leaky gut of a premature infant, you can get that bacteria that crosses the gut barrier and what's called bacterial translocation that can then exaggerate or contributes to that exaggerated pro-inflammatory response and um, subsequent necrotizing enterocolitis and um, cell, cell death. And so we know as neonatologists that breast milk is protective and um, 
my early studies were really focused on why and what specifically in breast milk is protected. And so um, my early studies were focused on different growth factors. So I'll talk about that here. Um, and really the hypothesis of this work was that uh, we wanted to see one in breast milk protects against neck. As I mentioned previously, um, during my um, scientific postdoctoral training, I was in a lab that studied uh, toll-like receptor for signaling. And so we hypothesized that if we know that in a baby there's elevated TLR4 signaling, we thought about ways to inhibit that in order to protect against the disease. And so our hypothesis at the time was that breast milk protects against neck by inhibiting toll-like receptor 4 signaling. And we were really focused specifically on um, a growth factor called epidermal growth factor or EGF and its receptor EGFR because when the EGF binds to its receptor, then it gets activated. And we really wanted to see if this was something that would be important in neck. At the time, there were studies in inflammatory bowel disease showing that EGF had a really beneficial effect on the intestine. And so we were intrigued to learn more about that. And so the first barrier of the project was, well, okay, that sounds great. We're going to study breast milk, but how do we get breast milk from mice? And so um, I'll show you this slide or this video um, that uh, is how we did breast milk extraction from a mouse. And so I'll play the video and then, um, and then there'll be a picture on the next slide. Using an electric human breast pump outfitted with silicone tubing sized to fit mice and a five milliliter tube, extract milk from the teats one at a time. Finally, aliquot the milk immediately. And so um, that video is a little bit fast in case you missed it. This is a picture of me um, milking a mouse. And so you can see the mouse is under anesthesia so that they allow us to um, extract milk from them. And this is um, just actually a human breast pump that was adapted to fit mice. And this is some tubing here and you can see some breast milk getting extracted and it goes into this collection collection tube. And, uh, and there you have it. And so what we did in this set of exper experiments is we um, did our regular neck model as I previously described, and then we added breast milk to the mouse formula. And so here you can see in our breastfed control animals, the histology is nice and healthy. In our neck animals, you see that there's disrupted intestinal villa here. And when we added breast milk to their formula, you see that there's restoration of that nice intestinal architecture. And we wanted to know, okay, that's great. We know also um, breast milk protects against neck in humans, but then what is the mechanism involved in that and how is how is it protecting? And one of the ways that I mentioned we were interested in testing is that epidermal growth factor and its receptor. And so cetuximab or cetux shown here is the EGFR inhibitor. So when we block that signaling, what happens is we lose that protective effect on breast milk. And so you can see here the histology um, it's very disrupted. And then we also um, took the breast milk from the mouse and then immunodepleted the breast milk. So that's IBM here. We took the EGF out of the breast milk using antibody depletion technique. And you see you lose that protective effect as well. But then when you add back the EGF to the immunodepleted breast milk and then feed it to the mice, you see that that protection is restored, suggesting that one of the ways in which breast milk protects against neck is via EGF. And then we wanted to block the receptor. And so what we did and one of the great things about mice is that you can genetically modify them. And so we knocked out the EGF receptor specifically just out of the intestinal epithelial cells. And you see that these animals are susceptible to neck shown here with their um, villi disruption. And when we give those same animals breast milk, there is no protective effect. So suggesting that the EGFR signaling is also critical in the ways that breast milk protects against neck. And we have these special mice um, that are called NF-kappa B luciferase reporter mice. But basically what happens is when, um, when toll-like receptor four is activated, downstream of that is this transcription factor NF-kappa B. And so when you inject the ligand for TLR4 LPS or lipopolysaccharide, you see that the animal glows. And so in this animal, we know that TLR4 signaling 
um, is very high. And so what we did after we injected, um, we were injecting LPS into these animals, what we did actually prior to the injection was we gavaged um, one dose of breast milk, um, you know, again, extracted pun breast milk from a mouse. And you see that just one hour prior to this LPS injection, you see that um, breast milk blocked the TLR4 signaling. And again, that same drug, cetuximab, that EGFR inhibitor, when we administer that drug to the animals in the setting of also a lipopolysaccharide injection and a breast milk gavage, you see that you lose that protective effect. Again, suggesting that these protective effects of breast milk, um, one of the ways in which they're protecting is via EGFR, EGF and EGFR signaling. And we then wanted to know from the animals that we subjected to NEC, we wanted to look a little bit deeper into the intestine and see what other effects it was, it was having. And something that we know from other mouse and human studies is that PCNA or proliferating cell nuclear antigen, which is stained for in these humo, or immuno um, histochemistry slides sh are shown here in green. We know that in humans and mice with neck that PCNA is decreased. And so we wanted to, we wanted to test this. So these are basically, um, these are intestinal crypts at the bottom of the intestinal villi that we showed previously. And you see in the control or breastfed animals that there's nice uh, proliferation or a nice green staining. In the setting of neck, you see that that's significantly decreased. In the animals that were fed um, breast milk, there was added to their formula, their special neck formula, you see um, that there's nice proliferation staining. In the animals that got cetuximab, that PCNA staining is decreased. In the animals that received that immunodepleted breast milk where EGF was taken out, you see that proliferation was also decreased. But when we add back EGF, you see that that proliferation is restored, suggesting that breast milk enhances crypt proliferation via EGF and EGFR. And we wanted to know, okay, is EGFR important in the human situation? And so what we did is we took um, human fetal intestine prior to, you know, prior to delivery at an elective termination and stain for epidermal growth factor receptor. And so you see nice red staining here, which is the EGFR. In a patient that had necrotized anterocolitis, we obtained pieces of intestine from the operating room and then analyzed them in our lab. And so you can see when we stained for EGFR that red staining was significantly decreased. And then in that same patient, we also obtain intestine when the patient has a reanastomosis and gets their intestine put back together after they have a stoma and they heal, et cetera. So that's what's called healed newborn intestine. And you can see that EGFR expression is restored. So suggesting that there's decreased intestinal EGFR expression is associated with neck um, in humans. And so, um, that brings us to our next component of the talk. And I will say we're really excited about these findings when they first, when we first found them and they first came out. But one of the things that was happening also at the time in the adult medicine literature is that EGF or excessive EGFR signaling, which in our case looked great, um, it was actually shown to be um, associated with head and neck cancer in humans. So certainly not something that would be good for our babies. So we wanted to look at, um, at something else because we knew that would never move forward and would never be something that we could get into the clinical arena. And so we chose to focus, sorry about that. We chose to focus on um, human milk oligosaccharides, um, which are some sugars that are found in breast milk. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And so what we did in these studies is we added the human milk oligosaccharide or HMO to fucosal lactose or 2FL to the, to the uh, mouse formula that we give our mice. And so you have, you can see gross pictures here of the breastfed animals. So nice pink intestine, histology, nice and healthy. Our neck animals, again, um, darker intestine, you can see some necrosis and some um, pneumatosis intestinalis, and then disrupted intestinal villi and the architecture. And then in the animals that are were with they had HMOs added to their formula, you see nice pink healthy intestines and nice histology. And when we looked by quantitative PCR at different inflammatory markers, including inducible nitric oxide synthase, interleukin-6, interleukin-1 beta, and then um, 
and then uh, toll-like receptor 4, you see that in the animals that were fed the HMOs in their formula that um, they were significantly decreased from the animals that um, did not have the HMOs in their formula, suggesting that the HMO 2 fucosalactose reduces next severity and inflammation. And we wanted to see why. So we looked at, um, because we had seen that the intestines were nice and pink, we wanted to look at the perfusion of the intestine. And so basically in these um, pictures, these are immunofluorescence um, whole mount images where we stain for PCAM or CD31, which is endothelial marker. And we also stain in green. Um, this is tomato lectin, which is um, what we did is we, at the um, prior to sacrifice, we put the animals under anesthesia and then intracardiac injected this tomato lectin into, um, into the heart and then let it circulate around for five minutes and then um, euthanize the animal and then evaluated the intestine. And so you can see in the breastfed animal, there's nice um, green staining here. So nice mesenteric perfusion. And in the neck animals, you see that there's significantly decreased mesenteric perfusion, but, but nice PCAM staining, which is our um, control here, just to make sure that the staining worked. In the breastfed plus HMO animals, you can see nice, um, healthy, um, blood vessels here. And then in the neck plus HMO animals, you see that the tomato lectin staining, it's not quite back all the way to the breastfed animal, but um, certainly much improved from the animals with neck. So suggesting that one of the ways in which tuficosal lactose protects against neck is by enhancing that mesenteric perfusion. And so now um, HMOs are now found in all kinds of infant formula. Um, there's been a lot of studies that have been um, done that have looked at different moms and um, if they're secreting different types of human milk oligosaccharides or not. So certainly a big area of interest. And so we know just a brief summary that breast milk is best, but certainly not always available in the NICU and novel preventative strategies are definitely needed. And so we, you know, going back to kind of our schematic that we were looking at before. So we were looking at, um, we just focus on the left side here, human milk oligosaccharides. Certainly there's a lot of them and they can do a lot of different things and including enhancing intestinal epithelial cell differentiation. And they do get absorbed into the systemic circulation and can really decrease the inflammatory markers and preserve that gut perfusion, which is fantastic. And so, um, so now that that had moved on into, um, you know, as a nutraceutical um, and there's been a lot of great studies on it. We wanted to shift and look a bit into some cytokines. And I'll, we're focused um, and funded specifically on a cytokine called interleukin-22. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And um, I will say uh, my previous mentor, uh, Dr. Jay Coles, is pictured here. So he's a TH17 expert. And uh, we embarked on this project together. And there were um, a lot of great studies coming out in the adult literature at this time on um, interleukin-22, and uh, we really wanted to focus IL-22 on neck. And so just a recap, we'd shown, and other investigators had also shown that neck-induced inflammation leads to gut barrier dysfunction, intestinal stem cell loss, and impaired mucosal healing. And the evidence that was coming out on interleukin-22 or IL-22 showed that it played a critical role in intestinal stem cell regeneration, regulated gut barrier integrity, and attenuated intestinal inflammation by enhancing antimicrobial defense. So we thought this would be a nice therapeutic for neck. And so shown on the right here in these pictures, our little um, human enteroids. So we call these little mini guts that um, we can grow into the lab after we get a piece of intestine from the operating room, we can grow up uh, an individual patient's enteroids and then test various drugs. And so here you can see in the control, they're smaller than those that um, had treatment with IL-22. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but there's a lot of um, various cell types that make interleukin-22, so different um, immune cells here, and um, those downstream signal through the IL-22 receptor and activate um, a bunch of these um, stats, which we'll talk, we won't talk about at all, but just um, we'll talk about IL-22 in general. And so first we wanted to see in neonates, 
what is the story with aisle 22? Is it there at baseline? Do the animals have it? Sometimes, um, you know, it after neonates um, grow up, their immune system matures. And so we wanted to see um, how, how things were looking specifically in the intestines. So what we did is we um, evaluated the mouse intestine at various time points, including prior to delivery. So embryonic day 15, embryonic day 17, postnatal day one up through postnatal day 49. And this is mRNA expression of interleukin-22 in their small intestine. So you see it's um, the IL-22 expression is very low up until the time, this is when between P21 and P28 is when a mouse weans and um, stops breastfeeding and uh, is on a chow diet. So you can see, and that's certainly when the microbiome, et cetera, is changing. You can see that the IL-22 levels are really low until then. Um, however, the receptor for IL-22, IL-22 RA1, is low. And then after delivery, um, you see nice expression. We also showed that by flow cytometry. Again, that IL-22 was low in a neonate compared to um, an adult mouse. And we wanted to see what was happening during neck, both in mice and humans. So shown on the left is histology pictures, again, in both mice and humans here. In the mouse, we looked at mRNA expression in the intestine of mouse IL-22, and we would expect actually that this would go up, but in our animals, they actually went down. So suggesting that neonates are, neonatal mice at least, are lacking IL-22 production during neck. And even the receptor actually is downregulated and could be due to um, a loss. And so IL-22 receptor is located on the epithelial, um, epithelial cells. And so you see when you lose, um, the intestinal epithelial cells here, um, as in, you know, these pictures because of that, um, certainly that can cause downregulation of the receptor. And in humans, we didn't see any difference um, in the controls versus neck intestine. Same with the receptor, there's certainly a trend, but, um, but no significant difference. So this is suggesting to us that neonates lack IL-22 production during neck and IL-22 can really be responsible for healing. And so our thought was, well, if we administered IL-22 to them, would that protect against neck? And so that's what we did. So we gave IL-22 to the mice and we wanted to see in the different um, pro-inflammatory markers that we see, or we, we see that are upregulated in our mouse model um, shown here, including interleukin-1 beta. So this is the mRNA and then protein level. We see that treatment with IL-22 decreases those pro-inflammatory markers and then um, also decreases the chemokine CXCL2, um, but not CXCL1. So showing that we can dampen the pro-inflammatory response in certain instances, but not others uh, with IL-22. And we wanted to see, okay, what else does IL-22 treatment do? And so there are several host defense genes that are known to be associated with IL-22 treatment, and these are shown here. So retinal B is also known as realm beta. It's a goblet cell marker. And so treatment with the recombinant IL-22 in the context of neck upregulates that um, retinal B, and then also red streak gamma, which is um, a panacell marker and antimicrobial uh, peptide. We see upregulation of red streak gamma and upregulation of foot two, which is um, fugosal transferase two. So it's another host defense gene that's important in um, regulating the microbiome, et cetera, in the intestine. And we had I'd shown you previously about epithelial cell proliferation, so PCNA. So in animals, you know, we had previously seen that in animals that were subjected to NEC, we see that um, small amount of PCNA or small amount of proliferation. And when we administered IL-22, you see nice green staining here. So nice proliferation, suggesting that treatment with IL-22 enhances the epithelial proliferation seen in NEC. And then we wanted to look in those little mini guts or those enteroids, you know, what is happening. And we subjected those enteroids to RNA sequencing. And these are um, the upregulated genes that you can see here with IL-22 treatment compared to the control here. So again, retinal B is right up on top, registry gamma, also registry beta, that's, um, which is another antimicrobial gene, and then um, some, other, some other genes as well, like I talked about, foot two, and um, the verification of that is shown, shown here as well. So showing that IL-22 treatment upregulates host defense genes in neonatal mouse enteroids as well. 
And so just an interim summary for this while we move to the next part of the talk is that IL-22 expression is low in the developing mouse and human intestine. Treatment with IL-22 can attenuate the intestinal inflammation seen in experimental neck. And pr this protection was associated with increased host defense expression and enhanced epithelial barrier regeneration. So we're really excited to pursue this further and we're working with um, the FDA on finishing the preclinical studies prior to um, a clinical trial with this um, IL-22 treatment. And so next I'll move to um, briefly just talking about our um, biobaking initiative. So in 2017, I started a necrotizing enterocolitis biorepository, which is basically a biorepository from, with a lot of samples from a lot of babies. And um, we're currently up to 10 centers and we're always looking for additional collaborators if anyone in the audience is interested. And basically what we do is we collect, process, store, and then share samples um, with people within the biorepository. And we obtain all kinds of clinical information and Really why I started this is because I wanted to break down some of the barriers that exist with um, translational research or biomarker research. And um, we wanna make sure that the specimens that are going in the biorepository um, have, you know, are of high quality and um, make sure that, you know, people are collaborating in the field. And so one of the ways in which um, we're looking at biomarker discovery is analyzing uh, intestinal phenotypes. And so it's the focus of one of our uh, R01s looking at specifically DNA methylation as a biomarker for neck. And so in this slide shows heat maps of babies with neck or without neck, either in the colon to the left or the ileum to the right. And so you can see in the dark blue, that means that there's DNA hypermethylation. So if you focus on the left, um, heat map here, you can see in the patients, the human patients with neck, you can see that there's DNA hypermethylation that's prevalent in the um, colon and certainly prevalent in the ileum compared to controls. We're um, evaluating this also in the stool and we've published on that um, some pilot data that we published uh, looking at um, case a case control study looking at in the stool of infants with neck and found that there's DNA hypermethylation that's present. And so what we're doing now is looking prospectively at the different, um, the different markers in the stool and what are their various exposures of the babies? Like, did they get a blood transfusion that day? Did they get a particular medication? Did their diet change? We're looking at all those different clinical factors and how they affect DNA methylation in the stool prior to the onset of neck. Some in vitro neck models, um, I talked about those uh, little aneroids. So basically what happens is we get a piece of premature infant intestine into the lab. We can isolate, these are the intestinal villi here. We can isolate the crypts, which are the base of the intestine. And then we can co-culture them in um, a dish, what we call neck in a dish with various um, types of human microbiome that can then upregulate pro-inflammatory cytokines at various time points. And so I'll talk about our organ on a chip model, which basically starts with those neonatal enteroids. Um, after we obtain a piece of intestine, we make those enteroids, we grow them up. Um, and then what we do is we put them on a microfluidic chip or seed the microfluidic chip. And basically what we can do is we can grow neonatal intestine on a chip, you know, without neck. Um, the top chamber of the chip, so there's, the chip is two chambers. The top chamber has neonatal epithelial cell chamber um, that I'll show you some pictures. We can grow this neonatal epithelium and the bottom chamber is endothelial cells and they can cross talk to each other, et cetera. And we have this exciting new neck on a chip model where we um, have cultured the bacteria or microbiome from an infant with neck totalis, as I mentioned for our mouse model that we add to the formula. We can actually add this to the chip and do a co-culture where you can see this enteric bacterial slurry that we add here. Can up, I'll show you some data that we have demonstrated. Um, there's upregulated pro-inflammatory cytokines, decreased epithelial proliferation, and disrupted epithelial barrier integrity, which are all hallmarks of neck pathogenesis. And how this looks, um, this is just another schematic in the upper right-hand corner of the epithelial and um, endothelial chamber here, and they communicate via this porous membrane 
But here's what our chip looks like. It goes into this chip house, which is basically called a pod. And the media goes in this area here. And uh, the chips then go into this culture module where each individual chip uh, functions like, like its own. So you can add various treatments into, um, into the chip directly or into the media. And this culture module continuously delivers the media to the chip and that um, mimics you know, the flow throughout the intestine. So again, they get nice continuous flow. And then this module here sends signals to this culture module to stretch the chip. So to mimic peristalsis, which is really important and um, certainly a big step in the right direction in terms of cell culture. And this platform really allows us to co-culture for a significant amount of time with bacteria, because otherwise, if it's just what I was talking about before, like the neck in a dish, the bacteria really overgrow the culture and you can't do it for a long term. And we really want to see, you know, you know, looking at several days, like what is, um, what is the therapeutic doing to the intestine and how can we, is it preventing inflammation or not? And you can't do that if the culture, you know, all the cells are dead within, you know, eight to 12 hours. And so this is some work that was done by a very talented um, technician in our lab, Wyatt Lonick, who's now in medical school. And so what Wyatt did is he grew up these premature infant aneroids, which you can see here, day zero, and then broke them up a little bit and seeded them on the chip. So that's what this looks like um, day one. These are all um, little cells here. And then day three, in that culture module, you see that there's a neonatal epithelial monolayer has started. So all these cells are now one layer, um, just you know, flat. And then by day six, with the addition of stretch and the continuous flow, you see that an epithelium is starting to be born here. And so you see these little um, crypt or these valley, like valley kind of. Um, areas here. By day eight, you see that there's these, there's really a more 3D structure and you get these villus-like axes and I'll show what they look like when we cross-section them. And so after, after these villus-like axes develop, then what happens is we um, administer the dysbiotic microbiome from an infant, and as I mentioned, with neck totalis, and then basically watch what happens. And so these are some images um, that were taken by Dr. Cliff Luke. And you can see what this looks like under a microscope. So this is um, this neonatal intestine on a chip, not with neck. You can see um, the nuclear stain here is blue. So all those are various cells. In red, it's MUC2, it's just goblet cells, um, which are an important epithelial cell in the gut that produce mucus. You can see those nice, um, nice staining of the goblet cells. And then ECAD or ECAD here in is one of the um, tight junctions that holds the intestine together. And you can see that blown up here and just really making um, a nice epithelial barrier. And then we'll, we'll disrupt it for our model. And we wanted to see in our neck on a chip model, what the difference was in the various epithelial cell, cell types um, and also proliferation what's the difference between our neck on a chip and our human intestine? And so I'll walk you through this slide. So these are all confocal images. In this first column here, this is human intestine. At the top left is um, control intestine, so no neck. And you can see in red is chromogranin A staining. And so these are endoendocrine cells that are known to be decreased in neck. And so you can see here um, in the control, you have nice red endoendocrine cells. In the setting of human neck, you see those are decreased. In our neck on a chip model, our control, you see nice and our endocrine cells that are again, decreased in our neck on a chip model. And again, if you take that same viewpoint for proliferation, which is um, K67 is a marker just like PCNA for proliferation, you see nice proliferation here in the human intestine, decreased in neck, um, nice proliferation in the control neck on a chip, um, which means no neck, just control, control chips. And then um, in our neck on a chip, you see that that's significantly decreased. Same with panna cells, same with goblet cells. So nice staining here, decreased in neck, nice staining in our control chips, and then decreased in neck on a chip. So certainly suggesting that neck on a chip can recapitulate several features of the human neck. Um, then we wanted to look at gene expression data so that 
um, here are, is looking at epithelial cell markers, pro-inflammatory cytokines, and proliferation markers in human neck. And shown in black is control, and then neck in gray. Um, LGR5 is a stem cell marker, so significantly decreased in human neck. Lysozyme um, is a panacell marker. MUC2 is a goblet cell marker. Pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta and IL-8 are known to be upregulated in human neck. And then again, those proliferation markers, K67 and PCNA. And in our neck on a chip at 72 hours, we see that um, several of these cell types are um, significantly decreased. So LGR5, again, that's some cell marker, lysozyme up to chromogranin and A, all downregulated. Upregulated significantly is IL-1 beta and IL-8, and decreased is K67 and PCNA. So a lot of that um, neck on a chip gene expression data is mimicking what's seen in the human disease. And we, um, as I mentioned, there's a top chamber and a bottom chamber, and we can really um, evaluate what is happening at the gut barrier level. Once we have um, that tight monolayer, um, we can see if we put a tracer in the top chamber when it migrates to the bottom chamber. And so I'll show you some pictures of this on the next slide, but this is the apparent permeability um, in centimeters per second, looking at post inoculation. So after we add, we lovingly call it nectaria, that, um, that enteric microbiome from an infant with neck totalis. So we can see at 24 hours, the gut barrier is starting to break down. And then it's really starting to break down at 48 and 72 hours. And I'll show you what that looks like here. This is confocal images staining for ZO1 or Zona occludens 1. So you see in green, just nice, um, tight, gut barrier that in the setting of neck on a chip, you see that um, completely is broken down by 72 hours. We then looked with um, RNA sequencing at different time points. So at 24 hours of our neck on a chip and 72 hours, we wanted to see um, what are the different pathways that are um, up and down regulated in our neck on a chip model. And so you can see there's upregulation of um, different cell death pathways, including apoptosis, necroptosis, um, and ferroptosis. So those are a bunch of cell death pathways. The cytokine um, cytokine receptor interaction pathways, TNF um, signaling pathway and IL-17 signaling pathway are known to be um, upregulated in human neck and are certainly upregulated in our neck on a chip. And then also at 72 hours, we see a lot of those same um, a lot of those same pathways that are upregulated. And this demonstrated to us that this is really similar to the human situation. And then we wanted to look at a personalized medicine approach. So we have babies that, you know, some babies get sicker than others. We're not sure why. Some babies get breast milk and don't get neck and others get breast milk and do get neck. And we want to see why. And so what we did is um, took three different infant donors um, without neck. And then, so they were, they had intestinal uh, resection for other reasons. Um, these were premature infants here. And so we wanted to grow up their enteroids and then make chips out of their um, premature infant intestine and then subject them to um, this nectaria, as I mentioned. So dysbiotic microbiome from an infant with neck. And so you can see that in this gene expression data here of the various um, markers that we're interested in. So IL-1 beta, IL-8, certainly pro-inflammatory markers. And then again, those proliferation markers, K67 and PCNA. And you can see um, these are done in triplicate. So each infant um, is a different color. And you can see with administration of the nectaria, you see that there's varying responses um, from a cytokine perspective to the dysbiotic microbiome. So like the infant, for example, in blue may not be as susceptible to this dysbiotic microbiome that um, the infant number one or number two um, is. So, you know, certainly interesting, these personalized responses. And we know that, um, that uh, individuals respond differently to different drugs and some drugs work for um, some babies and not others. And so, um, this is an area of extreme interest for us. And so um, I'll just stop there. In conclusion, our neck on a chip model is a promising new patient-derived model of neck that we can do without utilizing any animals and um, can really test a lot of different microbiomes, a lot of different therapeutics. We can add 
um, immune cells, which I'm not showing. We can add immune cells to the chip. We can add, um, do them in different um, hypoxic conditions, et cetera. And this neck on a chip can recapitulate many of the features that we see in human neck. And as I mentioned, we're using this neck on a chip as a drug discovery platform that we recently got funded to do. And I mentioned previously that I would show you what the chip looks like in cross section. So um, villain is a marker of the villi shown here in green. And you can see just nice, um, nice architecture, um, even some actin architecture here. So basically looking, excuse me, basically looking um, at the cross section uh, of these nice villi that are being grown in the chip. And so I think we accomplished our objectives. So I give you an overview of our neck research program. We discussed ways in which breast milk is protective against neck, talked about some in vitro models of neck and using neck on a chip as a personalized medicine approach. And um, all this is certainly um, a lot of work, but uh, we, we keep going and we fight like a preemie. And uh, we're hopeful that our research helps contribute to the next generation of therapeutics for this disease, and hopefully we can prevent this devastating disease altogether. And so it definitely takes a village of uh, people to do all this work. So this is um, my lab at Washington University who did a lot of this work, and then my current lab at UNC Chapel Hill that has done um, just a lot of work recently on um, the IL-22 work and um, some new exciting work that we were recently funded to do uh, with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative looking at um, uh, single cell uh, phenotypes of this disease, which I don't have time to talk about today, but happy to take any questions and appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. If you have any questions, please reach out to me um, now or via email and I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Dr. Good, thank you so much for joining us. That uh, talk and your research is, um, well, the response I'm getting from the people that are here in the building and online, um, kind of mind blowing. Um, <laughs> we're, so much. I, I mean, um, as I said at the beginning, you know, necrotizing enterocolitis is the scary monster in all of our closets. Um, Anything that can be done to prevent or treat is 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 welcome, um, and what you've accomplished is is re quite remarkable. So I, I thank you again for for presenting that to us. Um, some questions. Um, I, one that came up right away is how can someone get involved with your biorepository? That's that's a great question. Um, please just reach out to me by email. Um, my email is just misty good at unc.edu, and we would be happy to onboard your center. We we use a single IRV, actually, and so we try to streamline the process for all the centers. Um, every IRV is a little bit different, but we've been working through um, a lot of the different centers, and so happy to help in any way. But we would love for people to be involved. Yeah, we're going to have to tie down one of our nurse practitioners. She came out of her seat and wanted to <laughs> jump on this. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate it. I think, you know, the big thing about NEC is there's so many different phenotypes. And so we do need to have a large number of samples from a lot of different centers. So that way we can really pin down like all the different phenotypes. Just the other day, somebody was saying, you know, that they think um, spontaneous intestinal perf is similar to NEC. And we know actually that that's not the case. But, um, but without a lot of that data, I think you know, we're going to have to collect all of, all of the samples and really get that data out there. So I appreciate the excitement about it. Thank yeah. you. Um, in regards to your IL-22 product, um, first question is, are you, is this being developed to prevent or treat neck? That's a great question. So when we first embarked on these studies, actually, obviously our goal is to prevent neck. And, um, and when we did all the preclinical mouse studies originally and approached the FDA and had a meeting with them, they, um, they said, this is great, but like we will not approve um, like a clinical trial protocol in which you're administering a drug actually to um, protect against neck because it only affects, you know, anywhere from like seven to 10 percent of the smallest babies and you can't predict which babies will get it. So why are we going to then subject 
you know, 93% of the babies um, are premature babies to a drug that they may not, you know, ever get the disease. And so we then reformulated our approach and, um, and then had to focus on treatment. And what we did is, and I didn't have time to show a lot of this data, um, but what we did is look at different time points after which we started the neck model and, you know, at different like six hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. And um, similar to like um, cooling with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, like at what point, you know, would you enroll a baby in a study um, to try to attenuate the disease? And so, um, so we're in the process of working that out. The prelim data on that is that it looks like it'll be about six hours. So at six hours in our neck model, we see in the intestine of the mice, we see upregulation of pro-inflammatory cytokines. They certainly don't have neck yet, um, but but that's when we see um, that the inflammation is starting and there's, a, there's certainly a significant difference in inflammation compared to the controls that then evolves to necrosis and intestinal perforation over the you know next three days that we do the model. But it looks like six hours is probably gonna be the window in which um, we have to administer the drug, um, at least in our mice, to protect against mortality. So hopefully, we'll see, and pro and decrease in pro-inflammatory cytokines. But if you administer it too far out, like 12 hours or 24 hours, um, we still have a high rate of mortality in the mice, and um, it doesn't do anything to their pro-inflammatory response. Well, that just answered the next question: was when would you start if this were to be approved? Mm -hmm. You have to have a high index of suspicion and start within six hours. Yeah, so so what we would um, think about is that if you have a baby, let's say, that has neck or has definite neck, um, let's say pneumatosis, and you want to try to do whatever you can to, you're obviously starting the antibiotics, you're drying the blood cultures, you're getting the x-ray. Um, once you see the x-ray that there's concern for neck, then our goal would be really to try to get um, the family consented and get the drug in within six hours. So um, certainly... You know, it seems almost impossible to think that, but that, that would be our goal. So provided they're at a referral center that is, um, you know, has the drug available. But. Right. Um, another question. Dysbiosis is clearly a theme in your work. Um, before we get to the point of having a drug for neck, what would you recommend we do to modulate the dysbiosis? <laughs> That's, I wish I had the answer to that. Um, we, you know, we, we know from great, like really great work from Barb Warner at WashU and others that, um, that we know that the microbial component is really important to this disease and, you know, in humans and in mice actually. So if we don't have that enteric bacteria that we call necteria in the lab, you know, from a premature infant, if there's not that component that we don't have the same neck model actually. And so, you know, is it a cause or a consequence of the disease? We do feel like it, um, because all the human data has shown that it really precedes neck in the 24 to, you know, 48 or 72 hours prior to a diagnosis of neck. And so, you know, there's a lot out there on probiotics. Um, I certainly didn't touch some of our preclinical work that looked at probiotics, uh, mostly because it's just, you know, it's a hot topic and there's been a lot of, um, lot, of lot of clinical data out there on that. And there's still a lot of centers, including ours here and um, all my previous centers that I've worked at that don't use probiotics. And uh, we all know that um, the AAP, you know, issued as the, you know, Committee on Fetus and Newborn um, had put out a statement on probiotics. And so uh, I think, you know, in our smallest infants that certainly can have um, the most leaky guts, I do think we need to be careful in terms of which probiotics we administer or not. Um, my bias would be that if we could add prebiotics to our babies, meaning like we're feeding the bacteria and then, you know, giving them breast milk um, and really like enhancing that good bacteria, um, without necessarily providing, you know, them the direct bacteria, I think that would be the way to go. I know there's a lot of centers that um, still, that use probiotics and have seen good results. So um, yeah, it's just, you know, it's individualized, I think, to each center and uh, and some people, you know, use probiotics and not seen decreases in that grade. So the jury, I think, is still out on that. But. 
I didn't mean to, to jump you with a, a probiotic question there. No, it's okay. It comes up all the time. Yeah. So, um, I wish I had like the magic, you know, cocktail that we could just sprinkle in and prevent neck and all our babies. That would be the way to go. Well, and that's something that's easier to get through because it's not really regulated by the FDA. So yeah. Well, don't we all? Um, question regarding transfusion protocols. Um, you know, the neck associated or transfusion associated neck. Um, one, is there a particular protocol that you use in your unit for that? And I'm going to add to that. Is there any thought of, of um, modifying the immune response that we suspect is, is at the heart of the association? No, that's a really good question. Um, but, you know, I, I had published a paper a long time ago now on, um, on what we thought was transfusion-related neck, and actually Dr. Ravi Patel at Emory published a really nice paper looking at um, that we, we think now it's actually the level of how anemic we're letting the babies get, you know, that we're having, you know, decreased perfusion to the gut, et cetera. I mean, certainly we can't test that in humans, um, but, but certainly his work was fantastic looking at looking at the level of anemia and the different um, anemia thresholds. Now, certainly, anytime you give um, you give a blood product of any kind, you are you do have an immune response. And so, figuring out you know ways in which we can either enhance that immune response or if it's too exaggerated, calm it down a little bit. I think there's a lot that still needs to be determined from that. Just in neck in general. Um, we don't really know. It's kind of a black box where we have this dysbiosis. You have, you know, bacterial translocation off the gut across the gut barrier, and then what happens is you have this exaggerated immune response. And we know like the different pathways that are signaling, but we don't really know necessarily how to stop that or get the good pathways to be, you know, upregulated. So that's all. A lot of focus of our work actually is ways in which we can modulate the immune response at different time points. Um, regarding your neck on a chip, um, which sounds like a snack. I'm sorry, I'm going to say it. <laughs> I mean, we, it's a it's a chip model. I mean that yeah, that's, no. uh, we have these microfluidic devices, but you know, there's organ on a chip, all different yeah. on a chip, body on a chip. You can integrate a whole bunch of them. But. Um, you know, again, the comments that I'm getting here are, are like, wow, mind blowing, amazing work. Um, <laughs> is do you see a, a clinical application? That's in, a really in addition good to you know research. Yep. Yeah, I mean, right now it's obviously um, strictly used for research. Um, there are a lot of um, chip investigators looking at, um, you know, various different um, therapeutics. Like we have an R01 that's specifically focused on um, looking at neck on a chip and different drugs that we can test before we test them on our babies. So what I would see in terms of clinical application um, or even like early preclinical applications is one of the one of the things in order to get approval for a drug, you know, to be FDA approved, you have to like go through, you know, small animal and then large animal studies. And, you know, what we would envision is that this chip approach could then be, you know, take the place of, let's say, large animal, um, large animal studies, for example, that it's like you're using human tissue that is discarded. So you don't need to take it from a patient um, in order, you know, to test various drugs. But I think something that's important is that, and we've just started to really dig into this, is looking at, you know, each particular patient and what is their response to certain microbiomes. Because we know that, like, a baby may have dysbiosis but not get neck, but another one may have dysbiosis and get, you know, neck totalis and die. And so, can we predict that in the lab? I think it's too early to say, um, but it is it is what we're what we're trying to do. And then also. You know, a lot of these chip studies were done in, you know, adult cell lines or adult um, aneroids. And so, you know, what we really want to know for our population is, you know, is this particular drug that is okay in adult intestine, is it okay for like fragile neonatal intestine? And so 
um, we have an R01 looking at this and different um, inhibitors and to try to see, you know, can we dampen the inflammation at least in an in vitro level? And if so, then we can, you know, test it in our mouse model, see how it performs, et cetera. And then that could hopefully advance the pipeline because right now the pipeline is pretty small in terms of like what drugs um, could prevent or treat neck um, better than what we have now, which is just broad spectrum antibiotics and surgery. But. Excellent. We're out of time. Dr. Good, I can't thank you enough. Uh, this has been outstanding. Uh, your research is fantastic, and having you with us has been a real pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, keeping right on time. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Stephen Lawson. Uh, he comes to us from across town, a local guy, um, from the University of Kansas. He's a professor of pediatrics and psychiatry and behavioral sciences. Um, he received his PhD in clinical child psychology from the University of Kansas. Um, did his residency in clinical child, child psychology and pediatric psychology at Harvard Medical School and did postdoctoral work uh, in pediatric psychology at the University of Washington. Um, we are excited to have him with us. This is a time of, of a lot of burnout and mental stress in, in caregivers and families alike. So um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lawson. Well, it's very good to be with everyone here today. And uh, I'm grateful for the planning committee and their invitation to come and share something maybe a little different from what the rest of the presenters are sharing today. And that is really how to become more resilient. This is a, an idea that um, we're hearing more about and is becoming increasingly important in both our professional and personal lives. And so I'm very glad to be able to do that today. I want this to be very helpful and very practical. And so I've got a number of suggestions and ideas that I hope will help each of us become more resilient. Um, resilient people have always intrigued me, uh, how they think and how they live their lives. And so I've made it somewhat of a study of mine to study resilient people and uh, to try to um, be more resilient myself. So what I'd like to share with you today are some things that resilient people do and uh, with the hope of us becoming more resilient ourselves. I remember walking into the NICU here at KU for the first time, oh, probably 14 years ago, and I was struck you know, by a lot of things, the complexity of the environment. But one thing that really stood out to me was how challenging of an environment it was for staff and everything that they were required to do and to monitor and the emotions and the, the technical aspect of caring for these babies and their families. And that has become something of a passion of mine is providing support and helping to grow resilience in our NICU staff. And so I'll talk more about some of those experiences as we move through the presentation, but. I think, again, there's a, it's a real relevant issue for us to consider today. So what is resilience? We hear about this a lot, but it can be defined in different ways. Uh, one definition is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or mental toughness. Another definition describes it as a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. So those are two interesting aspects to resilience, this, this ability to recover quickly from difficulties that we experience, uh, but also it's a process of, of adapting to difficulties that we experience as well. Um, I think both indicate uh, the, uh, the, the nature of it, that it really takes time. 
Uh, it's it's not something that uh, always comes easily or naturally to us, and it, it it's not a quick process, uh, but it, it's it's one um, that that has adaptation as a core feature of it. So let me try to further explain and define resilience with with some pictures and a story. So if you'll remember a year or two ago, uh, in the Kansas City area, we had uh, a big snowstorm that went Saturday night into Sunday morning. And it was four, five, six inches of very heavy, wet snow that came down very quickly in the matter of a few hours. And Sunday morning, I went outside and, and my neighborhood saw this that I took a picture of. Now, that probably doesn't look too, too unusual. Uh, until I tell you that, that that bush, what looks like a bush, was really a big birch tree that stood as tall as those houses around it. And with the snow that came down, you see that the snow just weighted it down and brought it almost flat to the ground. And I remember going home and telling my wife that, you know, that tree was finished. There was no way that that tree was going to survive. Uh, the damage that it incurred you know, from the snowstorm. Well, a couple of weeks later, I was out again and took a picture of the same tree. And this is what I saw. And it was a remarkable chain transformation for this tree and recovery for it to completely have rebounded and, and taken back its, its original shape. And that's what resilience is in our lives. We're kind of like that tree sometimes. We get weighed down with difficulties in life. And yet, if we work to develop resilience in our lives, we can bounce back, we can recover like this, this wonderful tree did. So resilience really has its beginnings um, um, a long time ago, many decades ago, with the work of a psychologist by the name of Norman Garmezi. And Dr. Garmezi was studying schizophrenia at the time. And he began to notice that some patients with schizophrenia could barely function, nearly bedridden, while others did much better and were able to, um, were able to contribute to society and live a fairly normal lives. So he saw this a very wide spectrum of impairment and symptoms. That got him studying uh, children whose parents had schizophrenia, and he found that many of those children demonstrated good functioning across multiple settings, um, irregardless of how impaired their parent might have been. And he started to refer to these children as invulnerables. Well, he continued to study children who showed positive adaptation to stressful situations and poverty and uh, developed this idea of protective factors. You've probably seen that in the literature um, for, you know, in a number of, of different studies and a uh, number of different things that are being examined. Um, but that was really the beginnings of resilience and these protective factors eventually evolved into the concept of resilience. And so that's that's kind of where we've come with resilience. And in the past few decades, of course, it's been something that's been studied uh, very, very extensively in a lot of different areas. Well, why talk about resilience today? What's the rationale for that? Well, if you look at a lot of the research in this area in healthcare professionals, uh, the statistics are fairly sobering. Uh, one study noted that 50% of NICU nurses report significant symptoms of secondary traumatic stress. 69% of nurses report feeling emotionally exhausted. 35% of NICU providers, both physicians, nurses, and practitioners, report severe PTSD symptoms. 16% of neonatologists indicate uh, significant compassion fatigue, 21% report symptoms of burnout. And then we have more community indicators as well. I, I put the suicide uh, statistic here and you may 
may wonder why I did that. Suicide in many ways can be seen as an indicator of low resilience. And it being the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, I think it it points to this idea of low resilience. You know, most people who die by suicide, they don't really want to die as much as they want to feel better. They want problems in their lives solved, but because of low resilience, they resolve that, that suicide is the, the only way out. Um, since COVID uh, started several years ago, we've seen major, major increases in mental health symptoms and decreases in indicators of resilience. So a couple of major national studies that, that have come to the same conclusion. Uh, resilience seems to be decreasing and mental health symptoms and difficulties managing those are increasing. <clears throat> so anything that uh, garners as much popular um, attention as something like resilience oftentimes has a number of myths associated with it. And it's no different with resilience. Let me share with you briefly just some of the myths that you'll hear about resilience. Now, important to note that these have all been refuted over and over again in the literature, but they tend to persist in popular culture regardless. The first myth is that resilience is an inherent, unmodifiable trait that you're either born with it or you're not. If you're born with it, good for you. If you're not, then that's just too bad. We have a lot of, of data to suggest otherwise, that resilience is a body of skills that can be learned, that can be improved upon. And so that, that's really the basis for this talk today, is that we can each become more resilient with effort and with time. The second myth is that resilience is nothing more than just good stress management. Now, resilience does incorporate stress management. That, that can be part of it, but it's much more than just managing stress. Um, it, it takes into account how we, how we live our lives, how we think, how we interact with the world around us. A third myth is that resilient people are just immune to stressors and adversity. adversity. These individuals just, just aren't affected by it. And that just isn't true either. Resilient people do not experience less difficulty in their lives. They're not resilient just because life goes better for them, um, but they are resilient because of how they approach those experiences and those events in their lives. Uh, another myth, resilience is just positive thinking. We may have, uh, found ourselves thinking that too. It's just thinking happy thoughts. Well, resilience again is much more than, than even how we think, but it, it's, a, it's a lifestyle in many ways. And then lastly, the myth that resilient people are just always happy and they don't have bad days. Uh, resilient people certainly have the same range of affect and um, emotional states that, that any of us have but they are um, using skills and doing things differently uh, that cause them to look as though they may be happier more of the time and seem to not have the difficulties that non-resilient people might have. Okay, well, what I'd like to do again is to teach you five things that resilient people do and give you some very practical ideas that you can use and, and start to do even today to become more resilient. So the first thing that we'll talk about that resilient people do is optimism. Resilient people are optimistic people. Now, if I were to ask you how you would define optimism, some of you may say, well, it's uh, happiness, it's being happy. Some may say that it's uh, being positive, it's a positive outlook. And those are certainly aspects of optimism, but optimistic people are really defined more in terms of realism and being realists in life. Optimistic people, they see things as they are. 
uh, not better than they are, but certainly not worse than they are either. And this is a really important distinction to make. Uh, we're not promoting optimism in terms of just thinking positively about everything and everyone. But what we're pr promoting really, what we want in our lives is more realism, to see things as they really are. Um, the data that we have uh, indicate that optimistic people, they live healthier, happier, longer lives. They have lower cardiovascular disease. They have lower rates of hypertension. And, and again, they have multiple years longer longevity than those that are described and defined as not optimistic. So a lot of reasons to pursue this for ourselves. There are some genetics to optimism. The, the data that we have suggests that about 20% of people are just born naturally with more of this than the rest of us, but the rest of us can certainly develop it more in our lives. And some, some data to suggest that this has dropped overall in the United States in the past few years, presumably partially due to the COVID pandemic. So how do we cultivate optimism? If it's such a great thing, how do we get more of it into our lives? How do we do this? First thing I want to suggest to you is that you begin to see things as temporary versus permanent in your life. Now, most of the things we experience in life, certainly most of the difficult things we experience are temporary. They're not permanent. And it, it, there's a very, very important distinction um, here with seeing things as, as temporary versus permanent. If we see things as permanent, we feel very, very differently about them. And the fact is, is that, again, most things are temporary. So one of the ways that we can do that is to avoid a couple of words, always and never. These are two permanent words, and they're rarely accurate. And so they can really get us into trouble and really prevent us from being as resilient as we, we could be. So listen to the, the, the difference between these, these statements. I'll always be sad versus I'm sad right now. That's very different, and it should feel very different as you think about those two. I never follow through with my goals versus I don't follow through with my goals when I'm not motivated. So a real difference in accuracy, a real difference in how we respond emotionally to those words and statements that contain those words. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, and that is that well, some things are permanent in life. Certainly disability, um, chronic illness, loss, those things um, are permanent in, in a very real way. But we can change how we feel about those things. The, the way we feel can be temporary. For the past year or so, I've been working with a, a wonderful family who lost their baby in the NICU after many, many months, the baby was never able to go home. And uh, as you can imagine, this family has just been racked with, with grief and with sadness over this loss. Um, and it's been interesting to, to work with them over that time and to see changes in how they're grieving, changes in how they're interacting with that loss and how they are um, approaching it in their own minds. There's been a real change. They, they still grieve very, very much over the loss of this baby, but the, the grief is different now than it was a year ago. And it feels more manageable to them. It feels like it's softened a little bit for them. And so even when things are permanent in our lives, we can change how we feel about them. And in that way, cultivate optimism. Okay, the second thing that resilient people do is that they focus on the right things. What we choose to focus on very much becomes our reality in life. Now, this is a picture of the view out of my office window. 
And depending on what part of this picture you focus on, you may feel very sorry for me, or you may be envious of me. So if you see at the, the bottom half of this picture, we have a very ugly, very worn out, pathetic looking building. But the top half of that picture is a beautiful sky and, and beautiful trees. And uh, I've noticed that what part of that view I choose to focus on creates a different feeling within me. My mood changes depending on what I'm looking at. If I focus on the, the beautiful changing sky and the trees and the different seasons, I feel more light and I feel more energized. If I focus on that building, I feel a little depressed. And so what we focus on really does matter. Now we're going to try an activity here, and hopefully this will work in the virtual setting. But I want you all to look around where you are and find all of the blue items in your surroundings, in the room you're in. Look around and look for everything that's blue, whatever shade that might be, all of the things that are blue. And once you've got that in mind, I want you to close your eyes and think about everything that was blue that you saw. Picture those blue items in your mind. Focus on what shade they were. Focus on the shape, perhaps. And now, with your eyes still closed, I want you to think about everything red in the room that you're in. Think about everything that's red around you. <clears throat> okay, you can open your eyes now. Now, most people have a difficult time thinking about anything that was red or any other color when they do that activity. Now, you saw everything. Your eyes took everything in as you were looking around the room. But because I instructed you to focus on one particular thing, one color in particular, then you really didn't see the rest of the room, unless it's a room you're very familiar with to begin with. Um, so what we focus on really does matter. There was a very, very fascinating study done in 1979 by Ellen Langer. She was a psychologist at Harvard, and this became known as a, a, her counterclockwise study. She took eight men in their 70s, and she brought them together and had them live in this immersive experience for a week as though it was 1959, 20 years earlier. Everything about that experience was 1959. The clothes that they wore, the decor in the house, the TV programs, the radio programs, the, the books, the uh, food that they ate, the activities they did, everything that they did was to mimic 1959. And they took a lot of different baseline assessments of health, cognitive factors, uh, physical factors. And it was very interesting after just one week when they repeated those assessments, they found that all of these things improved. Uh, measures of vision and manual dexterity improved. Uh, their memory improved, IQ, gait, posture, decreased symptoms of arthritis, all of these things improved after just one week of living in this, in this environment where, where they were much younger and, um, and in a much healthier state, presumably 20 years earlier. It was just absolutely fascinating. And in fact, they even showed before and after pictures of these men to individuals who weren't associated with the study. And they independently rated these, these eight men as looking younger after that one week than before they started the study. Now, we could, we could talk all day about uh, the implications of this and, and uh, the results that came out of it. But one thing that it, it does show us is that where we place our attention matters. What we focus on absolutely matters. 
Aaron Beck developed this uh, concept of selective abstraction. And it describes our, our tendency to focus on one detail, oftentimes taken out of context and ignoring other important details of an experience. And we do this all of the time. You know, imagine an, an example from, from your work in the hospital, focusing on perhaps the negative feedback from a family and then drawing conclusions about your abilities as a provider from that one piece of feedback, even though you may have received a lot of other feedback in the past about your abilities and, and, and much more positive feedback. Again, we have a tendency to focus in on one out of context um, um, detail and, and thereby having that affect our mood and our, our energy and our ability to move forward. So beware of that. Now, let me give you something to, to do here with, with focusing on the right thing. So one of the best things that we can focus on is gratitude in our lives. You know, gratitude is a choice about what we will focus on. And gratitude has consistently been shown to be associated with improved health, psychological, and social outcomes. People who express gratitude regularly are simply happier and healthier people. Um, and so one of the ways that we can incorporate this into our lives is through a, a simple gratitude journaling activity. And many of you may have heard of this before. It, it's gotten a lot of um, popular media attention, and I think for good reason. But it comes out of some really good research um, that that took people and, and placed them into three journaling categories. One group was instructed to, to journal about things that they were grateful for, for just a few minutes. Another group was instructed to journal about hassles that they had experienced that day. And a third group was to journal just about anything they wanted to. So they did this for nine weeks and found that relative to the other groups, the gratitude group um, felt better about their lives as a whole. They were more optimistic about expectations upcoming. Uh, they reported more energy. They reported fewer physical symptoms and reported exercising more. <clears throat> so the results were really encouraging and that's been replicated over and over again since. So the simple act of, of journaling things that we're grateful for can have a real uh, real impact in our lives because it, it draws our focus away and it draws us to things that are positive in our lives. So that's something that you can do again today. You don't have to journal. You can express it um, you know, with someone um, in your supportive network. Um, you can express that in many ways, uh, but find a way to express gratitude regularly. Another thing that resilient people do is that they process difficult emotions and events. And that may sound like something you don't want to do, and you're not alone if that's the case. We naturally want to avoid discussing and dealing with difficult things in our lives. But we have good research to suggest that there's benefit to releasing and being able to express those difficult feelings. <clears throat> James Pennebaker was a psychologist who, who really pioneered these expressive writing interventions for people who had experienced traumatic things in their lives. And he, he had them write about these um, adversities and difficulties for just 15 or 20 minutes over uh, several uh, different sessions and found that there were consistent benefits on measures of health and well-being. And so there, there seems to be something about um, this kind of more formal expression and uh, processing of difficult things that happen in our lives. <clears throat> one of the things that, one of the interventions that is most effective with individuals who have experienced traumatic events in their lives is to have them produce a, a trauma narrative. 
And that's just a, a very detailed uh, narrative um, experience about what they've what they've gone through. And one of the one of the reasons why this sort of thing can be helpful is it helps us to organize difficult events in our lives. When we go through traumatic and challenging things, they can be fairly complex uh, experiences and have a lot of layers to them. And if we if we simply think about them, it can be difficult to organize them and to really identify inaccuracies that naturally come up uh, in these kinds of situations. And so writing about them, it, it provide, creating a narrative for yourself helps you to organize it more, more concretely and helps you to identify inaccuracies that, that might have been there that you can then deal with. So there's a lot of good reasons to find a way to do this. And again, there's different ways to do it. It doesn't have to be exactly as outlined here, but resilient people have a way to process difficult emotions and events in their lives. Another thing that resilient people do consistently is they connect with others. We are social creatures and we do better when we're connected with others. Socially connected people are just healthier and happier. And there's a lot of ample research that uh, demonstrates this as well. And it's interesting because the, the benefits seem to be there even for just one supportive person. We don't have to have 35 people in our friend group or our, our supportive network to um, enjoy the benefits of social connections. And in fact, the, the benefits even extend to other living things. So for those of you who are dog lovers or cat lovers, animal lovers, uh, the benefits of connecting with an animal are very significant as well. And in fact, they've done some research on connecting with plants, which is really interesting. So it seems as though connecting with any living thing provides some of these benefits when we're connected with another living thing that helps us to be healthy, healthier and happier. I love this statement, a burden shared is a burden divided. Now that's a statement that a, an Amish father made whose da little young daughter was brutally shot and killed in 2006. If you remember that, that horrific school shooting that happened in Pennsylvania in the little Amish schoolhouse um, where a gunman came in and, and killed, I think, six or seven young children, wounded others in addition to, to adults. This is a, a statement that one of those fathers made 10 years after that happened in 2016, reflecting back on that experience. A burden shared is a burden divided. That community really came together in, in beautiful ways to support one another and 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 shared a lot about the, the the benefits of that community feeling and that community support that they had. One of the things that we've done for many years here at KU and our NICU <clears throat> is to have monthly staff support sessions. These are sessions we hold. We hold one for a day shift and one for night shift separately. And there are times that we can just come together. We have topics that we um, we review and learn about. Uh, we review difficult cases. We consult together uh, and, and just talk about anything that is really on anyone's mind. And these have been really wonderful times for us as staff to come together and support one another. And I've had a lot of you know, very positive feedback over the years about how, how much of a difference that makes for people to know that that's going to happen. So there's consistency, there's predictability, and to just know that people are there to support one another. And it's interesting, you know, people don't even have to share to benefit from that feeling of support. Um, just being, being there and knowing that people are available um, seem, seems to convey some of the benefits of that. Okay. 
The last thing I think that I'd like to share with you today that resilient people do is to be present. Resilient people are present in their lives. You know, we can get lost in the future and sucked away into the past so very, very easily. And resilient people just don't do that. They're able to stay in the present. I love this poem by, by Henry Van Dyke. It's inscribed on a sundial at Wells College. It says, the shadow by my finger cast divides the future from the past. Before it sleeps the unborn hour in darkness and beyond thy power. Behind its unreturning line, the vanished hour, no longer thine. One hour alone is in thy hands, the now on which the shadow stands. That's a really powerful concept. You know, we spend so much emotional capital on fretting about the future and being stuck in the past. And being present allows us to be, to be free from those restrictions, from worrying about those things. I was just recently with an individual who wanted me to go to court with her to be a supportive person. And this is someone who had been um, been through a, a lot of difficulty in her life and had experienced a lot of trauma. And the, the court hearing was, was part of dealing with that trauma in different ways. Anyway, I was there just as a support and uh, just off to the side. And I, I I saw that that there was a lot of good things happening in this court hearing for this individual. A lot of things were going her way. The judge was really sympathetic you know, to her. She was very supportive of her. And I just thought, boy, this is going great. You know, this is there's a lot to celebrate here. Well, the court hearing ended and I walked out with this individual and I was very surprised to hear her. Um, start talking about everything she was worried about in the future, the future court dates and how those might go. She was still talking about the traumatic things that had happened in her past. And, and it was interesting because she really wasn't able to enjoy that present moment of, of so much success. She had allowed herself to get drawn away into both the present, into the future and the past, and she'd been robbed of um, some great things that were going on in the present. And I see this so often in families in the NICU that I work with. So often they are waiting for that next thing to happen. I can't wait until my baby starts taking PO feeds. I can't wait till my baby comes off oxygen. I can't wait until we go home, which is obviously a, a major milestone that they're waiting for. And those are all good things. Those are all good goals that, that have to happen. Um, but what I see too too often are these parents who who can't enjoy the moment because they're so concerned and and involved in the future. Um, and so we work a lot on enjoying the beautiful moments that they have with their baby in the NICU. These beautiful moments, these quiet moments, where it's just the baby and the parent. And where a lot of other other obligations are are sometimes not uh, not a consideration. So we need to learn to be present more than we are. One way that we can do this is by practicing mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is not a new idea. It's been practiced for thousands of years in the East, um, mostly for spiritual and religious reasons. It has a real religious tone to it in the East. Um, but more recently here in the West, it's caught on and has become somewhat of a cultural phenomenon. So we see a lot of apps. We see a lot of uh, programs and a lot of things in popular culture about mindfulness. But mindfulness is really nothing more than paying attention to the present moment in a non-judgmental way. So we're not labeling things. We're not, we're not judging things. Um, we're, we're really trying to stay in the moment in a non-judgmental way and just embracing what the moment is for what it is. And there's emerging research in this area that, 
it's really consistently showing a lot of benefits to psychological, physical health. Uh, there's studies looking at improved work performance. There's actually quite a bit of, of research coming out in the nursing area showing uh, reduced stress and anxiety, reduced burnout for, for nurses who practice mindfulness regularly. And I'm pleased to, to see that mindfulness training is even starting to make its way into nurse education. So these are all you know, very positive things. I think it, it, it's an indication of how helpful it is and, and can be in our lives. So you can practice mindfulness really day to day in very, um, very routine situations. Uh, as you wash the dishes or as you take a walk or as you eat a snack, all of those um, all of those situations lend themselves to a, a mindful approach. And what I mean by a mindful approach is really focusing on all of the sensory input that you're experiencing. So as you eat a snack, you're focused on certainly what you taste. You're focused on what you smell as you eat the food. You're focused on what that feels like as you chew and, and swallow. Um, you're focused on what your jaw feels like and, and everything that goes along with that. So it's an easy way to really ground yourself in the moment, in the present, um, in just everyday tasks. So find ways to be more mindful. I would wanted to uh, do some practice with you. But I don't think we'll do that. I don't think we have time. But I would encourage you to to look up some resources on your own and and uh, try to do some some mindfulness exercises. And I think you'll be surprised how how uh, calming it is and how how empowering it is. So we won't practice today, but maybe another time. So let let me just summarize these different areas that we've gone over today and the things that you can do today to be more resilient. One is to cultivate a sense of optimism in your life. The way of doing that is to, is to recognize that most things are temporary in our lives and not permanent. And by using um, the right words for events that happen and avoiding the words always and never. We talked about focusing on the right things. One way of doing that is by expressing gratitude regularly. We talked about processing difficult emotions and events. Again, one way of doing that is to write about what's bothering you and to give that some expression. Um, a fourth way is to connect with others. And we talked about how important it is to connect with even one person regularly in a meaningful way. And then lastly, to be present in a way of doing that is, is to practice mindfulness. So I hope these have been helpful. I really wanted to give you some, some concrete things to do um, and to work on it in your quest to become more resilient. And I hope that you'll share these with others as well. These are just uh, some of the resiliency resources that you can access. Uh, there's a lot out there. There's a lot of varied resources. So find what speaks to you. Find what's most helpful for you. There are great books that describe a lot of this. Um, there are institutional wellness programs. Most, most uh, institutions uh, have a wellness program associated with them. If you don't have one, uh, maybe that's something that you could advocate for. <clears throat> Turning Point is a great resource here in the Kansas City area that has a lot of resilience um, training and education that they provide for free. Uh, there are assessment measures that you can use to assess your own resilience and a lot of great resilience podcasts and, uh, and videos and trainings like that. So a, a lot of ways to continue learning about resilience and increasing that in your life. So again, my hope is that this is helpful, not just at work, 
but also at home, because those two things are, are very much intertwined and uh, one affects the other very significantly. Um, so I just want to stress to how important it is that we take care of each other and we take care of ourselves. Um, you are each really valuable resources to your own programs and your own units. And uh, it's, it's incumbent upon us to take care of ourselves, to preserve ourselves so that we have more to give. When we're burned out, when we're not resilient, we have less to give. And so, and that doesn't feel very satisfactory. So I hope we'll all continue on our journey of, of greater resiliency. So I appreciate everyone's attention. And I think at some point we will have some time for questions and I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Dr. Lawson, thank you so much. That is a very timely topic and welcome here uh, with us at uh, Overland Park Regional. Thank you very much, Dr. Stapley. Uh, How's the weather all the way over there in Kansas City, Kansas? <laughs> it's sunny and beautiful. <laughs> it's in the window. <laughs> yeah, you've got a window. We don't. <laughs> um, I set my blinds. It's so sunny. Um, uh, again, listening to your talk, I've, I've got some questions up here you know, from people online and people in the audience. Um, a lot of them are about responding to things that happen in the NICU. But before I get there... It sounds like the theme of your talk and your advice is less reactionary and more preparatory. Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good way to put it, I think. Uh, you know, we, we tend to live very passive lives and passivity really isn't a happy or satisfying way to live. So I think, yeah, one, one theme to this surely is an intentional way of living of really um, assessing our lives, being aware of the things that we struggle with and, and going out and, and securing those things for ourselves, whether that be increased support institutionally or um, more individually. So yeah, there's, there's a lot about this that, that has intentionality with it. Um. You mentioned, you know, as a means of of, of um, coping and, and dealing with, with trauma and stress, um, journaling, um, writing out, uh, and and connecting with other living creatures. Um, that you know historically has been done on a personal nature or you know in a, in a journal, privately. Uh, we have the benefit now of phenomenon of social media becoming the platform that a lot of people journal on or express themselves and connect with others. Can you comment on the health of that? That's a great point. Um, so there's clearly a difference in kind of journaling that uh, is a private experience for an individual versus that which is going to be broadcast to the world in different ways. <clears throat> and we find people obviously um, changing their approach based on, you know, how it's going to be viewed, if at all. And so I think, you know, really the benefit to this kind of intervention is more at the personal level in a more private setting uh, where it's not going to be posted, it's not going to be uh, broadcast to others. I think there there could be value to that as well, but it, it's just a very different experience, um, especially as you're uh, expressing you know very intimate, sensitive, personal kinds of emotions and experiences. So I think we do need to make that distinction. Uh, both can be helpful, but really what I'm talking about, what the research has really been clearest about are those interventions that are more private in nature. You know, I think in terms of connecting with others, there's a lot of benefits to um, connecting via social media platforms and things like that. You know, we, we have gotten some mixed data on the, the, the benefit of those, and it seems like there's a dose response to social media, meaning that 
um, those who spend the most time in social media tend to have worse outcomes. So th there, there needs to be a balance in there. I'm not sure that, that there's a textbook answer for everyone, but it does seem like there's, there's a, a certain amount of that that can be really beneficial, that can really open up our social networks, but too much of that seems to impair our, our mo emotional and mental health as well. When dealing, and again, this is a big part of what we do, is, is trauma and, and dealing with a, a trauma that's <clears throat> happened to a family in the NICU. Um, what would you suggest that we can help dealing with a family to help them focus on the, I guess, the less negatives versus I, it's relative because there could be horrible, catastrophic things, but recognizing the the negative, but helping them focus on on the more positive aspects thing. Yeah, well, we were just talking about this in our staff support uh, session in our NICU last night. Um, some of the earliest and easiest things that we can do as staff when we encounter this in families that we're working with is to really validate how they're feeling and to listen to them. You know, and we can all do that. We can all validate, we can all listen. We don't need special training to do that. And those tend to be some of the most powerful things that we can do for individuals. Um, so oftentimes they just don't feel listened to, they don't feel heard, they don't feel validated. And so when we can take a few minutes and spend that time just acknowledging what their situation is that can be really powerful. And I would offer this caution too, that sometimes in healthcare, we want to be fixers. We want to fix everything. That's what we are trained to do. We go in and we fix. Well, you don't fix trauma. I don't fix trauma and you don't fix trauma. Uh, we support individuals, we teach them, we engage them in appropriate resources and interventions but we don't fix that. And so we have to approach that, I think, with the right mindset. That yes, we can listen, we can validate, we can point people in the direction of interventions and professionals who can help, but we, we need to be careful that we don't put an unrealistic burden on ourselves um, to do more than we actually can. And so, but, but any of these suggestions are, are great to pass along to families. Um, and in the context of trauma interventions, they all play a role uh, because uh, trauma interventions in so many ways is resilience building. It's not only processing what happened and, and working through the grief and the difficulty of that, but it's also building resilience to manage what's to come and reminders of what has happened. So. Uh, it's just some ideas on, on things specifically we can do to support these families. Um, this next question I probably should have asked for some clarification on, but um, the person asking is pointing out that the work environment for providers at all levels um, in the NICU has changed. Um, the acuity of our patients has increased. Uh, the limits of viability have decreased. Um, there's a difference in how parents and the public interact with the medical team. Um, I think they're asking how, you know, the, the current work model that exists is based on a different era. Um, how do we change our well, that's a pretty broad question, but how do we adapt our current work model to meet the changing in, in our, our work environment? Uh, boy, that is, it's a, it's a biggie. Um, I'm not sure how to yeah. approach that. Um, other than listen to your talk all over again and apply well, all of the... Yeah, I think, that, I think they're absolutely great observations, by the way. And I, I hear this a lot in our unit as well. A lot of 
uh, some grumbling and uh, a lot of you know frustration with some of these changes that have happened. Uh, I, I, I do think that uh, you know focusing on resilience, focusing on um, you know supporting the me mental health and the 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 journey of the NICU for families uh, can be very, very helpful. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of good things in how, how we've adapted over time. And uh, so I think it's, it's important to appreciate that too. These, these are changes, but, but some of them I think are very good and in, in family's best interest. So uh, again, hopefully the suggestions I made today will be helpful in that regard as well. Um, has you know, another one I probably should have gotten some clarification on, but um, has you know our our and and it's necessary our our adherence to HIPAA limitations interfered with our ability to cope with um, some of the trauma we ex we experience at work. I think I know part of what's being asked, and, and I, I get this question a lot, which is trying to get support for an experience that can be very emotionally lonesome, meaning that it's hard to find people with a shared experience that you can connect with and receive support from. So a very common question is, you know, I go home and my partner, my spouse, my family member, uh, I try to talk to them about this stuff, but they just don't get it, and uh, and they will never get it. They're they're uh, in finance. They're not going to understand the complexities of healthcare. Certainly not the trauma of the NICU and what I experience. So you know, one way that we talk about this is is in terms of teaching other people what we need. We don't do enough of that. We don't teach other people how to support us. We assume that they're going to know. We assume that they're just going to be able to get it and, and give us what we need. Well, I don't think that's true. And so we, we need to spend time with each other, teaching one another what we need and, and how to support us. So I, I think that that's helpful. I do think there's value in um, sharing experiences, but in a way that doesn't compromise uh, you know, HIPAA-related uh, details. Um, a, lot of these, a lot of these things that we experience don't require us to disclose any personal information about families, but can be talked about in broad terms. Um, but but it, it speaks too to the importance of, of uh, the social support and connections in our units, because those tend to be a primary source of support because those are people that get it. Those are people who live in the same world that we live in. And so it's so important that we find regular, consistent time to come together not just uh, kind of the, the cross talk that happens in the hallway in between, you know, hands on and you know, things like that, but that we really find um, structured time to do that as a, as a group. And uh, again, our experience at KU doing that has been just phenomenal. And it's really unified us. It's really brought us together. And uh, it's something now that the new faculty members just expect and, and benefit from. So I think that there's there's real value in pursuing things like that. Um, I guess the corporate word, if it happens right after an event, would be a debriefing. Um, and I think that's a tool that, that maybe we should utilize more. Um, but you're also speaking about regular, uh, a regular meeting or a regular activity where it goes beyond just the debriefing after an event. Right, I think both are incredibly important. Um, but I think if I had to choose one, I would choose the regular, you know, for, for us it's a monthly staff support session where um, I, I facilitate a discussion both for day shift and night shift. Everybody's invited, nobody has to speak. We're just there to chat about certain topics, difficult cases. And uh, we can really just be there for each other and support each other um, in a consistent, predictable, structured way. Um, so, yeah, I, I think 
finding someone with a passion to do that can be a good start. Uh, they don't take a lot of time. They don't take a lot of resources. Um, but, but knowing that those are available can go a long way in, uh, in supporting one another. Okay, I saved the best question for last. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we are a, uh, here at Overland Park Regional. Um, we are a community-based hospital, community-based NICU. Um, how do we get our hands on a psychologist <laughs> uh, for, uh, I mean, for our NICU, I mean, it, initially for the parents and families, um, but maybe also for the staff? Uh, we do have two full-time social workers for just the NICU, um, but their burden is particularly heavy. Um, I'd love to get our hands on a psychologist. Well, psychologists are cheap, so... Uh, <laughs> no, I, I think th there's certainly a growing trend in this area. You know, when I first started doing this and kind of did some foundational work around uh, training and... Um, competencies and education, things like that. There were relatively few of us doing this work in NICUs. This would have been kind of earlier 2000s, but um, now we're starting to see uh, postdoctoral fellowships and internships pop up that are NICU specific for psychologists. And so I think uh, as a field, we're seeing more of these come out of, out of uh, their training, ready to, to work in NICUs. Um, most states have, have a, a, at least a few dedicated psychologists in the NICU. Um, so I think I uh, would love to have conversations with anyone who's, who's interested because I have done, I, I talk with a lot of psychologists around the country who are trying to get positions in their hospitals. And so knowing how to, how to uh, um, navigate administration and and advocate for those, I think, uh, is really important. Um, also, keep in mind that uh, a lot of these positions start as part-time. You know, we usually don't start as full-time uh, NICU psychologists, but perhaps we were able to uh, use uh, you know, point two of a psychologist FTE to, to get, get in there and, and start to make a difference. And then you start to build momentum and you start to see the benefit of that individual and, and then that can build um, some momentum to hire someone on full time. I will say too that our social workers are vastly underutilized. Uh, they have great clinical skills and uh, they can add a lot to, to these areas in a, in a NICU. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, they do get drawn away to a, to a great extent into case management and liaison types of work. Um, but perhaps repositioning um, some of their time or hiring a, a social worker specifically for uh, mental health reasons can be a benefit. Anyway, I could go on for about an hour about uh, you know what, what to look for and, and kind of how to talk to hospital administration about this. Um, but I think we're seeing, I guess the bottom line is we're seeing an upsurge in this. We're seeing increased acceptability of having NICUs that have dedicated psychologists. In 2015, myself and some colleagues wrote uh, practice standards for psychologists in NICUs uh, that can be used as some, some background and um, some, uh, you know, statistics on what, what is needed for different sizes of NICUs. So anyway, it's, it's a fight worth having because uh, I think you know, we can just add a lot to both staff and family functioning. Well, our, our chief nursing officer over women's and children's is here in this room. Um, you're going to be hearing from her. <laughs> I look forward to it. What's her name? Mary Bianchi. Of course, she's retiring soon, but... Uh, okay, I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from you, Mary. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, Dr. Lawson, thanks again. Um, again, You're like welcome. I said, this is a very timely talk. Um, we are all all feeling it um, as, as we are in kind of an historic time. 
and we're all feeling the pressure. So thanks for taking the time to present to us. Thank um, you. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Okay, we've got a 15 minute break uh, ish till 3.30. Um, we'll come back for our, our final speaker. Let me remind you again, uh, please sign in. Um, you can scan the code or email Amy. Um, so you, to make sure you get credit for, uh, for being here. All right, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Better after all. And stay with my love It's understood It's in the hands of my love And my love does it Find something there with my love It's understood It's everywhere with my love And my love does it good
Circumstance gives beauty unrefined. I could have said what's in my head. The choice was yours, I know. But I just cannot remember why I let you go. Touch those bright blue eyes that mesmerize like I've had too much. I can't complain, it's all in vain. Oh, the choice was yours. I know, but I just cannot remember why I let you go. Why I let you go.
Welcome back. We are here for our final speaker, um, Dr. Britton Zuccarelli. She is a practicing uh, child neurologist who has currently set up shop in Salina, Kansas. Uh, she's on faculty with the University of Kansas. Um, she's actually pretty uh, modest, and she didn't give us a lot of exciting bio things to, to say about her, but I will say this. Our uh, one of our pediatric neurologists here, um, who in my opinion is typically the smartest guy in the room, refers to Dr. Zuccarelli as the smartest person in the room. So we are excited to have her speak to us today. Um, she's talking to us about to cool or not to cool therapeutic hypothermia controversies. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Britton Zuccarelli. I'm a child neurologist from Salina, Kansas, where I serve on the faculty at KU. And today we'll be talking about therapeutic hypothermia in high-risk neonates. And the question is to cool or not to cool? Let's get started. I hope by the end of our time together, you will be able to immediately recognize which babies are appropriate candidates for therapeutic hypothermia and you'll feel confident in implementing treatment strategies in accordance with the nationally published guidelines. Here are some disclosures I need to share with you, but none of these are relevant to the content that we'll be going over today. Here's an outline of what we're gonna cover together. First, we'll talk about what therapeutic hypothermia is and the history of its development. Then we'll identify which babies are considered appropriate candidates for this treatment modality using evidence-based protocols. We'll then focus on the role of the neonatologist caring for these babies during the cooling period, the pediatric neurologist, should your institution have one, and the family. Then we'll discuss long-term outcomes of babies with hypoxic ischemic injury at birth treated with therapeutic hypothermia versus those who weren't and identify some prevention strategies for having to do this at all. Lastly, and this is where the controversies come in, we'll discuss new treatments that are on the horizon for the management of these babies. So what is therapeutic hypothermia? Well, first I have to talk about hypoxic ischemic injury. This is a significant cause of infant mortality in the United States and worldwide and responsible for severe neurodevelopmental disabilities in up to 60% of cases. It's fairly common, occurring in three out of 1,000 live births in the United States. And really the pathophysiological process has two phases. There's a primary neuronal cell death secondary to the cellular hypoxia that occurs. And there's delayed neuronal death because of free radical generation, the cytotoxic actions of the microglial support cells, mitochondrial energy failure, and the generation of nitric oxide. There's this very delicate, precious window of opportunity to intervene with a latency period between those two of about six hours. And we have the opportunity to modify those cells that are tagged for our early cell death by reducing the metabolic rate of the brain and the rest of the body. Here's a graphic that um, was taken out of the MELPRO study, which I'll talk about later, demonstrating how over the course of minutes to hours in that primary energy failure phase, excitotoxicity and oxidative stress leads to dysregulated inflammation of the neonatal brain. And later in that latent phase that, evol phase that evolves over hours to days, the mitochondria begin to dysfunction and then there can be epigenetic changes um, months to years later, resulting in impaired neuroregeneration and repair. What are the causes of hypoxic ischemic injury? Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes there are cord-related issues, so perhaps an umbilical cord prolapse or a nuchal cord. There can be uterus-related issues like a uterine rupture or placental abruption. Maternal issues like peripartum hypotension or maternal hemorrhage can affect the oxygen delivery to baby's brain. An amniotic fluid embolism, any maternal trauma or cardiopulmonary arrest certainly can affect the blood flow to the baby's brain. Infant issues or fetal issues like breech presentation increase the risk of hypoxic ischemic injury, as do cephalopelvic disproportion and prolonged labor. 
All of these really result in a failure to appropriately deliver oxygen and blood flow to the fetal brain. So what is the history behind this treatment modality? In the three and four hundreds BC, the Greek physician Hippocrates observed that newborns left to the elements in the winter season tended to do fairer than the babies born in summer. And in the first hundred years AD, Egyptians, Romans, and Greeks made the observation that battle-inflicted trauma victims tended to do better in the winter months compared to the summer months. In the 1800s, the French physiologists Claude Bernard and William Edwards studied asphyxiated cats and the benefit of therapeutic hypothermia. Some further animal trials were pursued in the 1950s using guinea pigs, and ultimately in the 1960s, metabolic suppression was identified as being the way by which this treatment helps. There were some small uncontrolled studies in the 1950s and 60s in the United States. Uh, one is outlined here in which infants who were not breathing after five minutes were immersed in ice cold water until respiration spontaneously began. And then they were rewarmed over a course of several hours. Some were treated with transfusion, others not. And the observation in an uncontrolled way was that these babies tended to do better. In 1972, uh, we had the first publication of over 200 asphyxiated newborns who showed better outcomes when uh, um, susceptible to therapeutic hypothermia. And then between 19, 1988 and 2002, there were a few small controlled trials that demonstrated little harm and feasibility for this treatment modality. In 2013, there was a Cochrane meta-analysis looking at 1,500 babies uh, who underwent therapeutic hypothermia for presumed hypoxia at birth with promising results. So who are appropriate newborns for therapeutic hypothermia? The three criteria are listed here. So first is that these are term or late preterm babies who have at least one of the following uh, accompanying features as shown. So uh, persistent low APGAR, less than five at 10 minutes of life, the need for ongoing positive pressure ventilation at 10 minutes of life, an umbilical cord or arterial pH demonstrating acidosis within an hour of life, or a base deficit uh, in the cord or arterial blood within that same time period. Criteria two features a neurological examination using the SARNET exam score, which we'll go over on the next slide. And then the third criteria is electrophysiological assessment by at least amplitude integrated EEG, ideally within 20 minutes. So the possible um, qualifiers would be a normal background, but with electro electrical seizure activity apparent, a moderately abnormal background or burst suppression, background suppression, uh, and continuous seizure activity. Here's a picture of Dr. Harvey Sarnat. Uh, he was the recipient of the 2016 Bernard Sachs Award at the Child Neurology Society meeting, so I got to see that, which was exciting. Uh, he and his wife put together these three stages of neurological dysfunction um, by which a baby could be evaluated and uh, considered for therapeutic hypothermia. So. Stage one is a newborn who appears hyper alert with either normal or increased tone and madriasis. For stage two or stage three, these babies are going to be lethargic or stuporous with either low or flaccid tone, either hypo or hyperreflexic with weak or absent primitive reflexes, um, pupillary changes, so either meiosis or madriasis, bradycardia periodic breathing or apnea or seizures on examination. There are some contraindications for therapeutic hypothermia protocols as we know them now. This is reserved for term and late preterm babies who are large enough. So a birth weight less than 1800 grams would be uh, an exclusion criteria. These infants are um, are young and, and we typically treat them who are less than six hours old. Uh, if there are life-threatening heart or lung problems, then they're not a good candidate for this intervention as this is going to reduce metabolism. A, a significant chromosomopathy or when death otherwise appears inevitable, um, a therapeutic hypothermia is probably not the best route to go. 
um, life-threatening coagulopathies or significant active bleeding from perhaps head trauma, skull fracture, or a major intracranial hemorrhage would be a contraindication as well. Um, and then there are some relative contraindications listed in perforated anus and, and persistent pulmonary hypertension. So what equipment do you need to begin cooling? Certainly a cooling device. And then some way to accurately and continuously measure temperature. So whether an esophageal or rectal temperature probe is used, um, you need to keep an eye on the induction and rewarming phase. An overhead warming bed like a radiant warmer is used to help monitor the body temperature and adjust it when needed. The baby needs to be on continuous cardiorespiratory monitoring, including electrocardiogram, and an amplitude integrated EEG at bedside to monitor background electricity and for seizures. To prepare a newborn for therapeutic hypothermia, you first, as always, need to secure the airway and also vascular access with a central line being preferred. Other monitors, including pulse oximetry, are applied and a baseline neurological examination is performed along with baseline laboratory studies that are shown here. You also have to have an accurate way to measure intake and output. There are several methods to perform therapeutic hypothermia, and we'll go through two here. So the first is selective head cooling. This uses a device to circulate cold water around the head itself to thereby decrease core body temperature with a target of 34 to 35 degrees. The scalp has to be inspected at least every 12 hours to make sure there's no sign of skin breakdown as these babies are at an increased risk of sepsis from their pro-inflammatory state. A disadvantage here is you cannot apply a conventional electroencephalogram to monitor more closely for seizures. And also the selective head cooling really cools the cortical structures well, but not the deep brain structures where babies are more at risk for hypoxic ischemic injury. So whole body cooling is preferred. This uses a blanket that circulates cold water for uniform whole body cooling with a target temperature of 33 to 34 degrees Celsius. Once the cooling pathway is pursued, the duration is typically for 72 hours with a rewarming period to follow at a rate of no faster than 0.5 degrees Celsius per hour, followed by a passive rewarming phase for four to six more hours thereafter. Passive cooling can begin by simply turning off the warmer or the incubator, removing any clothing, hats, or blankets on baby, and then measuring the temperature. There are complications that can occur during the cooling process. From a cardiovascular standpoint, sinus bradycardia is common, as is hypotension, and this may need to be treated with vasoactive support. QT prolongation and cardiac arrhythmias can also occur. From a respiratory standpoint, decreased oxygen delivery to the rest of the tissues is something important to monitor for, and decreased respiratory drive from medications that might be used for sedation, pain management, or seizure management. Metabolic derangements can occur as uh, kidney function changes, so sodium, potassium, magnesium, and phosphate are particular electrolytes to keep an eye on. Coagulopathy can occur as well, especially if there is evidence of liver injury from the hypoxia, um, so platelet dysfunction and increased risk of bleeding can occur. As I mentioned before, these babies are at an increased risk for sepsis. They can also have delayed gastric emptying and altered pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics of commonly used medications. Neurologically, seizures can occur not so much because of the cooling itself, but the reason they're being cooled, so hypoxic ischemic injury to the brain, and pain management uh, can be difficult during cooling as well. What about during rewarming? So sometimes seizures can occur during this phase because of increased cerebral metabolic rate, especially if the rewarming isn't carefully monitored and controlled. Apnea and hypotension are also important to watch for during this period. Here is one clinical practice guideline about how to pursue therapeutic hypothermia. You can see a baby who's term or late preterm and is presenting less than six hours after birth with the probable intrapartum hypoxia. Uh, using the criteria we went over before, if you decide that they are a candidate, then you would start active cooling and aim for a core body temperature at 34 degrees 
And then if that temperature deviates, you can rewarm or, or further cool baby to keep at goal. The core body temperature should be monitored continuously, keeping the target there at 34 degrees. Um, this just shows some other strategies about how you can improve or reduce active cooling measures, especially if the uh, oxygen level is not appropriate. So if there's persistent hypoxemia on a 100% oxygen, for instance, you would stop cooling. Certainly if in a life-threatening coagulopathy or arrhythmia develops, um, then you would probably need to stop cooling as well. But if all is going well, you cool for 72 hours and then begin the rewarming process. Here is a way you can keep an eye on all of the parameters shown in the left column. So continuous vital sign monitoring, checking them every 15 minutes for the first four hours and then every after every hour thereafter. Um, and then if um, an AEEG can be applied immediately, that's preferred as well as a conventional uh, electroencephalogram with someone who can read them. Um, coagulation profile should be done at least a couple times that first day and then daily along with a complete blood count with differential and electrolyte profile which can certainly be done more often if clinically indicated. LFTs should be monitored and also um, uh, checking for hyperbilirubinemia, which is common in, in all neonates. Um, and then blood gases should certainly be checked at the direction of the clinician, especially if there's any respiratory compromise. So what is the specific role of the neonatologist in the management of uh, hypoxic ischemic injury and therapeutic hypothermia? So treating cold stress is your job using uh, morphine or other sedatives, and you have to monitor closely for either inadequate or supra-therapeutic sedation. Um, neonatologists are actually perhaps more trained than pediatric neurologists to read amplitude integrated EEG, so establishing that and keeping an eye on it. We'll go over that in the coming slides. A brain MRI should be obtained after rewarming at four to seven days of life, and that's a precious window as well, because if you wait too long, you lose the opportunity to capture the diffusion weighted imaging findings that you can see in hypoxia. Of course, the neonatologist is responsible for mon monitoring and, and managing all other organ systems while the brain is being cooled and counseling the family along the way about what to expect during this process and beyond. Here is a picture of an amplitude integrated AEEG. Um, so down at the bottom, it's showing um, so a, a prolonged time lapse and then uh, where the red vertical bar is um, that specific point in time showing some rhythmic discharges. Then you can see in the next middle um, some repetitive seizures that have occurred with a clear change from baseline. And then if you click on one in particular, you can see the rhythmic discharges. And then certainly status epilepticus with a continuous seizure that lasts more than um, a set period of time can be captured as well. This is a single channel electroencephalogram that's processed, filtered, and time compressed. So the advantages are that you can monitor many hours at once in one screen, uh, looking at background cerebral activity um, and, and changes over time. You can use it to diagnose and treat seizures as well. Um, uh, some cautions though about amplitude integrated EEG is that um, there are quite a few artifacts that will appear and they can look indeed quite rhythmic. So padding of the baby, there's no video component to this to let you know exactly what was going on. Um, if the single electrodes are placed over, um, for instance, a blood vessel near the, the scalp and you start to get pulse artifacts, that can look very, very rhythmic as well. But in general, conventional EEG and AEEG match in terms of background classification an AEEG is certainly much easier to apply um, and really actually interpret compared to a conventional EEG. Um, the cost is a consideration. So um, you have to purchase the equipment to do an AEEG, but um, there's no additional charge for looking at it. Whereas a continuous conventional electroencephalogram uh, is applied by a technician, monitored by that technician, and then interpreted by a separate physician for those full 72 hours. Uh, still, conventional EEEG remains the gold standard in the evaluation of these infants with hypoxic ischemic injury. So what is the role of the pediatric neurologist if your institution has one? 
Certainly frequent neurological assessment is helpful. Uh, correlating the conventional EEG findings with examination and the AEEG and the response to treatment for seizures. Counseling the family is an important role as well and providing long-term neurodevelopmental follow-up in conjunction with a developmental or behavioral pediatrician if one is available is important as well. Treatment of seizures, I'll discuss briefly here. So you will see institution preferences, but on the whole, phenobarbital is still agreed upon as the standard first line uh, intervention for neonatal seizures, honestly, really of any cause, but certainly for hypoxic ischemic injury with a standard loading dose of 20 milligrams per kilogram, followed by a maintenance dose, if indicated, of four to six milligrams per kilogram per day with a goal level somewhere between 40 and 60 micrograms per milliliter has quite the long half-life. Um, and the NeoLev2 trial, which was looking at the use of levetiracetam in neonates, showed that oftentimes complete seizure freedom, so no seizures for 24 hours after the first loading dose uh, was administered, is much more likely to occur with phenobarbital than Keppra. But I do see many institutions moving towards levetiracetam first at a dose of 20 milligrams per kilogram, and it can be reloaded and started at maintenance of 20 milligrams per kilogram per day. For refractory seizures, additional medications used include phenytoin or phosphenytoin, midazolam by continuous infusion or lidocaine, and additional tertiary treatments are really institution specific. What about prognosis? So prior to these interventions and hypothermia being considered the standard of care, we know these newborns were at an increased risk for cerebral palsy, cognitive impairment, and mood and behavioral issues long-term. There are some MRI prediction tools that you can use. Um, if there is especially injury to the posterior limb of the internal capsule or the basal ganglia thalamic structures, that increases a baby's risk for future cerebral palsy but there is little evidence really that the prognostic value is altered by hypothermia or not. I will say anecdotally, um, and I'm sure some of my pediatric neurology colleagues, if you're out there listening, can, can attest to this as well, that sometimes the picture doesn't match and you will have a child who had a really challenging NICU course and their MRI looks rather complicated and um, intimidating, but then you see the child in follow-up and developmentally, they're doing quite well. And Alternatively, sometimes you have babies who have experienced hypoxic ischemic injury and undergone hypothermia and had a hard time with seizures and their MRIs look fine and then their development is impaired and seizures remain difficult to treat. So, so sometimes it doesn't correlate. So what about long-term outcomes? The NICHD trial, so the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development trial looked at outcomes at six to seven years in terms of cognitive function and motor function. Some of the uh, positive or negative, however you look at it, but the highest correlators were uh, the 10 minute APGAR score. So a lower score at 10 minutes um, correlated with a worse outcome as well as temperature profiles. So how well or how not well the baby stayed within that goal uh, temperature of 34 degrees. The TOBY trial uh, looked at outcomes at six to seven years as well. And the COOL CAP trial was one of the first randomized control trials um, looking at seven to eight year outcome. The MARBLE study looking at magnetic resonancy, a uh, resonance imaging in babies who underwent um, therapeutic hypothermia also uh, helps us predict long term outcomes as well. So here's the summary from sort of all of those together is that therapeutic hypothermia helps decrease the risk of mortality from about 37% to 24%, blindness by half, cerebral palsy from 30 to 19%, hearing impairment stays about the same 4 to 6%, but the risk of intellectual impairment goes down with therapeutic hypothermia with um, the average full-scale IQ shown of 81 with its standard deviation versus 75. So below 70 is considered uh, intellectual impairment. And so getting closer to the more average 100 is better. 
How can we prevent hypoxic ischemic injury in the first place? Well, certainly identifying and managing maternal risk factors on the OBGYN side um, can be very helpful. Um, maternal safety, so counseling moms about just wearing seatbelts and helmets and disengaging from risky behaviors can also be helpful in preventing injury to baby. Fetal monitoring prior to and during delivery is uh, paramount and educating the individuals who are attending to these babies and watching those monitors when to alert someone else. We'll talk a little bit at the end about the role of stem cells in our controversial section, but banking cord blood and stem cells um, from the umbilical cord itself or placenta can also be helpful in preventing poor outcomes from hypoxic ischemic injury, but not necessarily preventing the injury itself. So let's get into some of those controversies. First, we'll talk about cost. So the cost of cooling versus not cooling. We know in the United States that the average cost to stay in a NICU um, per day is about $7,000. So when you look at individuals who are cooled, we're talking about buying them three days at least, right, to cool plus rewarming um, while we undergo neurodiagnostic tests and monitoring. I'll show you a graph in the coming slide about the, the cost of cooling, um, but we also have to consider those who um, are survivors and non-survivors. So this is getting back to some of those who are appropriate and, and inappropriate candidates for cooling. So um, prolonging life in the NICU can be expensive. Um, also, what's really hard to capture is the lifetime cost for the management of the symptoms associated with permanent or long-term neurodevelopmental disabilities. So the cost of physical and occupational therapy or speech therapy, orthotics, wheelchairs, other equipment, um, respite care, uh, feeding complications, hospitalizations as they come up and challenges like that. So this is a, a dot plot showing the uh, incremental cost effectiveness of cooling versus not cooling for infants with, or sorry, newborns with severe hypoxic ischemic injury. Using a willingness to pay threshold of $100,000 um, per quality of life year showed that this intervention, so therapeutic hypothermia, is cost effective 99.7% of the time with a confidence interval that shows the circled dot there. If you look at moderate hypoxic ischemic injury in the same uh, approach in terms of graphing this out, the intervention is shown to be cost effective 97.7% of the time. So recommended for moderate to severe HIE. Here are some more controversies to round out the last part of our presentation. We'll talk about allopurinol, erythropoietin, 2-immunobiotin, melatonin, magnesium sulfate, xenon gas, and stem cells, as previously promised. So first, allopurinol. This is a xanthane oxidase inhibitor that helps reduce the production of oxygen-free radicals, so superoxide. It prevents the degradation of adenosine and chelates non-protein-bound iron, thereby scavenging some of those hydroxyl-free radicals, and it might reduce then reperfusion injury. Its use has been studied previously in patients undergoing extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO or hypoplastic left heart, and really few side effects of any have been reported. So the albino study looking at all allopurinol in neonates with hypoxic ischemic injury looked at giving a, an infusion via IV within 30 minutes of the hypoxic event. This is their study de design. So because we have a very narrow window, as we've been talking about, usually it was a short oral consent and the first dose of the study medication was given within 30 to 45 minutes. And then if clinically indicated, a second dose could be given maybe 12 hours later with plans to follow up with a cerebral ultrasound on days one, three, and five, an MRI during that rewarming phase, um, using EEG along the way to monitor for seizures and then follow up for primary outcomes um, once the babies are two um, by chronological or corrected age. And so this has shown some promise um, with a, a relatively low uh, safety 
profile. What about the use of erythropoietin? So the HEAL study is looking at high-dose EPO for asphyxia and encephalopathy. Um, it, it, erythropoietin is a neuroprotective cytokine, and there are animal models that demonstrate a clear neuroregenerative um, potential for, for this um, compound. Unfortunately, at the 2022 Child Neurology Society meeting in October, Dr. Wu and her group shared an update that they have not yet seen positive outcomes in babies, but we are hopeful that with ongoing study and modification of the intervention that hopefully this will have some promise. What about two imidabiotin? So this compound is related to vitamin B7. It is a selective inhibitor of neuronal and inducible nitric oxide synthase. It has been shown in rodent brains, as you can see here, to help um, with preventing the uh, structural sequelae of hypoxic ischemic injury. So on the far left, these rodents underwent a, a sham operation um, where they were given no intervention. Um, the, the vehicle um, was in the second group where they just got a control substance. Um, and then the, the third group got two immunobiotin. Um, I'm sorry, over here, the sham is um, animals who, who hadn't undergone an injury. Um, but the two immunobiotin group shows um, less damage, certainly structurally, just volumetrically, if you just glance at this compared to the, the control group, um, using a dose of 30 milligrams per kilogram per day. Now, this is being studied in low resource or low income areas of the world where perhaps babies can't undergo therapeutic hypothermia or close NICU monitoring. So a vitamin infusion is something that's um, fairly safe and easy to do. The B vitamins are water soluble and excreted. Um, and so there's a nice paper uh, recently out of Congo where this was done and showed um, very few, if any, side effects at all. What about melatonin? So melatonin is postulated to be anti-excitotoxic, apoptotic, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, um, modulating normal glial development. So MELPRO study is the use of melatonin in the protection of neonates uh, who underwent hypoxic ischemic injury is ongoing and shows uh, promise in terms of decreasing that pro-inflammatory state with few, if any, side effects at all. I used this graphic earlier in the presentation to show the primary and secondary energy failure in the hypoxic ischemic brain. Um, so you can see our standard of care now, therapeutic hypothermia with monitoring for and treatment of seizures. Um, but you can see here where melatonin could be applied in those first few minutes, hours, and days to help prevent um, long-term sequelae. And this is a um, 10 milligram per kilogram enteral dose that's given daily for five days. What about magnesium sulfate? So magnesium sulfate is used quite a bit in the peripartum period, but we know that that secondary neuronal in injury is related to excitotoxicity from glutamate, which acts on NMDA receptors. And magnesium is a naturally occurring NMDA receptor antagonist by reducing the influx of calcium. And so randomized placebo-controlled trials of magnesium sulfate infusion postnatally, post-hypoxia have shown some promise, but there's really insufficient data to support its use postnatally at this point. What about xenon gas? So this is an odorless gas that is used as an inhaled anesthetic in adults. It, it works quite rapidly and can act as an anticonvulsant as well by acting on the NMDA receptor, similar to magnesium. Uh, it is quite expensive and quite scarce. Um, so the availability is makes it quite impractical um, for routine use in conjunction with therapeutic hypothermia, but it is being studied. What about stem cells? This might be the most controversial part of our talk. And, and unfortunately for you all, I'm going to spend the least amount of time on it. So a systematic review in 2021 of 58 preclinical studies showed that the use of stem cells, either from umbilical cord blood or tissue itself or the placenta, could show an improved uh, cognitive and sensory motor um, outcome in as many as 80% of infants. Um, the collection of this tissue is relatively non-invasive. I mean, it doesn't harm the baby or the mother. 
um, with the exception of bone marrow collection. But when you're looking at umbilical cord or the, or the cord blood, um, usually this tissue is discarded. So um, there are um, studies ongoing about this feasibility, the cost, the banking that could be done to help treat these babies in conjunction with therapeutic hypothermia. So in summary, neonatal hypoxic ischemic injury remains a significant cause of infant mortality in the United States and worldwide, and a cause of neurodevelopmental disability, secondary to primary and delayed neuronal death. Therapeutic hypothermia achieved through whole body cooling is safe, effective, and considered the standard of care. Neonatologists, pediatric neurologists, and the family of these babies all play a role in ensuring the success of a cooling program, and many more treatments are available on the horizon. Here is a list of my references, and I'll thank you for your time and attention, and certainly happy to pause at this time to entertain any questions that you all may have. Thank you very much. Dr. Zuccarelli, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, thanks for preparing that talk, and it, yeah, it was very informative. Um, just, they're throwing some questions at me here for you. Um, now they throw them over. Literally throwing them, I see. Yeah. Literally, literally. Um, first off, um, common mistakes um, that you may see when determining whether or not to cool a baby? Mm. Yeah, I think um, some of the what might seem uh, obvious things are the most common mistakes. So how old the baby really is. So we want these neonates to be 36 weeks, you know, or older. Um, but sometimes the dates are really uncertain or a mom comes in, didn't know she was pregnant or other things happen. And so I think um, that part can create some delays. Um, although I will say just anecdotally on the whole, I feel like more babies are considered for hypo, uh, the hypothermia than are, are um, not. So for instance, if we're not sure on the dates, we kind of go forward anyway, if they look like they're a big enough baby, you know, over that 1800 grams. So I think more of them benefit than more are missing out. Um, I think another thing is the timing. So sometimes we're not exactly sure what's going on with a baby. Um, one particular example is like a meconium aspiration baby. So, well, we, suck, we suction below the cord, everything seems fine. Maybe baby's just a little bit snowed or lazy for lack of a more professional term. You know, the baby, mom got magnesium or whatever. And so we kind of have this grace for a poor exam when really we should be thinking, um, you know, maybe this is a hypoxic related event. But I think those are probably um, the most um, common reasons why a baby wouldn't be cooled who otherwise should be. Which, again, another question along those same lines, and we've seen this, where you have a baby and who comes out depressed, the core gases look gosh awful. An hour later, the kid looks okay. Uh, and you're now like, okay, the baby's not necessarily encephalopathic, but dang, those labs look scary. Yes, yes. So... You know, I think it's hard because that is a snapshot in time, that lab, right? It's not a reflection of, hey, what has your gas been like for the whole time you've been in the womb, you know, or the like yeah. last 10 days? So um, I think that's why there's the three different criteria. So you go based on the SARNET exam, you go based on what the AEEG looks like, if you can hook that up. And, you know, it is this time window. So if there's any fellow neurologists watching, you know, we're so obsessed with time, like with stroke and other things, um, but with babies too, we've got these six hours. So... If you've got the baby, the exam looks fantastic. You have time to get an AEEG hooked up, look at it, see what things are like. If the exam perks up, then they're no longer a candidate. I mean, I think you just um, kind of have to take that leap of faith. Um, now, you mentioned several, you know, therapies that are, that are considered controversy. Are any of them being used outside of studies at this time? No, none of those have been, I should have probably clarified, none are FDA approved for the use um, in neonates um, in the United States, and none are even really being um, used outside of clinical trial programs. So the trials I referenced, like Melpro and the Neolev, those controlled environments are where these substances are being studied in the United States. 
Um, looking at the immunobiotin study, that is being used clinically in other countries where there's sort of lower resources and less access to things because I think the thought is it's a vitamin. Like, what harm can we do to a, um, a urine excreted, you know, with a urine excreted vitamin? But um, otherwise, in this country, no, not really any of those are being used just um, clinically. And, uh, you know, I probably know the answer to this. I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, and I'm not trying to. Uh, loft you a softball, but um, <laughs> uh, in programs where, again, for treating HIE, uh, this, is, this is it for now until some of those other things come along and programs are trying, hospitals and different NICUs are trying to set up a cooling program. Um, importance of having a whole team, not just neonatology, but neurology um, developmental. Uh, I'm glad you asked the question. Yeah, so I um, made a joke sort of during the talk about AEEG training. Um, pediatric neurologists, we get no training in that really. Um, um, and so really, you guys do know better about us. Um, the joke again that we make is like, well, it's like if you printed an EEG on paper and flipped it on its side and just looked at like the side of the ream of paper, that's what like an AEEG is. Um, <laughs> But it's really helpful, I think, um, and you can make some good clinical decisions off of it. So without a conventional EEG, without somebody to read that, you can manage these babies fairly well um, and manage the seizures if you think they're having them. I just find so many artifacts on those that I really do think it's helpful to have the conventional EEG. And we see artifact on that too, but at least we have the video to be able to say, okay, good, we're not seizing, the baby's getting his bad, uh, bottom padded, you know? Um, but yeah, you need somebody to be able to read those. Um, now, whether that person needs to be in your institution or not, you know, is up for debate. But um, having someone who can relay those results to the family is going to depend on the comfort of the neonatologist. So, well, the EEG looks this way and we're going to treat this way. I mean, if you're not comfortable interpreting the EEG on your own or passing along an interpretation, then it's really helpful to have the neurologist there uh, to be able to do that. And then long-term follow-up, you know, I speak so highly of these NICU follow-up clinics where neonatologists are running them and, and keeping an eye on whole baby. So not just the brain, but let's look at every organ system. How are we doing in terms of development? Um, we know, especially in this region, that developmental pediatricians are really hard to come by. Um, so where I live, you know, the wait to see one is over a year. And so we need to rely on other people to fill those roles. But do I think that the best program is one that has all the disciplines? Yeah, obviously, I do think that. Um, do you have a comment on the best time to get an MRI post-warming? I mentioned it in the slide, but really that four to seven um, day, really less than a week, is going to be the best time. I. You know, I just say, I just as soon get it as soon as you can, um, because those transient uh, diffusion weighted changes. So on the DWI and ADC maps that we see on MRI, they can normalize or pseudo normalize is what we say. So um, where you might see later on on some different sequences, signs of hypoxia, we really rely on those two sequences early on. So. Um, if you do long-term MRI follow-up of babies who have had hypoxic ischemic injury, you'll see encephalomalacia, you'll see scarring or changes on the flare, but immediately the T2 might look great or the, the flare might look great. And so you really rely on those, um, those diffusion uh, coefficient scans. And so I try to do those, you know, as soon as you can related to the injury. Um, so you have a baby you are questioning whether or not to cool, you decide not to, you go after six hours and the kid seizes, um, which we've also seen. What about starting to cool, say, in that six to 12 hour window? Benefits? So there probably are still some case by case scenarios where there would be benefit, but on the whole, based on the Cochrane and meta-analysis of this 1500 babies, um, it was best for the rest of the baby's body if you did not cool. So um, treating the seizures, um, it's just that far out of transition can be more detrimental to heart and lungs and kidney and liver. Um, and so generally it's not recommended. That's why it's one of the sort of absolute contraindications. Um, treating the seizures though will be really helpful. So, um, you know, there's that. <laughs> um. 
I want to thank you again. Oh, for, you're welcome. For, Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, for you know joining our conference. Um, I've been able to speak with you on the phone a few times uh, about EEGs. It's nice to see you here semi in person. Um, yeah. We look forward to working with you some more in the future. Um, again, thank you. This has been great. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, for those at home who are watching, um, that concludes our conference. Um, again, I want to thank everyone who's helped, um, our committee members. Um, you see their names up there. Uh, they did all the work. I just sat up here in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I, I really want to thank them and thank the administration uh, at Overland Park Regional um, for supporting us both financially and with, with facilities so that we could do this conference. Um, um, just again, in general, to remind you, that you should be getting an email if you registered you should be getting an email that has a survey on it. Uh, fill out the survey, and once that's completed, you will get a certificate for your CEU or CME credits for this conference. Um, you have anything else that you want me to? Oh, yeah. Stay tuned for next year. Uh, this year was a little different. Again, we did some moving around because of you know, COVID and work Force and everything we've decided to move it to the spring or almost springtime in March and um, I think this is going to work better than November so let us know give us your feedback we'd love to know if this worked better this time of year than than in November um, with that I will bid you farewell and we'll look forward to hearing from you again in a year <laughs>